this tutorial, we will be creating a Zelda style RPG, and it is going to involve a lot of components like sophisticated animations and graphics, RPG mechanics, and we are going to use tile for the level creation. And we are even going to create enemy AI. Speaking of AI, I would like to give a shout out to the sponsor of this video, AI Camp. If you want to learn more about artificial intelligence and build some seriously cool projects, they have something for you. AI Camp offers either one-on-one -on -one guidance or a summer camp during which students create real-world AI projects like face mask detectors, sign language identifiers, currency exchange automation, and much more. Student testimonials from past summer camps are very positive, and many students received either a partial or even full scholarships to attend. By visiting my partner link in the description, you can apply for a unique scholarship opportunity to fund your time at AI Camp. And best of all, it only takes 10 minutes. And even more, upon successful completion, the top AI Camp students are hired to work for AI Camp or for other Silicon Valley startups. If you want to study AI or computer science at university or work in the field professionally, this is a great experience to get started. AI Camp is currently looking for people to join their summer camp, and I would strongly recommend you to check it out if you are interested. Now, before I jump into the project, a quick note on the setup. We have one folder with four subfolders although we will only make changes to the one that contains the code. And since the tutorial is quite long, you can find the game files for each stage on GitHub. There are 15 in total. There are also pastebin files to get started and to copy code that takes a bit longer to type. And well, that's basically it. I'll hope you enjoy it. So here we are in the code. And right now I have three different files open. We have main, we have settings, and we have debug. And all three of those are Python files. And if I run the main file, that's the really important one, we are getting this window here. Plain black, doesn't do anything right now, but at the very least, we have a window. That is all we are going to need for now. And I guess before we get into the proper code, let's go through this to have a solid basis. Now, we are starting all the way up here with importing Pygame and Sys, that's the usual stuff. The more important stuff comes right below, where we are importing everything from settings. And settings looks like this. We basically have two sections in here. The first one contains the main game variables. Most importantly here, we have width and height of our game window. And those would be flexible. So if the game window is too large for your window, you can make these smaller. I guess you could also make them larger if you wanted to. And then besides that, we have the FPS and the tile size. And I would recommend to keep those two numbers static. Now besides that, we have our world map. And the world map is for now going to be the layout of our game. In this world map, we have our player, that's the P. Then besides that, we have axis, and that is going to be a rock or an obstacle, same thing. And then besides that, we have a ton of empty space, and that is going to be space the player can walk on. So then if I go back to my main file, we have a game class. Let's talk about this in a second. But what we're doing with the class comes down here. We first check if this is our main file, then we are creating an instance of this game class, and then we call the method run of this class. So let's look at our game class. And in here, not much is actually happening. We have our init method, and in here, we are initiating Pygame, we are creating a display surface, and we are creating a clock. So this is the basic setup you always need for Pygame. Then more importantly, we have our run method. And in here, two things essentially happen. The first one is going to be this bit here, and that is going to be our event loop. And right now, we are just checking if we are closing the game. Now besides that, down here, we are filling the screen with a black color, we are updating the screen, and we are controlling the frame rate. So none of this should be difficult if you have any experience with Pygame. However, if you have no idea what any of this means, check out my introduction to Pygame. It explains all of this in quite some detail. But all right, so this is going to be our basic setup. Now there's one more file that we have to talk about, and that is debug. And debug isn't actually going to influence our game. Instead, it's, as the name suggests, a debug tool. 
So it's really just there to give us information about whatever is going on in the game. But it's not actually going to influence the game, so you could ignore it entirely if you don't care about it. And I am going to use it just to illustrate in a bit more detail what's going on in the game. And let me actually demonstrate what it does. So if I go to my main file, in here I can from debug import debug and then in my game loop I can run debug and print any kind of information that I think is important. So let's say hello and let's see what we get. Now in the top left of our window we get the word hello. And obviously right now not particularly helpful but later on this could be a game variable that we want to illustrate. So this is very helpful. All right, but right now I don't want it, so let me get rid of all of that. Now with that, we have our basic setup. Although there's one more thing I would like to add in here. And that is that right now, let me actually demonstrate. In the top left of our window, it says pre-game window. And I would rather that this says Zelda or something more customized. And this would be a challenge for you that I want you guys to change this text to something more custom. In my case, it's going to be Zelda, but you could write whatever you want. All right, let's try it together. Let me close this. And we only really need one line when we are initiating all of Pygame. So it happens right here after I create a display surface. And the line we need is pygame, spelled correctly, dot display, dot set, underscore, caption. And then here we have to pass in a string. And in my case, it's going to be Zelda. And now if I run this, we can see Zelda in the top left. It really isn't going to make much of a difference, but well, it looks a bit nicer. So with that, we have our basic setup, and now we can talk about the actual level. And our level class is going to become incredibly important. It's essentially the central part of the entire game. So effectively, it's going to be the container that contains all the essential game elements, like the player, all the enemies, the level map, all of the obstacles, and so on. It is really important. And that is actually bringing us to the core concept the level class has to manage. And that is that we have to take all of our sprites for the game put them in different groups and somehow manage all of this efficiently. And the key concept to make that work is to use different groups to give different functionality to different sprites. So let me give an example. For a start, we are going to create two groups in our level class. One is called visible sprites, the other is called obstacle sprites. And literally any sprite that is going to be visible will be in the visible sprites class. So this is the only group that we will draw on the screen. At the end of this project, it will contain the player, the map, all the enemies, all the obstacles, and so on. So if a sprite is not inside of this class, it will not be drawn. And for the obstacle group, well, anything that is going to be in here will be able to collide with the player. And anything that isn't in here will not be able to collide. That's fairly straightforward. And how this will become useful later on is that, for example, for our level boundary, so the coastline effectively, I have basically placed sprites there that will interact with the player via collisions, but they are not drawn because they're not in the visible sprites group. You will see how that is going to work later on. But the main thing you should understand is this, that you can put sprites into different group, and the sprite can be in multiple groups at the same time. And depending on what group it is in, it should be interacting with its environment slightly differently. And that is going to become a key concept to make this entire project work. But let's actually jump into our code and let's implement all of this. So here I'm back in the code and I want to create a new file. And I will save this one as level.py. And in here, as always, we have to import py game. Nothing else for now though. And now we have to create a class level. There's no inheritance, but we do need an init method that needs self and nothing else. And I guess now we can go straight to creating the two sprite groups that I just talked about. So let me add a comment here 
and let's call this sprite group set up. And in here, I want to create self.visible underscore sprites. And this is just going to become pygame.sprite.group. And now I can copy all of this. And I want to create obstacle sprites. So these two groups will become really important. And essentially, what I want to do later on in my level class is I want to give it another method that I'm going to call run. Doesn't need any argument besides self. And in here, I want to essentially update and draw the game. But for now, I'm just going to add pass because it's not doing anything. And now that I have my level, I can go back to my main. I can import, so from level import level. And what I can do now is create self.level is going to be the level. And then in the game, I can call self.level.run. So we are essentially creating an instance of our level class, this one here, in our main game. And then we are running all of this inside of our loop. So really all we're doing is we are calling this method here. And let me just run all of this to see if it's working. And yeah, it's still looking good. We still can't see anything, but that comes later. So now we have a basic level. Now, next up, there's one more thing I will need in the init method, and that is the display surface. Because at the end of the game, we want to draw all of our game on this self.screen. So we can approach this in two different ways. We could either take this self.screen and pass it in this level. This would be perfectly fine. Although in my case, in my level, I am, let's do it right at the top. We can use a function to just get the display surface from anywhere in our code. And the code for that, let's call this one self.display underscore surface. All we need is pygame.display.get underscore surface. And this is going to get us the display surface from anywhere in our code, which is quite handy. As a matter of fact, in the debug method, we are using the very same line if you're interested, but that doesn't matter too much. So now we have our basic level class. It still doesn't do all that much because we're not drawing anything. And to draw something, we essentially have to go through this world.map and draw either a rock, wherever there's an X, nothing if there's an empty space, or the player if there's a P. And the problem we have right now is that we neither have an X nor a player. So let's create both of these in a very simple way. And then we're going to cycle through this entire map to place them on the screen. So back in my level, well, actually, this should be a new file. And let me save this one as tile.py. And for now, this is going to be a class that will always going to be a rock. But later on, we are going to make it slightly more flexible. So it goes to become a tree or a statue or basically any kind of object. Import pi game as always, that was terrible spelling. And from settings, import everything. And now I want to have a class called tile. And this one is going to be a sprite. So pygame.sprite.sprite for inheritance. That is really important. And now, I want to create a dunder init method that needs self. And now this one is going to need a couple of things. Most importantly, we are going to need a position. So we know where to place it. Besides that, I am also going to give it an argument called groups. And this is going to be the spread group it should be part of. How that is going to work, you see in just a second. But there's a very handy feature to assign a sprite to a group via the arguments. You'll see in a second what I mean. Actually, we can do this right now. So these are the two arguments I need. And the first thing you always need in a sprite, that's very easy to forget, is super.init and then brackets. So we initiate this class here, essentially. 
And what you can do that is super handy is if you pass the groups in here. So the argument we have just declared. Now we are going to need two things. The first one is always self.image and we need self.rect. The two main things you always need for any kind of sprite. And the rect is the easier part. We need self.image.get underscore rect. And the top left is just going to be the position. So this is the position that we get up here that we will give this tile when we create it. Now for the image, I want to import a file. So pygame.image.load. And in here, we first have to get outside of our folder. So right now we are in the code folder. So dot dot. Then we have to go into the graphics folder. And inside of the graphics folder, there's a folder called test. And inside of test, we have a player and a rock. And for this one, I want to use rock.png. And really important, do not forget to convert alpha this rock. With that, we have our basic rock, or well, a basic tile. That's a pretty good start. And I guess what we can also do is let me copy all of this. And now I want to create a new file. And this one is going to become our player. So let me save it as player.py. And now I can paste all of this and change the class name from tile to player. And now instead of the rock, I want to have the player. And the rest can stay the same. Although this player class later on, we are going to massively change. So there's no point using inheritance between these two classes. With that, we have a player and a tile or rock. So now in our level, we can actually set some basic stuff up. So we can finally actually see something. But first of all, let's see if things are still working and they do, that's still looking pretty good. And I guess, let me really quickly explain what we are going to do. So the really important part in our settings is this world map. And let's go through this thing really quickly just to explain what it is and how it's going to work. So essentially, world map is a list. Here's the start and here's the end. And this list contains a ton of individual lists. And inside of each list, we have one string. That could either be an X, a space, or a P. And this we are going to translate into specific positions. For example, this top left X should have the top left position. So this point here should be position zero and zero for the simple reason that it's right in the top left. Now the X right next to it, so this one here, should have the top left position. Let me add a small arrow to make it a bit easier to see. You should have an X position of 64 because our tile size is 64, but then the Y position should still be zero because it's right at the top. And now for another example, let's say if we want to place the player, I still want to place the top left, and now we have to figure out the X and the Y position. And this could actually be a really good exercise for you. Try to figure out what the coordinates of the player are supposed to be. I know the player is in the column with the index two. So we have zero, we have one, and we have two. So the X position of this point here should be two, times 64. And let me add x here. And that is going to be 128. And now for the y position, that's the one we haven't done so far. We can use the list themselves. So we know this is list number zero, this is list number one, and this is list number two. So our player is in the list with index number two. So for y, we also have to place the player at two times 64 which is still going to be 100. So the top left of the player should be a position 128 and 128. And this sort of logic we are going to do for every single item in this entire list. So I want to go back to my level and in here, I am going to create a new method. Let's call it create underscore map. Doesn't need any arguments besides self. 
And in here, essentially, I have to nest a couple of for loops. And let me build this up slowly. First of all, I need for row in world underscore map. And now let's print what we get. So print row. And I guess when we set up the class, we can call this method. So in here, let me add another section and let's call it sprite set up. And what I want to do is self dot create map. So we're just calling this method here. And now if I run all of this, we are getting an error that world map is not defined. For the simple reason that I didn't import the settings. So from settings, import star. Now this should be working. There we go. So now we still can't see anything, but now we have printed essentially the entire map that we can see in the settings. So the same map we can see here. Pretty good start, although not particularly helpful, because there's a really important thing I need to get here, that for each row, I need to know the index because that is going to be the number I will multiply with the tile size to get the Y position. So besides the row information, I also need to know what index it's on. And this is information I am getting with the enumerate method. So enumerate, and we need row index and row. So now I can, let me copy this, I can print the row index and the row. So now if I run this and close the window, we can see that we have index zero, then the first row, index one, and then the second row. Or well, the first row, the row of the index one, let's put it this way. And this is really important information because this entire row here, I want to multiply for the Y position with zero times 64, which is going to be zero. But for the second row or the row of the index one, we want to go with one time 64. So that way there's always going to be a 64 pixel offset between each row. And all right, now we have our row and our row index. So that is going to give us the Y position. But from that, we also need the X position. So this is going to be another for loop. So let me go back to my settings. Essentially, we went through every single list with this for loop and we got the list and the index. Now what we want to do is that inside of each of the lists, we want to look at each of these axes and then figure out what the information is, so what's inside of the string and what index this string is on. And that way we are going to get our X position. And this is going to look very similar. So for, let's call it call, index and column in enumerate and now it's going to be the row and that is literally all we are going to need for the basic setup so this is going to cycle through every single item so every single x empty string or p inside of this world map and it's also going to give us the x and the y position and i guess just for the formula now we can get an x and we can get a Y position. The X is going to be the column index multiplied by the tile size. And Y is going to be the row index multiplied by the tile size. And with that, we have converted the world map into a position. So now what we can do is if the column, so each individual item inside of this world map, so X, empty space, or P, and use that information to create a certain kind of sprite. So for example, if column is going to be equal to an X, then we want to create a rock. And for that to work, we obviously have to import the tile for the rock. So from tile, import tile, I think I called it. Yeah, tile. And I guess what we added, from player import player. Essentially, all we want to do is if we have an X, we want to create a tile. And the tile has two arguments we have to figure out. We need a position and the groups. So let me copy them 
and the position we already have. That is just going to be a tuple with x and y. And for the groups, all I want is a list with all the groups this one is supposed to be in. Let's say for now, it's just going to be self.visible sprites. So we can see them, but later on, there are going to be more groups in here. And with that, we have the basic setup. This is not looking bad at all. So first of all, let's run all of this to see if we get an error. And we don't, that's generally a good sign. So now we just have to display this visible sprites and we should be good to go. And I think this could be a good exercise to see if you're still following along. So try to display all the sprites inside of visible sprites. I hope that was a simple exercise because all we have to do is self.visiblesprites.draw and then we need the surface we want to draw on, which in our case is self.display surface. And now let's see if this is working. And it is indeed working. We can see um, the top part of our game. We can't see the bottom part, but for that we are going to create a camera later on. But for now, this is looking pretty good. And let me make this a bit smaller. So with that, we have our rocks. Next up, we also want to place the player. So if the column is equal to the letter P, then we want to place the player. So we want to just create the player and the player is in here. It also has position and groups for now. So let me just copy them in here. And we can actually just copy the arguments from the rock and place them in here. So essentially right now the tile and the player are identical, but they are going to become very different very soon. But let's try this and there we can see our player. So with that, we have our basic level set up. And I guess one more thing that we can do for now is that the tile for the rock should be in two different groups. It should be in the visible sprites and it should also be, let me copy it, it should also be in the obstacle sprites. I guess let me call it obstacle sprites, not obstacle sprite. That's very annoying to pronounce. Now, you will not be able to see a difference. But now, whenever we create a tile, this tile is going to be in the visible sprites and inside of the obstacle sprites. And later on, this will become incredibly helpful because essentially what we will do is we will check the obstacle sprites and the player. And if there's any collision, we are going to influence the player from that collision. And this is actually something we could start working on right now. So the next part is going to be about the player. And the player is going to become quite substantial because, well, it's the main player of the game. But for now, we are going to focus on two things only, the movement of the player and the collision mechanics. And that is going to allow us to sort of run around the level already. And I guess let's do all of this straight in the code. That should be the easiest way. Here we are back in the code and I want to look at my player. And right now our player really doesn't do all that much. So we have to add a few more things here. Now, first of all, we need some kind of direction the player is supposed to walk in. And this in my case is going to be a 2D vector. So self.direction is usually a good name. And what I want is pygame.math.vector2. And don't forget the brackets. If you leave them empty, it's going to be zero and zero. And this is going to give us a vector that is going to have x and y. And right now, by default, both are going to be zero. And what we want to do is to use keyboard input to change either of these numbers to a certain direction. For example, if we are pressing right, then this zero for the x should be a one. And then later on, we are going to multiply this vector with a certain kind of player speed. And that way, this direction would become something, let's say five and zero, and our player would move to the right at the speed of five pixels per frame. So we essentially have to do two things. Number one, we have to get keyboard input, and number two, we have to multiply this vector by a speed. And well, let's start with the keyboard input. So let's call it just input. 
needs self and nothing else as always. And in here, we need to get our keyboard input. And I guess this could become a good exercise. So try to get the keyboard input for up, down, left and right on the keyboard and see if you can figure this out. So first of all, I need to get all the keys that are potentially being pressed. And this happens with pygame.key.get underscore pressed. And now what I can do is if keys, and we can check for a specific key. Let's say I want to start with pygame.k underscore up. And if that is the case, I want to set self.direction.y to negative one. And that's all we need. Now we can copy this thing and change this one to down. And now y should be one. And now we can copy both of them. Although don't forget, this should be elif. So right now we are pressing negative one. So our player is going up later on at some point. Now if we're pressing down, this y becomes one. So our player is moving downwards. However, now we have a problem that let's say in our game, we pressed down and then we lift up the key again. Our player would keep on moving down because this y being one sticks around because we don't change it anymore. And well, our player would just keep on moving downwards, which is not ideal, but we can fix that quite easily by adding an else statement that self dot direction is going to be zero. So really all we're checking is, is the up key being pressed? If that's the case, y is negative one. If we are pressing down, y is going to be positive one. And if we are pressing neither of these buttons, the player doesn't move in the y direction at all. Actually, I forgot direction.y. And that's it for the y direction. Now I can just copy the entire thing and do the very same logic for right and left. Let's say we want to start with right and right is going to be x and it is the positive number. And if we go with k left, this should also be x and it should be negative one and then direction. X is going to be zero. This one doesn't have positive or negative. And all right, with that, we have our basic input. So now we can give this class an update method. So update self, that's horrible spelling. And for now, I just want to get self dot input. And now what I want to do back at my level dot pi, I also want to update all of the visible sprites. So self dot visible sprites dot update. And now let's run all of the code and let's see if anything happens. So we can't see anything right now, but something is happening, at least hopefully inside of our player. And actually we are able to visualize what's happening by using our debug function. But first of all, back at my level, when I created the player, I also want to put this inside of self dot player player. And the reason for that is that I'm going to use this self dot player quite a bit. And this way I can target it directly, but it is still going to be inside of this visible sprites. And well, now what I can do is right at the top, I can from debug import debug. So this function here, and now in my run method, I can call debug and I can call self dot player dot direction. And now if we run all of this, we can see in the top left, we have zero and zero right now. And that's our direction. And if I press to the left, we get negative one for X or positive one if I press to the right. And if I press up, we get negative one. And if I press down, we get plus one for the Y. And that way I can press in the different directions and we get different numbers. So this is already going to give us the keyboard input. And all we want to do is to multiply this with a certain kind of speed. And that is also going to happen inside of the player. So now besides direction, I also want to give my player self dot speed, at least for now, and let's put it at five. 
Although be aware later on, this speed is going to disappear because we will replace it with a proper dictionary of all the player attributes. But for now, we can work with it quite well. And besides that, I want to create a move method and this one needs self and it's going to need the speed. And in here, we are going to move the player. All we have to do is self dot rect dot, let's say center plus equal self dot direction multiplied by the speed. And that is all we need. So now I can run in the update method self dot move and the speed is going to be self dot speed. And let's actually try this and see what happens. So nothing happens if I don't press a button, but if I press to the right or to the left or up and down, our player is moving. So this is working quite well. Although, well, you can see that the overlap with the different rocks doesn't work at all right now and we have no collisions, but we can at least move around. Obviously, we also don't have a camera, so if the player moves outside the window, it just disappears. But that comes soon. Although before we get to that, there's one more thing I do want to work on. And let me illustrate what the problem is right now. If I just move left or right or up and down, we have a certain kind of speed. However, if I move to the right and down, we are moving significantly faster. I think it's quite good to see. And the reason for that is trigonometry, essentially, that if we apply two different directions, we are moving slightly faster. And this we have to account for. And essentially what we have to do in this player, so this direction here, we have to normalize it. And what normalizing means is that we are changing the length of a vector to one. And that way, if you multiply by the speed, it's always going to have the same speed no matter what direction we are going in. And well, doing that is actually super easy. All we have to do is if self dot direction dot magnitude, magnitude, that's how you spell that. So magnitude essentially is the length of the vector. And if that is different from zero, then I want to get my self dot direction and simply get self dot direction dot normalize. So first of all, we are checking if our vector has any kind of length. And as soon as it has a length, we are setting the length of the vector to one. That way, it doesn't matter which direction it's going in, it's always going to be one. Which down here in step number three is going to result in the same speed in all directions. Now, the reason why we need this if statement is because a vector of zero cannot be normalized. Pygame would throw an error. This is why we need this if statement. But now, if I run main.py, I can move left and right, it still works, but now if I move down, now we can see in the top left, we get 0 0.7, and that is because of the normalization. But, well, you can see in the game, now the movement looks significantly more constant. So that's a pretty good start. And you might have one question, that in the player, why do I add the speed as an argument instead of just writing self.speed? Now, this would work, but the reason why I'm not doing this is later on for the enemies, we want to use the same move method. So what I'm essentially going to do is I'm going to later on remove this move method from the player and put it inside of another class, along with a couple of other methods, actually. And then both the player and the enemies are going to inherit from that class. And that's why I'm going to keep things a bit more flexible so both the enemy and the player can inherit from them and use all of these methods. So just keep that in mind if you want to use self.speed. But okay, with that, we have our basic movement. So next up, we have to work on the collision. And collisions generally can be a bit finicky to work with. For the simple reason that in Pygame, all we can really check is if two sprites are overlapping but Pygame doesn't tell us where they're overlapping. So let me put two sprites on the screen. Right now we have one sprite and one sprite slightly to the right and the bottom. Now these two obviously overlap, 
but do they overlap from the right or from the bottom? That's a really important thing because what we want to do if they overlap, we want to place the colliding rectangle either to the right or to the bottom of this other sprite. So the problem we might have is that if we get a collision from the right, Pygame might get confused and place the sprite at the bottom of the other sprite. And in the game, this would look like our players teleporting around and it might even break the entire game. But fortunately, it can be fixed fairly easily. All we have to do is to apply each direction individually. Let's say we're going to start with the horizontal movement. So we're going to move the player in the horizontal space, check for collisions. And if there is a collision, we are going to move the player to the point of that collision. And once all of that is done, we are going to work on all of the vertical movement and collisions. That way, there cannot be a confusion between what kind of collision is going to happen. And, well, that is all we need to get started. So let's go back into our code and let's have a look at this. Here we're back in the code and I have my player class open. Now, what I would like is to have all of the collisions inside of this class. The problem is that this player doesn't know where all of these obstacle sprites are. So we have to pass them into the player. And this is going to happen by simply giving the player another argument. And let's call this one the obstacle sprites. And then in the init method, I want to get myself dot obstacle sprites. It's just going to be obstacle sprites. And now when we create the player at the end, it is going to get self dot obstacle sprites. Be aware here, we are placing the player inside of this group. And then we are giving the player this group here, but just for the collisions. The player itself isn't in that group. That is a really important distinction. All right, with that, we can actually create, let me create the collision method in here. So let's call it collision. It needs self and I want to give it a direction. Essentially, what we are going to do. First of all, we're going to check the direction and this one could either be horizontal and then we want to do stuff. And I guess let's be a bit specific. So if direction is going to be vertical, then we want to do other collision stuff. And let's work on the horizontal one first. Essentially, what I want to do, I want to look at all of the sprites inside of my obstacle sprites. So for sprite in obstacle sprites, in self.obstacle sprites. And now for all of these sprites, if sprite.rect.collide rect and self.rect. So we are essentially checking the rectangle of the sprite with the rectangle of the player. So this information is going to tell us if there is a collision between these two. But we still don't know if this collision happens on the left or on the right. But this we can also get quite easily because we know the direction of the player. So for example, if this is our player and our player is moving to the right, then it would be pretty unlikely to have a collision on the left side. That would be a little bit strange. Instead, we can kind of predict that we are always going to have a collision on the right side if the player is moving to the right. And then the same thing for the left side. If we're moving left, all of our collisions are going to be on the left as well. I guess important to say here, all of our obstacles are going to be static. So that should make it much easier. All we have to do is if self.direction.x, let's say, is greater than zero. So if that is the case, we are moving right. And if we're moving right, we need self.rect.right. That's not how you spell that is going to be sprite dot rect dot left. So now essentially what's happening here, if we have our player, so this again is our player, our player is moving to the right. And now our player is colliding 
with some kind of obstacle and they are overlapping right now. What I essentially want to do is to move the right side of my player, so this side here, to the left side of the obstacle we have been colliding with. So that way it looks like the player is always on this particular side and they're not overlapping. And that is all we have to do with this line here. So now next up, we have to do the very same thing for the other side. So if self.direction.x is smaller than zero, then self.rect.left is going to be sprite.rect.right. So the exact flip side of the other line. This is then all we need for the horizontal collisions. Now, next up, we have to do the very same thing for the vertical ones. And this, I think, could be a really good exercise for you. So after looking at the horizontal collisions, try to do the same thing for the vertical ones. So you want to check for the up and the down movement. Let's try together now, but first of all, I want to add proper comments, so this is moving left. And now let me just copy the entire thing. Now the first two lines are still perfectly fine, but besides that, I now want to look at direction.y. So if direction.y is greater than zero, we are moving down. And if that is the opposite way, so we are smaller than zero, we are moving up. So if we are moving down, we want to place the bottom of the rectangle at the top of the sprite. So essentially what we are doing, if this is our player again, right now our player is moving down. And if now we are colliding with any kind of obstacle, the bottom of our player should be at the top of the obstacle. So this line here. And then we have to do the same thing for the up movement. So the top of our rectangle is going to be at the bottom of the collision object. And all right, with that, we have our collisions. Actually, not all that bad. So let me minimize this. And now we have to work in this move method. And essentially, we have to take this method here and split it apart into the x and the y movement. So self.rect.x plus equals self.direction.x multiplied by the speed. And then we can do the same thing for the y. So if I just left it at this and ignored the collision method entirely, we shouldn't see any kind of difference. And things are still looking pretty identical. Cool, good start. But now what I want to do, after we are moving our player, let's say on the X, after we have done this, I want to call myself dot collision and I want to check my horizontal collisions. And let's just use one of them to see what is happening. So now if I run my main file, I can move to the left and I have proper collisions. Although if I move from the top, nothing is going to happen. And Pygame is getting a bit glitchy. But this we can fix quite easily because all we have to do is call self.collision. And now we want the vertical collisions. So now if I run all of this, we get very nice working collisions and everything is working just fine. Cool, this is looking really good. There are no bugs as far as I can see. This is working very nicely. Now the problem is, I can actually demonstrate this, I can move outside of the window, no problem. So this is not ideal. Also, the game doesn't look as good as it could because there are no overlaps. So for example, if I'm on top of a rock, my player stops where the rock begins. But ideally there should be a tiny bit of overlap to give the illusion of depth, which is what we are also going to need. So let's work on these two bits. Now to achieve both of these things, the camera and the overlap, we essentially have to create our own group. 
or at the very least, we have to take a spread group and change some key functionality. And that is very neatly going to bring us into a bit more of an advanced concept inside of Pygame. So far, if you have followed this channel, we only ever used a group to place a sprite in there, to update them and to draw them. But you can totally take a sprite group and rewrite some core functionality. But to do that, we first have to understand what a group is actually doing. And fortunately, it really isn't all that complicated. Essentially, all that a sprite group really does is that it stores a ton of different sprites. Then it can call the update method in all of these sprites, and it can also draw all of the sprites. And all that is really going to happen inside of a draw method of a group is that we are going to call blit with the sprite and the rectangle of whatever sprite we have inside of that group. So with that knowledge, we can totally overwrite key parts of a group or give it extra functionality. Here I'm back in my code and I want to go to my level and I want to change this visible sprites class to a custom made group. And let's create that class in the same file. I think that makes sense. And I am going to call this new class Y sort camera group. And it's going to inherit from pygame.sprite.group. And the naming here has two key parts. Number one, the more obvious one, the camera group. So this sprite group is going to function as a camera. And that's the part we are going to work on in just a second. The other part, the Y sort, means that we are going to sort the sprites by the Y coordinate. And that way we are going to give them some overlap. Now, and here we are going to need a couple of different things. First of all, as always, we need a dunder init with self and nothing else. And let me start with a general setup of all the stuff we are going to need. Now, first of all, as always, like with the sprite, we need super, ideally spelled correctly, that tends to help, dot init. No arguments are needed. Now, once we have this, we can actually replace our visible sprites with this group. So why sort camera group? And since we haven't replaced any functionality yet, and we've initiated the original class, this should still work. Let's try it. And we still get the very same functionality. Everything works as intended. So at the very least, we didn't break anything yet. But with this setup, we can make some simplifications. For example, what we could be doing, let me actually go to the display surface and let me copy this line here just to illustrate what we can do, a very simple example. Now we have our display surface inside of our class. So now I can create a new, let's call it custom draw and itself and nothing else for now. And really all we need to create our custom draw is for sprite in self.sprites. And don't forget the brackets. And now we can get all of the sprites. And now all we have to do is self.display surface dot blit and we need sprite dot image and sprite dot rect. So this is essentially what a normal sprite group is going to do. And now in our run method, we can replace our draw from the original group with custom draw. And now we don't need any arguments because we already have the display surface. And let's run this. And it's still working just fine. Except now we're using a custom draw that is going to give us significantly more power. And I guess what I can do, we can get rid of this debug. It isn't useful anymore. Now we want to use this for two specific purposes. Number one, we want a camera. Number two, we want some overlap between the different sprites in the Y direction. And let's start with the camera. That's the more important bit. And the logic to make the camera work is actually surprisingly simple. And all of it happens in the custom draw. But by default, 
we are always drawing the sprite image in the same position as the sprite rectangle. But we don't have to. We can totally give the sprite rectangle a certain kind of offset. And this is what we are going to use for the camera. So really all that's going to happen in practice, when we are calling blit on the surface, we are still going to keep our sprite.image. But now for the sprite.rect, we are going to add a vector to give them a certain kind of offset. And this vector is essentially going to be our camera because it's going to give us control where the sprites are going to be drawn. And then really all we have to do is to get the offset from our player and connect this to the sprite rect vector. And once we have that, we are good to go. Essentially, we are going to give the offset of the world to wherever the player is going to be. And well, I think this makes much more sense once we actually implement it. So let's go back into the code. And here we still have our Y sort camera group. And what I want to achieve is that the player is always right in the middle of the window. But that's going to come in just a second. First of all, let me illustrate what I mean with the offset. Essentially, all that's going to happen is we're going to create a vector. Let's call it offset. And this offset is going to be pygame.math.vector2. Needs to be capitalized. And by default, it's going to be 0 and 0. And this vector we are going to add to our sprite rectangle. So all we have to do in here, let me create a new, let's call it the offset rectangle. And this offset rectangle is going to be the sprite.rect.top left and then plus self.offset. And that way we are going to get a new position. It's not a rectangle anymore, but well, Pygame is happy with a tuple, so this is still fine. So now what we can do is put this offset rect. Actually, let me call it offset position. That's going to make more sense. So offset position. And now anytime we have any kind of offset, we are going to add this to our rectangle. Now, right now, this is going to be zero. So we should not be seeing any kind of change. So let's run main.py and we still get the same outcome. But what we are now able to do is if I give this vector some starting positions, let's say 100 and 200. Now, if I run all of this, our entire game is slightly offset. So this is the offset we have just given it. So what you can see here is that this distance is 100 and this distance is 200. So essentially, our game itself didn't actually change any kind of position. We are just drawing all of the elements in a different spot. And the distance to that spot is determined by our offset. So this is working really well. Now, next up, what I have to figure out is how to connect this offset to my player. And since I want the player to be exactly in the middle of the screen, I first need half the screen width and half the screen height. And we can do this in the init method. So let's call this half width. And all we need to get this is self.displaySurface.get underscore size. And for x, we need zero. And we want to floor divide this by two. So we are getting an integer. Now we can do the same thing for the height. And all we have to change is from the tuple we get from get size, we need the first one. And that's going to be the y one. So now we know how much distance we want from the left and from the top. So all we have to do in our custom draw, I want to get another argument. And that is going to be the player. So when I call custom draw up here, I want to pass in self.player. So now I can access the player and get the player position. And let me add another comment here and let's call it getting the offset. And in here, I want self.offset.x and then dot y. So now we have to figure out these two positions. And unfortunately, we couldn't just add player.rect.center x and player 
dot rect dot center y. Although it would be nice and simple. Actually, let's try and see what happens if we just use those two numbers. So now back in my main file. Now, if I move the player, we get something, but um, looks a bit weird. But we do get something. That's at least a start. And essentially, all we have to do is from this number subtract either self dot half width and self dot half height. So now we are getting some kind of weird outcome. And I might be able to see the player. I could see her there for a bit. So now the camera movement is a bit weird. And the reason for that is that this plus here should be a negative. And now let's try this again. It should work. And there we go. This feels significantly better. And with that, we have our offset. And if you're really interested in the math here, I would recommend to go over the geometry a couple of times. It is a little bit weird, but once you go over it, it should make sense. And um, probably just draw it out a couple of times. Eventually it starts to make sense. But that is literally all we needed for the camera movement. So now we have covered the first part. We have a proper camera movement. So I guess now we can start working on part number two, the overlap. And this one consists essentially of two things. The first one is a hitbox for all of our sprites. So right now, for example, for our player, the hitbox is the entire image. But I don't want that to be the case. I want the hitbox of the player to be slightly smaller than the original image. And these parts are going to be the overlapping parts. But this by itself wouldn't be enough because our group right now doesn't know what elements to draw on top and what element to draw on the bottom. This is going to be another part we have to make ourselves. It's not actually that difficult, but it's something we have to implement. But I guess let's go through it step by step. And let's first of all start by creating all of our sprites a custom hitbox. So here we are back in the code. and. I want to start with the tile. That's going to be the easiest one. And right now we have our rectangle. So this is always going to be the full size of our entire image. I want to give it another attribute and that is going to be self.hitbox. And the hitbox is going to be essentially the same as self.rect, except now we want to change the size. And this happens with inflate. And what inflate essentially does is it takes a rectangle and it changes the size. So in my case, really all I want to do is if this is my original rectangle, then I want the hitbox to look something like this. So we have the same width, the same center, but the top and the bottom are a bit shorter. And that way later on the player could be standing behind this, for example. And that's really the entire idea of all of this. And inflate needs two arguments, one for x and one for y. Now my x can just remain zero. But for my y, I want to have a specific number. And let's say just to get started, let's go with negative 10. Oh, and by the way, this is going to keep the center point at the same position. So let me draw all of this again. This is our original rectangle. And now our hitbox is going to have the same center, but now on the top and the bottom, we are going to have a five pixel because we specified negative 10 up here. And negative 10 makes the entire thing shrink by five pixels on each side. And now we have to do the very same thing for the player. And let me do it right below the rectangle. So self.hitbox is going to be self.rect.inflate. And for my player, let's say for now, I want to go with zero. And since the player is a little bit taller, I want to go with negative 26. And now let's run the code. And well, this shouldn't make any difference for now. 
but at least the code isn't crashing, so that's a good start. But now, essentially what I want to do. I am not going to move the rectangle anymore. Instead, I'm going to move the hitbox. And I'm going to move the hitbox and check collisions on that hitbox as well. And after all of that is done, I'm going to put the center of the rectangle where the hitbox is going to be. So that way, the rectangle always follows the hitbox. And that way, I can get all the collisions with the hitbox and have some overlaps, but then draw the player in the correct position. So essentially, what we have to do. Uh, let's go with move first. And let's get rid of this comment. We don't need that one anymore. So instead of self.rec.x, we want to move self.hitbox. And we want to move both x and y. And at the end of all of this, we want to get self.rect.center is going to be self.hitbox.center. And now what we can do, that instead of checking the rectangle of all of the sprites, we want to check the hitbox. So this should be hitbox. And we're also not going to check the rectangle of our player, but the hitbox of our player. And this is going to happen for basically all of the rectangles. We're going to replace them with the hitbox. So this should be hitbox, this should be hitbox, this should be hitbox, 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 and finally hitbox. And now let's see if this is going to work. So now we can indeed see some offset. So right now our player is behind the rocks and this is looking really, really good. The problem we have now is that our player is always below the rocks. So no matter where we go, oh, except here because these rocks were created earlier in the level setup. So these rocks are behind the player because they were created earlier in the code. But these were created after, these were created after, and further down here, all of these rocks are above our player. So this is going to look kind of silly, but we are very nearly there. So we are making some definite progress. There's only one more thing that we need. So right now we have a custom hitbox for both our player and for our tiles. Now, the last thing we have to do in our Y sort camera group, we have to order our sprites. So we have to tell it when to draw each of these sprites. And right now they are being ordered by the time of when they are being created. This happens here. Some of the tiles were created before the player, but some tiles were created after the player was created. So those tiles would be on top of the player. Whereas the tiles created before the player was created, they would be below the player. And in most situations, this really doesn't matter. But in our case, we don't want to order our sprites by that logic. Instead, we want to order our sprites by the Y position. And essentially, the sprite that should be drawn on top should be the one with the highest Y position. Because if the sprite is a lower Y position than another sprite, then the sprite that should be behind or higher up on the screen should be behind that other sprite. In Godot, for example, this is just being called Y sword. And this is basically what we're implementing ourselves manually right now. And the way we are doing it is by using the sorted function. And let's do this straight in the code. So here right now, we are just going through all of the sprites, but this I don't want to do anymore. Instead, I want to go with for sprite in sorted. And sorted essentially takes two arguments. First of all, it wants a list of what we want to sort. And this we do have, it's just self.sprites. And again, don't forget the brackets. It's very easy to do. And next up, it wants some kind of key. And the key is essentially going to be by what kind of metric we are going to sort all of the sprites. Now, in our case, this should be the Y position of each of the sprites. And to get that, we basically need a Lambda function. So Lambda, and I want to look at the sprite. And all I want to return is sprite.rect.center Y. I guess, let me know if you want a specific video on the sorted function. 
Once you understand lambdas, it's actually pretty simple. But now we have overlaps. So let me run the code again. And now we are still behind the rocks. But now if I go a bit further down, now we are on top of the rocks. But if we go behind them, we are, well, behind them. And all of our collisions still work just fine. And all of the overlapping works really nicely. And this is going to make our game look really good. So cool. This is working exceptionally well. Nice. There are no bugs or anything. This is all working good. Cool. And with that, we have a basic top-down game with a camera, collisions, overlaps, and all of the good stuff. Now, I guess for the rest of the game, we are just going to add more and more visual detail and enemies and extra stuff to it to make all of this into a proper game. But at this stage, you already have the basic logic you need to really create any kind of top-down game. I guess next up, we can start working on importing the actual map to make this entire thing look significantly better. Now, for the graphics, we are going to need quite a few different things. For now, we only had our world map and we spawned either a rock or a player, which really wasn't ideal. But to get the actual graphics of the entire game, we are first of all going to need significantly more data. And that is going to be way more data than I could assemble by hand. So we have to use a program. And the program that I am using is called Tiled, which is super useful, completely free, and it allows you to assemble graphics. And let me actually show how this looks. So here we have the Tiled Editor. And right now you can see our entire map. And this thing I essentially created from these tiles on the right. So here we have all our floor tiles, here we have the details, we have flowers and we have trees. So I could, for example, literally just pick a tile and draw over this thing and expand it. And I have made an entire tutorial on how to use tiled. So for this video, I am not going to go over it and I will keep the map I have already created. So this thing took about an hour, possibly a bit more, to assemble as a whole. Actually, let's go through the entire thing layer by layer, and then I can explain how this comes together. So right now, we have nothing. And the bottom layer looks like this. This is going to be our ground. And on top of that, we have some details. They will be integrated into the ground as well. And essentially what I'm going to do I am going to export this entire thing as one image. And this one image will be below all of the other objects, so even below the player. And then if we move this map, it looks like our player is moving on top of an actual surface. But in reality, we are just moving an image. Now, on top of that, something we can't see, but that's really important, is floor blocks. And floor blocks, if I make it visible, is going to be our constraint that our player cannot walk outside of the map. So all of these red squares are going to be obstacles that the player cannot cross. And they are blocking the entire map so the player cannot leave it. And in the game, they are not going to be visible. So let's hide them. Now on top of that, we have our entities. The blue P is our player. And besides that, we have all of our enemies. Now then, we have grass, and the grass is, well, the grass. And finally, we have the larger objects, and those are all of the statues, the trees, the rocks, all of that kind of stuff. And importantly, all of the objects, the grass, the entities, and the floor blocks have to be placed by going over the entire layer. So we have to circle through the entire layer, like we have done for the world map, and place all of these elements. And to make that work in our game, we will later on have to import quite a few different things. For example, we have to import the graphics for each individual tree and rock and statue into Pygame. Same for all the enemies, same for the player, and there is going to be a lot of importing. And also, when we export these datasets, we get a CSV file, which stands for Comma Separated Value which effectively is a long list with numbers, and these numbers tell us where stuff needs to be. And those numbers we also have to import. And all of that gets quite complex. 
So this section will be quite heavy on managing all of that data. But I guess let's go for the step by step and let's start with the easier bit. And that is going to be the floor. And for that, we are just going to be importing an image and placing it below every other element. And then we are good to go. Here we are back in the code and I want to go to level. And all of our drawing is happening in this section down here. So essentially, this part here draws all of our elements. And we kind of want to draw our floor in there as well. The problem is that the floor is slightly different from all of the other elements. So we couldn't just add the floor to the sprites and call it a day. For the simple reason, let me actually draw this, that right now we are drawing all of our elements by their Y position. So this is essentially how our drawing is going to work. So the greater of a Y position an object has, the higher up on this thing it's going to be drawn. And we are looking at the center of the Y position. Now, the problem with that is that our map is always supposed to be on the bottom. So our map is always supposed to be here. It needs to be below all of the other elements, otherwise it wouldn't be a ground or a floor. So we have to place this in here anyway. And if we didn't do it, it would end up somewhere, let's say here. And since it's a giant image, it would essentially cover up the entire field and we wouldn't be able to see anything. So we have to make sure it's below all of the other elements. So what we are going to do to this group, we are going to add a surface and a rectangle for the floor specifically. And that is not going to be a sprite. But then in this custom draw, we are going to draw it. And I guess let me implement this straight away. So in here, creating the floor. And for this, I need two different parts. First of all, I need the actual image of the floor. So self dot, let's call it floor surface. And this is just going to be an image. So pygame.image.load. And this, I need to go up. I need to go to my graphics. In my graphics, there's a folder called tile map. And in tile map, we have ground.png. And this, we also want to convert, but we don't need convert alpha this time. And next up, since we do want to place it, I also want to have self.floor underscore rect. And let me call it surf instead of surface, so things are lining up a bit nicer. And this is just going to be self.floor surface dot get underscore rect. And the top left for now is going to be zero and zero. But this doesn't actually matter all that much since we are going to change it, well, right now. And really what we have done so far in our custom map, we have created an offset position and the offset position came from the top left of the rectangle and the offset. And the offset we got from the player. So now what we want to do is the exact same thing, except now we only want to do it for the floor surface and not for all of the sprites. And this could be a pretty good exercise for you. So try to implement the offset for the floor and then draw the floor before the for loop for the sprites. Now, first of all, let's add another section and let's call this one drawing the floor. And first of all, we are going to need a floor offset position. And this we get in the same way that we have used just before. So we want self dot floor rect dot top left and then minus self dot offset. And that is going to be all that we need. So now we can run self dot display surface dot blit and self dot floor surface. And I call this one floor offset position. And that is literally all we needed. So let's run this and see what happens. And there we go. Now in the top left of our world, we have, oh well, below our player, we have the entire world map. Now, right now, we can't really walk over it and we can, well, we can kind of walk over it, but you get what I mean. 
But right now, all of the rocks don't line up at all anymore. So we have to make a few more changes, but at the very least for now, the basics are working. So this is quite nice. And now next up, we have to work on all of the other objects. And this one is going to need a little bit more work. But I guess we can start with by removing the old stuff and just placing the player somewhere in the middle of the screen. And this is going to happen in our level. And let me minimize our camera group so we can focus on this a bit more. So right now we are using all of this stuff here to set up our world. And this worked so far, but now we want to get rid of it. So let me comment out essentially all of this, except I want to copy the player. And now I want to place the player somewhere on the map. Let's see what works. Let's say 400 and 300. And that might be a good position. Yeah, okay, I probably need larger numbers. Let's say 2000 and 1500. We are almost there, let's say 1430. Because that way we should be on the path and we make sure we are not going to hit any other tile. So our player isn't going to collide with anything by default. But now we can move around our entire map. There are no collisions yet, but well, we have a much better system. So now essentially all we have to do is to reintroduce all of the layers and then work with them. Although the just might be a little bit oversimplifying things. So let's go through what we are going to do. First of all, we have to make our tile a bit more flexible because so far the rocks are the only tile we could have. But in this section, we have many more and many more differently sized tiles. And we also have some tiles that shouldn't have any graphic whatsoever. For example, the tile for the collisions that limit our player, they don't have a graphic, but since they are also sprites, they will need some kind of surface. So essentially, our tile class needs to be able to accept any size graphics and also be able to accept no graphics at all. And I guess let's implement this. And all of this is going to happen in our tile class, or well, the tile file. And this is going to get two more arguments. The first one I want to call sprite type, because later on we do want to have a bit more control over what kind of sprite we have. And besides that, I also want to pass in a surface as an argument. And this could then be anything. But if we don't pass in any surface, this class should generate its own surface. So as the default argument here, I want to have pygame.surface. So this is just going to give us a black surface that we can work with. And the size of that should be tile size and tile size. So by now, since our tile size is 64, the one we determined here, if we don't pass in a surface as an argument, we get a tile size of 64 by 64. And then for the image, this is then going to be what we get. And besides that, I also want to get self dot sprite type is going to be sprite type. And this later on, for example, could be an enemy or could be invisible or it could be any of those things. And that's going to allow us to target in a bit more detail what's going to happen to any of these. So we are using both groups and the sprite type to determine what a sprite is going to do in the game. For example, later on, if the player attacks grass, the grass should disappear immediately. But if we attack an enemy, we should just reduce the health of the enemy. But both of those are going to be in essentially the same groups. This is for now all we need for our tile class. Now we can go back to our level. And what we first of all have to do is to import all of the layouts. Because right now, let me open them in the folder. So in our project, we have a map folder. And in here, we have six different files. We don't need all of them. So map floor and map details, we could just ignore. But floor blocks, we do need to import. 
And by default, we couldn't work with a CSV file. So we have to figure out how to import this kind of file and then convert it so it looks more or less like this world map so that we can work with it. And this I still want to do in my create map. And since we have a couple of different files, I want to turn this into a dictionary. And in here, let's start with the easiest one, the boundary. So this is going to be what limits our player. And in here, essentially what I want to store is this kind of world map, except for all of the boundaries. So I have to write a function like import CSV layout, and this one should then get the path to my CSV file. Something like this. So what we have to do is to actually write this function. And this, since we are going to be using it quite often, I put into a separate file. So let's create a new file. And I save this one as support.py. And in here, we want to define import CSV layout. And it needs a path and nothing else. And just to demonstrate what I'm doing while we're doing it, let's call this function and let's see what it does. So right now, if I press pass, we run this file, nothing is going to happen because pass doesn't do anything. Now, the first thing that we have to do is to figure out how to read a CSV file. And fortunately, Python has a module just for that. But I don't want to import all of it. Instead, I want from CSV import reader. And this is allowing us to read a CSV file. And now to use it, we first have to open the CSV file. So with open and we pass the path in here. And then Python wants a name for this file. And I called it level map. And all of this so far could work for any file. So this could also be a text file. And unfortunately right now, you wouldn't really be able to see anything. So if I print my level map, all you would get is something in our memory. Um, not particularly helpful. But this thing, we now have to convert with our reader to something actually readable. And the reader needs two arguments. First of all, the file we want to work with, which in our case is level map. And besides that, it also wants a delimiter. And a delimiter in our case is a comma. And what it means is what separates each individual entry in our file. This could also be a space, for example. Now this information is going to return another value that I'm going to store as layout. Now, unfortunately still, if I print the layout, now we get a CSV reader object. So at the very least, I guess we know we have a CSV object, but that's about it. But now comes the actual part where we get to see something because now what we can do is for row, in layout, we can print the row. And now we can see the actual files. So in here, we can see a whole lot of negative ones. But all the way at the top, you can already see we now have a list. So here the list starts and the list is ending here. And wherever we have a negative one, there is no tile. However, if we have 395, so any of these numbers here, there should be a constraint for the player. So the player wouldn't be able to move over this tile. And it's really hard to see right now. But if all of these tiles were on the same line, they would, in my tiled editor, have the same shape as this red line here. But in our case, since the line isn't wide enough, this is really hard to see. But now, all we want to do is to put all of these lists into a separate container, which is going to be another list. So let's call this one terrain map. And this one is just going to be a list. And now for each row that we get from the layout, I want to append this to my terrain map. So this could just be row. Although just to be sure, I want to convert this row to a list. And now, the last thing we are going to need 
is to return that terrain map. And now, whenever we get this import CSV layout, we can put all of this, for example, in a print statement, print it, and now we get a list that contains a whole bunch of other lists that give us the layout of our map. So that is going to be quite useful. And now let's actually go straight ahead and use it. So in my level.py, I now have the boundary for my floor blocks, as I called it, which is just going to be my boundary. Now I actually want to place them in the same way I have used it earlier with the tile map, or the, what did I call it? My world map. So now my boundary has the same kind of layout as this thing, except it's significantly larger. So let's work with it. And since it's so similar, we can reuse all of this code, except there's going to be one modification. I want to place all of this inside of another for loop. And what the other for loop is going to be, let's call it style and layout in layout, let's call it layouts, that makes a bit more sense, dot items. And don't forget the double colon. So essentially, the style is going to be boundary right now, and the layout is going to be this CSV map. And right now, we only have a single one of these, so it doesn't make too much sense. However, later on, we are going to add more and more data in here, and then this follow-up is going to make significantly more sense. So that way our code is nice and scalable. But now we are still looking at the Y position, we get the X position, and we are converting all of this into an X and Y position. So now we can use this quite well. And all we have to do now is if the style is equal to boundary, then we can create a new tile. So we can now create a new tile group and let me copy all of the parameters. Place them in here. And let's go through them one by one, actually. Or actually, even better, try to figure this one out yourself to place in all the proper arguments for each of the parameters, to place the boundary for the world map. All right, let's go through it one by one. First of all, position, that should be the easiest one, because in here, we just want to get X and Y. And that's just going to be what we created up here. And actually, this should be indented one more line. Next up, we want our groups. And for now, let's place, let me copy it from the player. I want the visible sprites and I want the obstacle sprites. Then we need the sprite type. And the sprite type, I have called invisible because they're not supposed to be visible later on. And then finally, we have our surface. And this one we can just ignore since it's then going to use the default argument. And all right, that is then going to be all we need for the boundary. And let's actually see what happens. So we don't get an error, we do get an error. And the error we're getting is input CSV layout is not defined. That is an error I tend to make very often. Fortunately, it's quite easy. All I did was I forgot to from support import star. So that this function is in another file and we didn't import that file. Now let's try this again. And now I made another mistake. The obstacle sprites are not defined and that is probably because I forgot the self. There we go. And now if I run the code, we can see something strange. So at the very least, we get some kind of collision. Although something is definitely gone wrong here. And I think I can already tell the problem. So right now, when we are calling this boundary, our boundary is slightly different compared to this map here. Because for boundary, there's no empty space, we get a negative one. Actually, in my support file, let me open it again. So let me copy this one. And let's call import CSV layout. And let's print it. 
So what we can see here is the number 395, a whole lot of time, and besides that, a lot of negative ones. And what Pygame did, it always put a block where we have a negative one. But we only want to block at 395. And that was different from our world map. So let me get rid of this one again. So what we want to do in here, when we go through the column, we want to add another if statement. That if our call is different from the string negative one. And only if that is the case, we want to do anything in here. And negative one in a tiled export means there's not supposed to be anything. So this negative one would work for any kind of layout. So now let's try this again and let's see what we get. We still get a giant block. That seems like something is going wrong with the position. So let's investigate what the problem is. And I just realized the problem is I am very, very stupid. Uh, well, so in here, we are still using the world map. We are not actually using the layout. So uh, that may have been a problem. So now let's try this again. That should fix the issue. So now if I go to the right at some point, there we go. Now we have the black coastline that we can't walk over. And we still get our overlap. That one works pretty well. Cool. And now we are not able to leave this game anymore. But we can still use something like a bridge and we can move on this tiny island. And obviously right now we don't want to draw any of these black tiles. And to get rid of them, at least in terms of visibility, we can just remove the visible sprites group. And now let's run this again. Now we can't see them anymore. However, we can still not move over into the water. So this is all working very, very nicely. This is a very nice upgrade. Cool. Okay. That took way more time than I expected, but well, here we are. All right, so for now we need two more objects. We need the grass and we need the objects. So all of the trees and the statues and stuff like that. And for that, first of all, we have to import two more CSV layouts. And let me just copy them. That's gonna save me a bit of writing. So one is called grass and the other I have called object. So essentially what we need to do with those two is if the style is going to be grass, let me just add a comment, create a grass tile. And if the style, that's not how you spell that. If the tile is object, then we want to create an object tile. And we do have most of it, but we don't have the most important part. We don't have the graphic for either the grass or any of the objects. What we have right now is two folders, one with three different grass images and another folder with like 20 different objects. And right now those really aren't usable. And I really do not want to import every single one of these images individually. So I want to create a function that does all of this for us. And this is also quite easily done. Let me add a pass in here. So Python doesn't throw an error. And in my support file, besides import CSV layout, I want to create another function. And I call this one import underscore folder. It also needs a path. And this one is going to go through a folder import all of these images as a surface into Pygame, or well, into our Python code. And there's one module that we will need for this. It is called the OS module. And I don't want to get all of OS. Instead, I just want to get the one that's called walk. And walk just allows you to walk through the file system. That's really all it does. And let's actually check out what it is doing. So for data in walk, and now we have to add a path. And let me use the path for the grass objects. That one is looking like this. And now let's just print our data. And now let's run 
import folder. Oh, uh, I made a mistake. The import grass should be what we pass into the function and then walk gets the path from the parameter. That looks much cleaner. Now let's run this. And now we are getting three different bits of information. First of all, we get the folder name, the first bit here. In our case, we just don't care about it and we already have it anyway. So this one we could just ignore. Next up, we have an empty list, this one here. And if there was any folder inside of this folder, this list would contain the names of these folders. In our case, we just don't care about it. Now, finally, we have the list of the images or well, the files inside of this folder. And this is what we care about. Essentially, what we want to do, let me clean this up a bit. Basically, what I want to do is I want to combine this path here with any of these names. So these three names. And that is going to give me a whole file path to that image from my code wherever I run it in my setup. And once I have that, I can just import this file as a surface. So I would just loop over all of these names, turn them into a full file path, and then import all of this as a surface. And that is what we are going to do. So first of all, let me rename the data and split this into three different parts. Now for the first one, the folder name, I'm going to use an underscore since I don't care about the information. For the subfolders, I can use a double underscore because I don't care about this either. Now, finally, I have the, let's call it the image files. This is what I actually care about. And this is still going to be a list. So I want to split this up. So I need another for loop. So for image in IMG files. And now if I print each individual image, we get the list ideally of our grass images. So grass one, two, and three. And now what I can do with them is I can turn them into a full path. So right now, all we have is strings that we can combine quite easily. And what I want to do is to get my path on that. I'm going to add the string of a forward slash. And to that, I'm going to add my image. So if I print this full path, I have a nice path to my image that I can use to import this image. So literally, all I want to do, let's call it my image surface. I want pygame.image.load. I need my full path. And don't forget convert alpha. And spelling this correct also helps. And this is then going to be our image or our surface. Now, finally, we want to return this entire list. And right now, we can't really do that. So what I usually do is I just create a surface list that by default is empty. And then as soon as we create this image surface, we get our surface list and we append this image surface. And at the end of all of this, we are returning the surface list. And that way, let me print what import folder gives us. Ah, we get an error, pygame is not defined because we need to import pygame. And I suspect we get another error. Ah, oh, yeah. Right now, we haven't initialized pygame.display because we're only running this file by itself. So I can't really show this right now. But fortunately, when we are running our level, we have initiated pygame. This happens in the main file. So this happens here. As a consequence, we don't have to worry about this error. You're going to see in a second what this means. Actually, let's import all of the graphics that we need. And since we have more than one, I want to put this into a dictionary as well. So we have graphics. It's going to be a dictionary. And in here, for now, we only have the grass. And for the grass, I want import underscore folder. And I have called it this one here. And now we can actually print our graphics. So let's run all of this. We get our file, no error. And now we can see in the dictionary, we have grass and we have 
three surface files inside of a list. That's exactly what we wanted. So, all right, can get rid of this. And now we can actually work out our grass tiles. And essentially what I want to do, I want to pick a random image from this folder or from this list and then create a tile with that random image. And this could be a really good exercise for you. So try to create a tile with the grass and the sprite type should also be grass and see how far you get. All right, so first of all, let me get rid of all of this. And the first thing I want is to get a random grass image. So we want to pick one item from the list. And to do that, we need the choice method, which we get from random import choice. So now in here, we can just call choice and get our graphics. And I want to get the grass list. And once we have that, we can just create another tile. Now the X and Y position is still going to be X and Y. That one didn't change. But now for the groups, we want self.visible sprites and self.obstacle sprites because the grass is supposed to be visible and collidable. And finally, I give those a type of grass. And now this should be working. And, uh, oh yeah, I know what I forgot. So we can see something, but we have a problem. And look at this for a second and just think about what I forgot. The important thing I forgot was the actual graphic. So random grass image. Now let's try this again. There we go. This is much better. So now we have our grass image and they are collidable. They are very much visible and this is working really well. So now we have our grass. This is working really nicely. I think down here we have quite a few more. There we go. This is coming together quite well. Cool. So with that, we have the grass. And then finally, we need the larger objects. And we already have up here the object in our layout. And besides that, we are also going to need the graphics. And this one I called objects. And then here we just want to get the import folder and the file path towards it. I have called this. And with these two things, we have a layout and we have the graphics. So we can start working on actually creating these tiles here. But now we do have a bit of a problem because for the grass tiles, we could just select a random grass tile from the list. For the objects, we cannot do that because each of these objects is one specific thing that we couldn't just randomly pick. Now, fortunately, that isn't too much of a problem. And let me open tiled again to explain why. So here we have tiled and all of the objects are in here. And if I click on one, let's say this tree stump, this has the ID of zero. If I go to the next one, it's the ID of one, then two, three, four, and five, and so on. And essentially what tiled is exporting is this ID. And this is really useful because we can use this ID to import the index of the image in that folder. So when we import the images, they are in the list, so they can be indexed. And the way we're importing them right now is by the name. And since you can see it in the image, the name is zero, one, two, and so on. So the naming here lines up quite nicely with the file name. And that way we can use the ID as an index. And this means all that we have to do to get our surface, we have to get our graphics. And in here we want to get the objects. And this is then going to return a list. And from this list, we want to get the index. And the index we get is this column here. So this is the column we want to use for indexing. Now, right now, this column 
is going to be a string. So we want to turn this into an integer. And now we can just use this surface. So I can just copy the tile. We again need X and Y. Then we also want visible and obstacle sprites. So I can just copy them. Then for the type, I call this one object. And finally, for the image, we want the surface. And that is all we needed. Almost, at least. So now if I run this, we can see some trees. So this is coming together very nicely. The problem is this isn't working perfectly. So for example, here you can see the flower and the column on top of each other. And I think further here, now this one's actually working quite well. Um, I guess if I go in here, you can see a couple of overlapping things that don't look as good as they should be. Oh, especially down here, you can see some problems. And the problem is this. In our tile.py, right now we are basically assuming that all of the files or all of the images are 64 by 64 pixels. But the larger objects really aren't that. And let me explain this issue in tiled. Now, here we can see the thing that we just saw doesn't work in code. And the problem is this, that in tiled, we always assume we have a 64 by 64 tile grid. And this works for most of the objects, like the grass, for example. Where it doesn't work is with these larger objects. So this column here, for example, is much larger than 64 pixels. And we are always placing the top left of this column. But since this is larger than 64 pixels, we are placing this column somewhere here on this line. So we are placing it here. As a matter of fact, all of these larger elements are a bit further down than they are supposed to be. But that's something we can fix quite easily. So let me go back in the code. And when we are placing the rectangle, now we have to adjust things a tiny bit. And essentially what I want to check, if the sprite type is equal to object, because those are the only things that are going to be larger than that. And these we get from object here, and we're placing them in here. And that way we do have access to them. And if they are an object, we want to do an offset. But if they're not an object, we just want else, else and do the thing we have already done and the rest can stay exactly the same now if we do have an object we still want to get self.rect and we still want to get self.image.get underscore rect and we are still placing the top left but now we are still placing an x and y as well and the x stays exactly the same so this is going to be position zero so we are splitting apart this position into the first and the second integer. And now for the Y, we have to make a tiny adjustment. I guess we still want the first index, but now we have to reduce a tiny amount from that. And here our life is going to be made a tiny bit easier because all of these larger objects have twice the height of all of the other elements. So really all we have to do is to subtract the tile size from it. Here is a normal tile. It's 64 by 64 pixels. And the larger tiles look either like this, where we have 64 by 128, or we have even larger tiles that look something like this, where we have 128 and 128. And the problem that we faced is that all of these tiles are being offset further here. So the position we want to place is actually this one instead of this one. So what we want to do is to just move any of these large objects a little bit further up. And since they're always the same height with 128 pixels, we can just move them up by 64 pixels or exactly the tile size, which is making our life significantly easier. And all right, that's all we needed. So now let's run this. We don't get an error. And 
that is looking quite good. I can't see any overlaps. This is also looking really good. And yeah, I think we have a pretty nice looking map that is coming together very much. So, all right, with that, we can get rid of these old comments and we can get rid of in our settings of the world map. We don't need it anymore. So I guess with that, we can start working on a better looking player. So we have the different kind of animations. And that is going to be the next section. So let's talk about the player animation. And to make our player animations work, we have to figure out what our player is doing at any given time. So what the status of the player is. And at the end of the day, there are going to be 12 different states our player can have. We can either walk in any of the four directions, we can be idle in any of these directions, or we can be attacking in any of these four directions. So it's going to be four times three, and that's how we get to 12 different states. And in the most basic sense, all we really have to do is whenever there's a certain kind of state, we are going to play a certain kind of animation. That's the easiest way to think about it. But that's still quite a bit away. First of all, we have to import all of these graphics and we also have to give our player the ability to attack and to cast magic. And I guess we should work on those two first. Here we are back in the code and I only want to work on my player. We don't need anything else right now. As a matter of fact, let me minimize the functions so it's a bit easier to see what we are doing. That makes a bit more sense. First of all, in my input. Here, we are getting the input to move around. And I want to get a few more. And let me actually add a few more comments. So this here is the movement input. And down here, we have the attack input. And then a bit further, we get the magic input. And for the attack input, we can still use our keys. So if keys, and in my case, I use pygame.k underscore space. So the space bar means that we are attacking. And for now, if we are attacking, let me just print attack. And now we can do the same thing for the magic. I can just copy all of this. And, and for magic, I use the left control, which is triggered with LC tr so left control and if that is being triggered i want to cast some magic and now if i run this we don't get an error if i press space we get attack if i press control we get magic so that's a good start but there is a bit of a problem right now let me run the game again so if you press attack we attack multiple times same for the magic and the reason for that is that our game runs at 60 frames per second. If we press space once, Pygame checks for this multiple times a second and it finds the bar being pressed for longer than a few milliseconds. That's why it triggers it multiple times. So for these two if statements, we have to add a timer that can only be triggered every few milliseconds. So in our player, let me add another section, or oh, it's our first section here actually. And let's call those, um, I guess we can call them movement. Let's just keep it at movement and we can put them up here. And in here, I also want to create a few more variables or attributes. First of all, the first one is called attacking. And by default, it's going to be false. Then next up, I want to have a self dot attack cool down. And let's put this one for now at 400, I think is a good number. And finally, self.attack time. And by default, this is none or could be zero, doesn't really matter. And these three numbers we are going to use to create a timer. So what I want to do, whenever we call keys for attacking and for magic, we also want to check that our player currently is not self.attacking. And this we want to do for both magic and attacking. 
And those two get the same variable for the timer, because I want there to be an offset that the player can't cast an attack and magic at the same time, or really fast after each other. Now, once we are calling either of these, I want to set self.attacking to true. And let me copy it to both. And now what we should be seeing is that we can attack or cast magic once. So let me press space for attack. And now I keep on pressing space or control, nothing happens. And there shouldn't be anything happening because now attacking is true. So this if statement cannot trigger anymore. But obviously, eventually we do want to attack again. So we want to create another method that I'm going to call cool downs. Need self and nothing else. And in here, we are going to have all of our cooldowns. And let me explain the logic. So I explained this a couple of times, but the problem is that Pygame by itself doesn't have a timer function. So we couldn't just tell Pygame to do something in half a second. It just doesn't have that. And also, I should check my spelling. So instead, we have to create our own timer, which we can do and essentially what we want to do. So here we have the timeline of our game. So this is time zero, and this is time X. This is the maximum time once we close the game. And we want to check two things. We want to check when our attack has occurred. So let me use this in a different color. Let's say our attack occurred right here at around, let's say, milliseconds at 700. And now from this point, we want to continuously measure our time. So as the game goes on, we want to check what the time is. So for example, here we could have 800, here could be 900, here we could have 1000, and here we could have 1100. And what we basically want to check, let me write it, so 1100, now what we basically want to check is this distance here. And that is going to be our timer. I have actually made a video specifically on timers, but really all we are checking is one point in time, and then we continuously check the time, and if the difference between our current time and our starting time is greater than our cooldown, in this case, then we want to trigger whatever code we have. So I hope that makes sense we need to get our current time and store it in a variable. And to get our current time, we need pygame.time.get underscore ticks. So this is going to continuously measure what our time is. And the other thing we need is when the attack actually occurred. And this we can get up here. So what we want to do in here is self.attack time. This is going to be pygame.time.get ticks as well. Now, a really important thing here is that this get ticks is only called once and once only because this if statement is only going to be run once. However, this get ticks down here will be run basically infinitely because there's no restriction on it and we're going to put this cooldown in the update method in just a second. So the get ticks down here is being run multiple times they get ticks up here is only run once. That's how these two functions differ. Okay, but now all we have to do is let's say if self dot attacking, because that's the only reason why we would check this. If our current time minus self dot attacking time is greater or equal than self dot cool down. Should just be cool down. Did I make a typo again? Oh, I put this down as attack cooldown. So let's call it attack cooldown. And if that is the case, self dot attacking should just be false again. And that is a very simple timer. And later on, we are going to add a few more timers in here. For example, when the player is vulnerable or when the player is switching a weapon. But this is the most basic one. And now all we have to do, let's put it right under input self dot cool downs. And now let's try this again. 
I can press space, we only get it once, but if I keep on pressing it, it only happens after about half a second. And this also works. Oh, um, magic is still a bit different. So let's have a look. Ah, the problem for magic is we didn't set the starting time. So this is what we need. Now let's run this again. And now both magic and attack work much better. So now our player has the ability to move around up here and to attack and cast magic, at least in theory. So now we can actually import all of the animations to show what the player is doing. And that is going to become quite extensive. So let me minimize all of the functions and put all of this in a new method. And let's call it import player assets needs self and nothing else. And in here, first of all, I want to get my character path to the folder. This shouldn't be capitalized. And the path to my folder is going to be one fold up, then graphics, and then the player. And then forward slash, don't forget that, because in this folder, there are a couple of subfolders. And now we need all the different states that our player can have. And this I want to put in a dictionary because this will get quite extensive. And let me just copy all of this. It's going to look like this. And there's a bit much white space like this. So this is what I talked about earlier. We have the animation states for the player walking in all the four directions, the player being idle in all the four directions, and the player attacking in all of the four directions. So these are all the possible states the player can have. And if you look at the folders, they are named in the exact same way. And that makes it really easy for us to use the names of these dictionary entries to import all of the graphics. So what I can do now is for animation in self.animations.keys. Let's say if I just print it to illustrate what I'm getting. So animation and in the init method, I want to call this. So let's put it right at the beginning in here and let's call it a graphics setup and self dot import player assets. And now if I run the game, we can see we have all of our different states the player can have. So that's working quite well. And keep in mind, those are names for folders. We are not working with images yet. But basically what I want to do, I want to combine this player path here with all of these different subfolders. And that is actually going to look really similar compared to our support file here. So to what we have done with this. And then once I have the full path, I want to use my import folder function and fill the list for each of the states with the graphics from each folder. And this might be a good exercise for you. Try to figure this out yourself. That you go through every single animation, you create a full path, you use the import folder function to fill each of these folders with the associated images. So try to do this yourself. First of all, we are going to need our full path. And the full path is just going to be the character path plus the animation. And now for each self dot animations, and we can target the animation. I want to set each of these lists to my import folder. And this import folder, I have to import into my player. So from support, import, import folder. And now my import folder just needs a path and that is going to be my full path. So at the end of all of this, let me just print my self.animations and let's see what we get. Let's open an error, that looks good. In here, you can see, for example, we have up. So that's walking up and there are a bunch of different surfaces in there. Next up, we have down, 
more surfaces, then we have left, at some point we have right, then we have right idle, and all of the different states are in here, which is exactly what we wanted. So now we have effectively imported all of the assets for our player. So now we can minimize this method and not worry about it anymore. With that, we have covered the first part, that we have figured out how to get the resources into our player. Now, next up, we have to figure out how to actually play all of these states. And for that, we have to talk about state management. And essentially what we are going to do, our player is going to get an attribute called self.status. And this self.status is going to correspond with one of the keys in self.animation. So for example, it could be up, down, left, right, up idle, left idle, left attack, up attack, any of those. And for example, if it is up, we are going to pick all the surfaces inside of the up folder and play those repeatedly. So with that, we have to figure out our state management. And really what this one comes down to is we are going to look at our player direction and our player input and see what kind of movement the player is doing. For example, in our direction vector, if we have something like one and zero, we know our player is moving to the right. And just now from the timer, if self.attacking is true, we know the player has just been attacking. So we want to play the attack animation. And really all we are going to do is figure out the right condition for each of the 12 possible states. And once we have that, we can display an animation and be done with it. So let's try to figure out some states. Here we are back in the code and let's put it under graphic setup self.status and let's say by default this is going to be down and now we also want to create another method and I call this one get status and self and nothing else as always and in here we have to figure out how to get all of the different states and let's start with the easiest one the idle status and this one is actually fairly easy. All we want to check is if self.direction.x is equal to zero and self.direction.y is equal to zero. But now we have a problem. And let me actually illustrate this by drawing. So here is our player. And right now we know our player is not moving. So we want to play the idle animation. Now, the problem that we have is that we don't know what direction our player was walking. So we have four different idle statuses. We have down, left, up, or right. But right now, all we know is that our player is idling. We don't know in which direction he or she is idling. And that is something we do have to figure out. And I guess there are two ways to figure this out. One way, we could look at the direction before the player stopped moving. So for example, the direction before we stopped was positive one here. The player was probably walking to the right, but that would involve quite a bit of extra code that would be a bit annoying to work with. So instead, what I'm going to do, I'm going to check the current status. So for example, right now it's down, which means the player is walking downwards. And all I'm really going to do is to add towards this an idle. So that's why I keep my downwards movement, but now instead of walking, it's going to be idle. And really what we are doing, I think the best way to think about this is if I show the animations. So here we have up, down, left, and right. And then for idle, we have right idle, left idle, up idle, and down idle. So to move from up to up idle, all we have to add is underscore idle. And the naming here is very intentional. It's the same for attack. So if we are moving right and we are attacking, we just have to add underscore attack to up and we go from walking to the right to attacking to the right. So basically all I'm going to do is instead of overwriting self.status, I am just going to self.status plus underscore idle. And now what we can do in the update method, let's say after cooldowns, 
self.get status. And I guess what we can do, we haven't used our debug method in a while. I still have it. I don't. Uh, let's do this in the player. So in here, right now, we have our run method. And I want to call debug on myself dot player dot status just to see what's going on. Because right now we don't have an animation, we just have the status. So let's see what it's doing. So right now you can see the problem that we keep on adding idle to it and we also don't get updated down. Not working too well yet. And I guess I jumped a little bit ahead with the idle here because we first want to figure out the walking directions. And this happens in the input method because we know if we are pressing up, our player is going to move up. So what we can do in here is self.status is going to be up. And we can do the same thing for down. And we can do the same thing for right. And then finally, we have left. So this way, we are just determining the directions. And let me minimize input again. And let's comment out get status for now, just so not be confusing. So now main.py, we have down, we have right, left, up and down. So this is working pretty well. And even if I stop moving, it still says right, left, down and up. So these directions are working really, really well. The problem is right now, I have no way to separate between our player walking and our player idling. And that is what we have to work on. And this is what all of this code here is for. I should have planned that a little bit better. Sorry about that. So now if I uncomment this method here, what we basically get is if we are moving, things are well, but now if I stop moving, we keep on adding idle and well, it's not particularly helpful. Oh, and what is annoying me? I don't want to print self.animations. All right, now the problem is we don't check if our status already has idle in there. So we have to add another if statement that if not idle in self.status. So what we basically do, we first of all check if our direction for x and y is zero. That's this part here. So then we would assume if we are not moving, we are idling. Now, next up, we are checking if our status doesn't already contain the idle part. And only if that is the case, we are going to add underscore idle to our status. And that way we are only adding idle once and not multiple times, at least hopefully. Let's check this now. So we have down idle, we have up idle, left if I stop moving. That looks pretty good. So now we have some nice upgrades. Although if I now attack, it doesn't change anything. But the animation I want to play should be left attack or down attack. So that's the next part. And that is just going to be another if statement. So if self dot attacking. First of all, I don't want the player to be able to move and attack at the same time. So if we are attacking self dot direction dot x should be zero and the same for y. And now basically what we want to do is copy this line here. And let me actually just copy the entire thing. And I first want to check if we don't already have attack in our status. And if that is not the case, I want to add attack to my status. And this is, I guess, kind of going to work. Let's try. So now we have down idle up. This is still working. And now if I press attack, we get left idle attack and right idle attack. And um, well, it's kind of working. But the problem we have is that we only want left underscore attack. We don't want the idle in there. So what we want to do for attack is that we don't want to just attach attack. We want to remove idle if it is in there. And the same thing here. 
that if we are attacking, we don't want the player to play the idle animation or to add the idle tag. And this is just a matter of another if statement, or well, a longer if statement. So for example, for the status, if not idle and self.status and not attack in self.status. So now we are checking if the player isn't moving and we don't already idle or we are attacking and only if neither of these are true, then our player is going to idle. Now at the same time, for the other if statement, we first want to add another if statement. So in idle in self.status. So if that is the case, we want to overwrite idle. But if that is not the case, then we can just add a tag to the status. But now we want to overwrite the idle. And this is done with self.status is going to be self.status.replace. And here we have idle. And we want to replace it with underscore attack. And that is technically all we need. So now let's move up, down, left, and right. That is still working. Now if I stop, we have left idle, right idle, up idle, and down idle. And now if I attack, we have down attack, left attack, right attack, and up attack. But the one final problem we have is that you can still see it in the top, up attack still sticks around. So what I want to do after self.attacking is over, up attack should automatically switch back to up idle. And that's gonna be the final bit. And this is going to still happen in get status. And this could also be a pretty good exercise. So once self.attacking is false, I want to remove the attack in self.status. So try to figure this out yourself. All right, so we know this if self.attacking is only going to run if self.attacking is true. So if we add an else statement at the bottom here, we are checking if self.attacking is going to be false. And in here, all we want to do is self.status is going to be self.status.replace. And now we want to replace underscore attack with an empty string. Although this by itself might throw an arrow because Python might try to remove attack if there's no attack in the string. So this needs to have another if statement that if attack in self.status. So now this should be working. And I guess with that, we have our player status. Let's try. So down idle, up idle, attack. We go back to idle. We have left, right. I can attack. I go back to idle. This also works with magic. And yeah, this is working really good. Cool. So this is then going to be our get status. Now I can minimize this. And now we come to the finally good part where we actually animate our player. So let's really briefly talk about the logic for the animation. It really isn't all that difficult. Essentially, all we have to do. Right now, we always have the same image for our sprite. And for an animation, all we want to do is to loop over a list of different images. For example, if our player is moving to the right, we have five different images to loop over for the animation. And once we have that, we are, well, we are good to go. It really isn't that complicated. So all that we have to figure out in our code is how to quickly loop over different sprites in our animation frames. And let's do this straight in the code. That should be the easiest. Here we are back in our player and I want to create a new method. Let's put it all the way down here. And I call this one animate. We need self and no other arguments. And first of all, I want to have an animation. And the animation is going to be self.animations. And then we get the key from self.status. So if I open the player assets again, 
our player status can only be any of these 12 states. So if we pick any of these keys, we are going to get a list with the right animation that we want to loop over. So that's the first part. Now, next up, we have to give our player a couple of extra attributes. And let's put them all the way up here. First of all, we need self.frame underscore index, which by default is zero, and then self.animation underscore speed. And in my case, this is going to be 0 0.15. Now let me minimize this again. And essentially what we are going to do now is that we are going to loop over the frame index. So really what I want to do is self.frameIndex plus equal self.animationSpeed. So this is going to give me a continuously larger number. And let me actually draw this. So we are going to start at zero and then we're gonna get larger and larger numbers. And let's say eventually we want to pick one, we want to pick two, we want to pick three, we want to pick four and so on. But the problem we have right now is that our animation, so this thing here, has a finite number of frames. So we want to make sure that once we reach the end of this list, we want to go back all the way to zero. And this we can do simply by checking if self.frameIndex is greater or equal than the length of our animation. And if that is the case, self.frameIndex is going to be zero. All we are doing is we are increasing a number and once the number is larger than the length of our animation, frame index goes back to zero. So that way we continuously loop over our list. So that should be a pretty easy part. Now, next up, we want to actually set the image. And all we have to do here is to create a new self.image. And the image we want to get is from our animation. And in here, we want to get self.frameIndex. However, right now, Pygame or Python in general, for this indexing expects number like zero or one or two, essentially an integer. The problem is our animation speed is 0 0.15, so a floating point number. Hence, if we passed this number in here, Python would be very unhappy. So we have to convert this frame index to an integer, which we can do very easily with the int function. And we are good to go. Although there's one more thing I do want to do, that if we are changing the image, we also want to update the rectangle again. So self.image.getRect. And the center is going to be where our self.hitbox.center was in the last frame. The reason here is that different images of our player have different dimensions. So if we didn't update the rectangle, the player might shift by a couple of pixels around that would make it look slightly weird. But that's really all we needed. So now after get status, self dot animate. And let's see how this is going to look. So now the player can move up, left, right. And things are looking good. So now if I attack, we get an attack animation. Now the sword and the magic attack are the same, but uh, well, it doesn't really matter. However, there's one last thing I do want to fix because right now, let me run the code again. So if I attack, I can move to the left. I think it's good to see now. And I don't want the player to be able to change direction mid attack. Essentially, I don't want the player to do any keyboard input during an attack anyway. So what I want to do, let me minimize animate and go back to input. I only want to do all of this if the player, so if not self dot attacking. And now I can't do anything during an attack. 
I guess with that, we can also remove these lines here because they are not necessary anymore. So now let's try this again. Still feels pretty good. And yeah, this is working really well. So with that, we have player animations. And for the next part, let's add some weapons. And essentially all that we are going to do, whenever the player presses attack, we are going to create a new sprite with any of the weapons. We have quite a few different ones actually. And that way we can already see the weapon. The only thing we really have to do is to work with the position and then destroy weapon once self-attacking of the player is over. But that's basically it. Essentially what we are doing is we are creating a sprite for a short period of time and that sprite shows the weapon of the player. And later on we will have to add a bit more to make the weapon actually do anything. But that comes later. I guess for now let's actually show the weapon. And the first thing we will need is some data. So let's start working on that straight in our code. Here I am back in the file and I want to keep my data broadly in settings. And right now it doesn't actually have that much. So I want to import, or well, not import, but rather paste one dictionary that looks like this. And this one has our weapon data. So in here we have our sword, our lance, our axe, our rapier, rapier, whatever it's called, and our psi. And each has its own cooldown, its own damage, and its own graphic that we are going to show later in the UI. And now that we have that, I want to create a new class, but let me first close debug and tiled so we can see all of the tabs. I guess we can also close support. We don't need those anymore. So now I want to create a new file that I'm going to save as weapon.py. And then here we are going to need the usual. So import pygame, game. And then we have to create a class that I'm going to call weapon. And this one is going to be a sprite. So we need pygame.sprite.sprite. .sprite. And then we have our init method. For now, we're just going to go with self. And then as always, we need super dunder init. And now we have to figure out, well, we have to figure out two major things. The first one is self.image. And the second one is self.rect. And let me actually draw what I'm hoping to do. This square here is our player. And our player is facing to the right. And essentially what we want to do with our weapon is to spawn another sprite that essentially starts at the right side of our player and then stays roughly here. So for now, what we have to figure out is what is the direction of the player and from that, how can we use that direction to spawn the weapon to that side of the player? And I guess just to keep things simple for now, our self.image is just going to be pygame.surface with, uh, let's say, 40 and 40. So for now, it's just going to be a black square, but later on, it's going to be a proper graphic. So we have to figure out the rectangle. The problem is to figure out the right position we need our player since our weapon is supposed to be right next to the player. So we have to import, let's say, the actual player. And I guess while we add it, we can also add groups to know where the groups are supposed to be. And for now, just to have something, let's say our rect is going to be self.image.get underscore rect and the center is going to be just on top of the player. So player.rect.center. And to spawn that weapon, we need a two-step process. First of all, in our level, this is where our weapon has to be. Let me actually minimize all of this so it's a bit easier to see. So right now, in our level class, we have all of our, well, sprites, all of our everything. So my weapon has to be in here as well. And that way, it's later possible to interact between the weapon and an enemy or between the grass. So our weapon has to be available inside of the level. The problem is we are getting the attack input from our player. So from this line here. So our attack happens inside of the player, but we want to sword inside of our level. That's the main problem we have right now. So we have to get around that. 
And that, fortunately, is quite easy. Essentially, what we are going to do in our level class, we are going to create another method. And let's call it create attack. Need self and nothing else. And what we want to do in here is to create our weapon. And for that, we also have to import it. So from weapon, import weapon. And now let me copy the parameters again so we can figure out the arguments. So our player, we do have, we created this in create map. So our player is stored right now in self the player down here. So I can literally just copy this one and paste it in here. And let me minimize this again. That makes our class significantly easier to read. Now for the groups. For now, I want this thing to just be in self.visible sprites. And well, that is it for this method, at least for now. Now, next up, what I want to do in my create map, when I create a player, I want to pass this method in here. So self.create attack. And really important here, we are passing the function into this method. We are not calling the function. So there should not be brackets. Let me actually cross it out. So these brackets here should not be there. If they are there, you are going to get some weird result. Because this function, we want to call from inside of the player. So inside of my player, let me minimize everything in here as well. There we go. So now in our init method for the player, we have another argument that we called create attack. And let's put this under, I guess, movement works. So self.create attack is just going to be create attack. And now we have this method here available inside of our player. And now what we can do in our input method, we can call under create input instead of attack, we can call self.create attack. And now we have no arguments, so this should be fine by itself. So let's run this and let's see what happens. So now if I press space, we can see a black square on top of our player. And that is going to be our weapon. Cool, so this is working already. So now with our level and our player, we have the ability to create a weapon. Although granted, it's not particularly helpful right now, but that's something we can work on. And there are two things we essentially have to figure out. The first one is where to place the weapon, and the second one is how to figure out the graphic for the weapon, because each direction is going to be different. And since we already talked about the direction, let's talk about with the placement of the weapon. But let me actually separate this. So here we want to talk about the graphic, and then a bit further down, we want to talk about the placement. Now, in either of these cases, we need the direction of the player. Because if the player is moving to the right, we want to place the weapon to the right and also show the right image of the weapon. So we have to figure out, let's do it all the way at the top. Let's call it direction. And this, I think, could be a pretty good exercise. So try from the player to get our direction. So our player has a ton of different attributes that he could be using. Try to figure out one so we can reliably tell which way the player is facing. I guess there are two ways you could approach this. You could either look at the status of the player or at the direction. They both would work, but in my case, self.status I think is the easier one. So that's the one I am going to use. So really all I'm going to do is player and status. And what I want to get essentially is, let me illustrate it here. So I want to have these four directions. So up, down, left, and right. My problem right now is that I have to get rid of these other directions. So right idle would be kind of annoying. But this is fortunately quite easy to get rid of because for that, we have the split method. And split method needs two arguments. The first one is at which character we want to split things. In my case, at the underscore. 
because back my player. The up, for example, is split from the idle by the underscore. So if we split this string by the underscore, we get up and idle. So that's then the first thing I'm caring about. And you could also pass in a second argument that tells you how many times you could potentially split the string. But in my case, that shouldn't matter. And now let's actually print what we get. That's probably the easiest way to illustrate this. So now when I run this again, I press space. Now we get right now down and idle. Now if I move up, we get up, we get left and idle, right, down, left. This is working pretty good. Now, what you do notice, if we only stand and we have up and idle, then Python splits this. But if we are moving and we only have up, then we only get a single element. But in both cases, this is working really well. So essentially, this split method here, if it doesn't find an underscore, it's just going to ignore whatever it has. But now we have a list of our directions and if the player is idling or not. Now, the information if the player idles or is attacking, I don't care about. So I'm just going to pick the item with the index zero because our string is always going to start with the direction, which is the only part I really care about. So with this simple line, we already have the direction of our player. So with that, we can start figuring out the positioning of our weapon. So if direction is equal to right, I now have to figure out a different kind of rectangle. And again, let me visualize what I want to do. And let me draw it a little bit larger. So here we have our player. And the weapon should be, if we're moving to the right, should be right here. And I would invite you to think about how we could place the weapon in the middle of the player to the right of the player so that they are right next to each other. And do think about this for just a second. Basically, what I am going to do is our player has a mid-right position of the rectangle. So that's the position we are going to use for the player. And then when we are placing the weapon, we're going to place the mid left. So let's call this one ML, and this one is going to be MR. So if we place those two points in such a way, we would have both of these right next to each other. When my player is walking to the right, I want to place the mid left of my weapon. And the position where I want to place it is at the mid right of my player. And for now, let's just add an else statement. So we have something. So self.rect is self.image.get underscore rect. And center is going to be player.rect.center. So we don't get an error. But now, if we're running the game and we're moving to the right, our rectangle should be spawned to the right of the player. So let's try this. And if I move to the right, we get indeed something that almost works. So we have our rectangle of the weapon spawning to the right of the player. But if we look a bit closely and during the attack animation, our player's hand is a bit too low. And the reason for that is that the player hand is a bit below the middle part of the sprite. So we don't actually want to spawn our weapon right in the middle of the player we want to give it a tiny offset. And this we can add quite easily, actually. So this position here right now is a tiny bit too high. But really, all we have to do to change it is pygame.math.vector2. And we don't want to move it in the x position, but we do want to move it down by 16 pixels. So now let's try this again. And now we have a weapon exactly where the hand is supposed to be. So with that, we have one direction. Now all we have to do is figure out all of the other directions. So L if direction 
is equal to left. And for this one, I can just copy paste the right direction and change mid left to mid right and then mid right to mid left. And the vector can actually stay the same. That one's perfectly fine. So now if I move right, still works. If I move left, name left is not defined. Let's have a look. Ah, should be in quotation marks. So now let's try this again. So right is still working and left is still working. So cool. Now we already have two directions that work just fine. Okay, now next up, we have L if direction is going to be down. And I guess let me copy the line again, except now we want to place the mid top of our weapon and we want to place this at the mid bottom of our player. And now for the vectors, we do have to make a slight adjustment. So in this case, we do want to move the X position, but not the Y position. So let's try this. And we have right, we have left, and now we have down. This one also seems to work. So the one thing left is up. And this we could put in the else statement. So in here, we want to place the mid bottom of our weapon, and it should be in the mid top of our player. And then we want to add this vector to it. And now we should have the placement of our weapon. So down, all directions look pretty good. So I can't see any problems with this. Nice. So with that, we have the placement of our weapon. Obviously right now it doesn't look very good because we have to figure out the actual graphics of the weapon. Now, fortunately, this is quite simple. And let me show you the folder setup. So here we have all of our folders. And the one I care about right now is weapons. And inside of weapons, we have our five different weapons. Now, if I go inside of sword, we can see down, full, left, right, and up. And the full sword is the one that's going to be in the UI. But all the other directions, we are going to actually display in the game. And notice here, down is exactly named like the direction or the status of our player. So we can use the string of our player to select a specific weapon inside of this folder, which is exactly the idea here. Although before we can actually select any direction, we first have to select the weapon we actually want to use. So we have to tell our player what weapon is currently selected. And that is the first thing we have to work on. So let me do this straight back in the code. So here we're back in the weapon code. And right now we want to pick one image of the weapon. But to pick the right weapon, we need to know what weapon the player has selected. And this I want to keep in the player. So let me minimize this one again, the input as well. So in the movement, let me actually add a whole new section here. And let's call this one uh, let's call it a weapon. I guess that works. And then here we can actually put create attack as well. That works a bit better. Now, what I want to do in here is self dot weapon index. And right now it's zero. And later on, this is the number we are going to change to select different weapons. And how that is basically going to work is I'm going to get my self dot weapon. And this is going to cycle through this weapon data list here. And we are already importing all of the settings, so I can just use weapon data. So I want to get one specific key from this weapon data. And to get that, we need a couple of different things. First of all, right now, we only care about the keys. So in our weapon, if we have a sword, a lance, an axe, or any of the other weapons, and from this, I want to get myself dot weapon index. So for example, if our weapon index is zero, I want to pick the sword. If my weapon index was one, it would be the lance. But right now this would not be working because what keys returns isn't the list that you can index from apparently. So we have to turn it into a list. 
And now we can just pick from this list with a different index. And let me demonstrate. So print self.weapon. And in theory now, if we start the game, we should be getting sword. So let's try it. And we indeed get sword. So this is actually working. Nice. So now we know what weapon our player is supposed to have. With that information, back in my weapon, I can now get a full path to that weapon. And that is going to become an F string. And first of all, we have to go up to the graphics folder. And inside of the graphics folder, we have to go to weapons. Now, inside of weapons, we have to get the specific kind of weapon our player has selected. Fortunately, the naming of the variable is the same as the folder. So we can just go with player.weapon. Now, next up, we want to select the right direction. And this we get with direction. And finally, all we need is .png. So now we have the weapon and the direction. So really, all we have to do now is use pygame.image.load and import the full path. And as always, don't forget to convert alpha all of this. And technically, this is all we needed. So now let's run this. And now if I press to the right, we get an error. And you can see down here, we have graphics, swords, weapons, sword, right. Essentially, I forgot one slash. So back in my weapon, after weapons, there should be a forward slash. So now let's try this again. And there we go. We have a sword that works in all the different directions. And that's a pretty good start. Although you can see the problem right now, our weapon does stick around, which is not ideal. Although it's kind of looking funny. But okay, cool. This is working pretty well. So the last thing we have to figure out is how to despawn the weapon once it's supposed to end. And this I am also going to do in my level.py file. And then here, let me minimize everything again. I just want to create another method that, that I'm going to call destroy weapon. And it needs self and nothing else. And now I want to first check if this weapon exists in the first place. Now, right now, we can't really do this because we have no way to identify if this thing exists. So I want to store it in its own variable. So in my init method, I'm going to create, let's put it, actually even better, let's add a whole nother section and let's call it the attack sprites because there's going to be a bit more later on. But for now, I just want to have self.current attack and it's going to be none by default. And then when we create the weapon, it's going to be stored in self.current attack. So now in our destroy weapon, all we have to do is if self.current attack exists, then we want to get self.current attack and kill it. And I guess just for good form, we can also set self.current attack back to none. And now all we have to figure out is how to call this method here. And I think this could be a pretty good exercise for you. So try to figure it out and it's going to work in a very similar way compared to create attack. So let me minimize the init method again. And in my create map, I have already put self.create attack in there. And now besides that, I also want self.destroy weapon. Oh, I just realized the naming here isn't ideal. Let's call it destroy attack and destroy attack in here as well. That way our naming is a bit more consistent. Okay, and then in our player, we now want self.destroy attack as well. And that one is just going to be destroy attack. 
And this one then is going to be another parameter. So now we can call destroy tag inside of our player. We just have to figure out when to call it. And the answer in my case is in my cooldowns, because we know after this cooldown, our player's attack is supposed to be over, so we can attack again. So what we can do in here is self.destroy attack. And that is all we needed, I believe. So now I can attack in each direction and we can see the weapon. So this is actually coming together really nicely. And on top of that, our weapon is also obeying the drawing order. So it's drawn above or below different sprites. So all of this is working super well. Now, I guess there's one more thing that we do have to implement because right now we cannot switch between different weapons. Or well, I guess we can if we go to my player and we change weapon index, let's say to a three. Let's see what we get. If I now press, now we get the whatever this weapon is called, but it's definitely working. So we have to figure out in code how to change this weapon index from inside of the game. And well, let's do this in the input. So in here, we already have quite a few different things. And I just want to add another if statement. And in my case, if keys... Now, in my case, the key I am using to switch the weapon is Q. So pygame.k underscore Q. And in the most basic sense, all that this one is supposed to do is get myself dot weapon index and add one to it. Unfortunately, by itself, it's not that easy for the same problem that we have seen with the attack and the magic input. That if we didn't add a timer in here, Pygame would press or would trigger this code very often because a normal button press for a normal human being is going to be, let's say, half a second long. Now for Pygame, half a second is a lot of frames in our game. And for each of those frames, this button would be pressed. So if we press this button once, Python would update weapon index with plus one probably about 10 times. So instead, we have to create another timer like we have done earlier. And now this timer has to be independent from the attack and the magic one, because the player should be able to switch weapons at basically any time. So I want to create another timer. And the first thing I have to do for that is, let's say, in my weapon. I think it makes sense there. And what I want to create in here is going to look very similar compared to these lines here. So first of all, I want to create another variable that I called can switch underscore weapon. And by default, this one should be true. And then besides that, I want to have self dot weapon switch time. And this by default is going to be none. So that's the equivalent of our attack time. Now, finally, we need a cooldown duration. And in my case, it's going to be the same thing for the weapon and for the magic switching. So we can call this one self dot switch duration cooldown. And this one I put at 200. So now we have all we need to create a basic timer. So now back in this line here, I only want to trigger the Q press if we press the button and if self.can switch weapon is true. And if we have pressed it, then self.can switch weapon should be false. And just like we have done up here, we also want to get the time that we press this button. So self. I think, what did I call it? Uh, weapon switch time. So weapon switch time is going to be pygame.time.get underscore ticks. And only once that is the case, we want to update our weapon with plus equal one. And let me just check if I'm starting at weapon zero. Yep. So now in the game, technically, we should be able to switch our weapon once. Let's try. So right now, if I press the attack, we get our sword. Now, if I press Q, 
we still get our sword. And I think I know why. So back in my player. We are updating our weapon index. But if I go up to the init method, we have changed right now our weapon index. But what we have not updated is our actual weapon. So this was only set in the init method, but it's not being updated when we press the button. So that's what we have to do as well. And let me just copy the entire list. I think that's the easiest way to approach this. So after I've updated the index, I also want to update myself.weapon. And this happens basically with the same line. Well, exactly with the same line. So now let's try this again. So sort, now if I press Q, and now we get the lance. Although since I don't have a timer to react to weight, my can switch weapons, we can't change it again. But that we can do now. And that's going to happen down here in cooldowns. And I would actually recommend you to look at our cooldown for the attack animation and copy it so we can switch weapons and have a timer for that. What I basically want to do is if self dot can switch weapon and I want to check if this is not the case because we are setting this thing up here to false. So only if this is false, we want to run the timer. And if the timer is running, I want to get my current time and subtract self dot weapon switch time. And if that is greater or equal to self dot weapons, which what do I call it again, we start to have a lot of variables. Switch duration cooldown. There we go. So down here, switch duration cooldown. Now, if that is the case, we want to set self dot can switch weapon back to true. And now let's try this again. So now my weapon still works. Now if I press Q. We get the lance. If I press it again, we get the axe. Press it again, different weapon and a different weapon. But now I press it again, and now we have list index out of range. And this happens if I go to my player that we are always updating this number by one, but we only have five weapons inside of our list. So at some point, this number is going to exceed the length of that list. But that we can fix fairly easily. And really, all we have to do is if self dot weapon index is smaller than the length of the list of our keys. So this thing here. And only if that is the case, we want to add plus one to our weapon index. Now, if that is not the case, we want to do something else. And what we want to do is to set our self dot weapon index back to zero. So once we're exceeding that number, we are going back to zero. And that way I don't have to implement a backwards mechanic for this button. But you could totally do that if you wanted to. But with that logic, we have the weapon mechanic. So let's try. So now I get sword, lance, X, next one, next one. Now if I press Q again, we still get an error. Okay, not great. Let's have a look. Ah, and what I just saw, this should be length minus one because we start counting from zero. So now let's try this again. Different weapons, different weapons. Now let's try again. Now we're back to sword. Cool. So now this is working. So this is a common thing in Python that the length of our list was one too large because of the way we're counting the length of the list. But well, now we have our proper weapon mechanic. So all right, with that, we have a weapon. Although right now you can't really see the weapon. So next up, we are going to work on the UI. And I guess while we're at it, we can also implement the health bar, the energy bar, the experience or the souls, and then the magic we currently have selected. So we have all of the stuff in one place. So I guess let's talk about how to approach the UI. That's going to be the next section. I guess in the most basic sense, the UI is going to consist of two different elements. Number one is our player is going to have a ton of different data. 
for example, what our current weapon is, that's the one we already have. But besides that, we also need health, energy, experience, our magic, and I guess that's it. And these are the things we have to add to our player. Now, once we have all of them, we can actually start working on the UI elements that are visible. And this is going to involve a couple of different things. For example, we have to show the health bar and the energy bar. And both of those, for example, are just rectangles. And the width is determined by the amount of health as a proportion of our full health or our full energy. So we're not really going to do anything sophisticated. We're just creating different rectangles. And the weapon and the magic are just the images with some background rectangles. One has a color, one only has an outline. And if we combine these different elements, we basically get some nice looking UI that I think came together really, really well. And I guess this part is best explained when I actually implement it. So let's start with number one and let's give our player a couple of key attributes to actually create a game. Here I am back in my player and let me go down and add another section here. And let's call this one stats. And what I'm going to paste in here is just going to be a dictionary. So we have our health, our energy, our attack, our magic, and our speed. And I guess if you're confused, right now we have attack here, and for each weapon we have damage. And what I'm going to do later on is our ultimate damage of the player is the base attack plus the weapon damage. So these are going to be our base stats. But we need a few more things. So right now our health is at 100, and this would be our current maximum. But now imagine we run the actual game and an enemy hits us. Then we have to lower this amount, but we still have to know what our maximum amount is. And for that, I want to add self.health, and by default, it's going to be self.stats and just health. So by default, our self.health is going to be the same as the maximum we can have. However, later on in the game, we can actually lower this amount and then we can have a difference between the maximum and our current health. And we can do the same thing, since we're going to need it anyway, is our energy. And this is just going to be self.stats and in here, our energy. And there's one more thing that we do need for the UI, and that is self.stats. EXP. And this one doesn't have a stats entry because it's, well, just the experience. And let's say just so we have a number, let's go with 123. And actually, while we're here, we can also now determine self.speed is going to be self.stats and speed. So now we can go up a tiny bit and get rid of this speed here because later on we want to be able to update this. And I guess it should be. By, by default, so we keep the same speed. Okay, now our player has some stats and some current stats that we can work with. So now we actually have to create the UI. And what I want to do is to create a new file that I'm going to save as ui.py. And in here, as always, we need import pygame and from settings, import all of it. And now I want to create a new class called UI. And then here, as always, we need our init method with self and nothing else. And for now, let's just add a pass in here and figure out how to call this thing in the first place. And I want to call this from the level because in here we are drawing all of it. And let me minimize all the methods so it's a bit easier to see. Let's say we can minimize this one as well. Now, in my level class, I want to create another section and let's call this one the user interface. And what I want to do in here is self.ui is going to be UI. So the class we have just created, this one here. And for that to work, we have to do from UI import UI. So now we can actually use it. And pretty much what I want to do in my run method on top of everything else. I guess I can get rid of the debug one. I can run self.ui and essentially I want to give it one method that I call display and to get the information from the player, 
I want to pass self.player in here. And that is pretty much all we have to do in our level. Now we can just work in our UI and all we need is one method that was called display and we need self and the player as the arguments. So now we can call pass. And now we have a class where we have access to the player and we can call it from the level itself. Oh, well, we are always calling it. And now let's run this. We don't get an error. So at the very least, it's working. Cool. So now we just have to figure out all of the UI elements. And there are quite a few different ones. So let's go through this thing step by step. First of all, we need a couple of general bits of information. So let's call this general. And first of all, I want to have access to the display surface. And this we get as always with pygame.display.get underscore surface. Now, next up, we also have some text. So I want to create self.font. Now, we do have a font that we can just import. And I also know the font size. But for my UI design, I have quite a few parameters, like the bar height, the width of all the elements, the box sizes of the weapon and magic items. And I want to store all of this in my settings. So before I import the font, let me go to my settings. And in here, I want to add another sections that I called the UI. And in here, I have a couple of parameters that look like this. And these are all the elements I will need to, well, make the UI work. And actually, while we are here, there are a couple more, and these ones are going to be colors. So we have our general colors. We have the water, the UI BG color, the border color, and the text color. And then we have the health bar color, the energy bar color. And then if we select something, you're going to see how those look later on. But for now, all of these are just very simple variables that don't really store anything complicated. So, all right, now we can use them. So first of all, I want to import my font. And this is going to happen with pygame.font.font. And in here, we need the font we want to import, which in my case is, I called this one UI font. So UI underscore font. And then we need a font size which in my case is stored in UI underscore font underscore size. And now we have to choose which element to start with. So we can either do the health and the energy bar, the experience or the weapon or magic. And let's say we're gonna start with the health and energy bar. I'm going to add another tab here and let's call it for now the bar setup. And right now, I want to create some general rectangle where the health and where the energy bar is going to be. And this is just going to be a rectangle. And I'm going to call this health bar rect. And this is going to be pygame.rect. And now for this one, we need the left, the top, the width, and the height. Now the width and the height we do have in here. So we have a health bar width that we can put in here. And the bar height is identical. So it's just called bar height. So bar height. Now, next up for the left and the top, I just went with 10 and 10, which is in the top left. Now, besides that, I also want self.energy bar rect. And this one is going to work in a very similar way. So pygame.rect. And now again, we need the left, we need the top, we need the width, and we need the height. And now the height we already have is just the bar height. For the width, we have energy bar width in our settings. So width in here. And I want this one to start on the same X position, but the top is supposed to be a bit further down. I went with 34. And now once we have that, we could actually already try to draw something. So let's see if this works in the first place. So I just want to use pygame.draw.rect. And in here we need a surface, we need a color, and we need a rectangle. And for the surface, we have self.display surface. 
Let's say for the color, for now it's going to be black. We're going to change this anyway. And for the rect, let's go with self.healthbar rect. So now let's try this. And we can indeed see a health bar in the top left. And this one stays in a nice position. So this is working very well. Cool. But I don't want to draw this element right here. So let me add a pass in there again. Instead, I want to create a function that is a bit more flexible. So just a function that can take a current amount, a max amount, a background rectangle and a color, and then display either a health bar or an energy bar. So we can use it for both. And well, let's implement this one. So I call this one show bar. And in here, we need a couple of different arguments. So first one, we need the current amount. Then we need the max amount. Then we need the background rectangle. And then we need a color. So for example, what I essentially want to do, I want to call self.showBar. And then in here, I want to pass in player.health, then player.stats and health. So that's our max health. Then I want to pass in this rectangle. And this is going to give us the position of where the health bar is going to be. And then finally, I want to give this thing a color. And a color we get from our settings, we have health color. Although granted, it's just red. So in my UI, I can pass this in here. And where this system is really useful, now we could just copy all of this and change health to energy. And then this health should also be energy. And our health color should be the energy color. Although, again, the energy color is just blue. All right, now we have a function to create the health and the energy bar. We just have to write it. First of all, we have to draw the background. That is what I basically wrote just a second ago. So again, pygame.draw.rect. And then here we again need self.display surface. Then we need a color. And in my case, the color is the UI BG color. So I can paste this here. And then we're going to need our BG rectangle. And I guess quite important, this color here is not supposed to be this color up here. So that's not the case. Right now, we are just drawing the background of our bar. We're not drawing the bar that's supposed to indicate the health right now. That will come in just a second. But now, actually, this should already work. Let's try this. And yeah, now we can see our two bars for health and energy in the top left. And they are working perfectly fine. And now that we have that, we can start working on drawing the bar. Although now we do have a problem. And let me illustrate what the problem is. So right now we have one bar. Let's say it has a length of something like this. And I know from my settings, so the health bar width, for example, that this entire thing right now is 200 pixels wide. And all of that so far worked pretty well. Now the problem is that my health is not in pixels. So this player health here at the current maximum would be 100. So this would be our full health. The problem is inside of this thing, we have to convert this 100 to a 200. And this should then obviously be flexible. So we have to figure out how much is 100 in health in terms of pixels in our health bar. So we need a bit of math to convert our health into pixels. And let me actually add another section to that. So converting stat to pixel. And first of all, I want to figure out a ratio. And that is going to be my current amount divided by my max amount. And that is going to tell me how much of my max amount do I actually have. And this is already getting us really close to a pixel measurement because I know, for example, for my health, my max amount is going to be 200 pixels wide. So what I want to figure out next is my current width from that. And all I really want to do in here is get my background rectangle 
and get the width from that. So that is my max width in pixels. And this, I just want to multiply by the ratio. And let's do some numbers just to illustrate how this is going to work. So our current health right now is 100. And our maximum is also 100. So if you divide one by the other, you end up with one. Now our B direct for our health is going to be 200 pixels wide. And if our ratio then is one, we are going to get a pixel width of 200 for our entire bar. So this is then working quite well. Now, let's say we have different numbers. So instead of 100, we get 50. Now our result is going to be 0 0.5. And if we multiply 200 with 0 0.5, we don't get 200, we get 100 which is exactly half of the width of our background rectangle. All right, so now we have to use that information to create a new rectangle. So let's call it current rect. And since I already have in my background rectangle most of the information, I can just copy this one. And now for my current rect dot width, I'm going to set this to my current width. So this way I have a rectangle in the same position with the same height, but with this line, I give it a different width. So all we have to do now is to draw this rectangle. So pygame.draw.rect. Now we still need self.display surface. Next up, we need the color and that color we are getting from the parameters. So we don't have to worry about it. And finally, I want to draw my current rect. And now let's try this. There we go. Now in our top left, we can see our health and our energy bar. And what I can also do, so let's say in my player, just to illustrate, let me multiply our health by 0 0.5 and our energy by 0 0.8. Now if I run this, you can see that we have half of our health and most of our energy. So this way we can change the health and the energy of the player and it updates automatically. So this system works super well. Now there's one more thing I did add to this and that is basically a border around the health bar which does make it look a bit nicer. And this is just pygame.draw.rect self.display surface. Now for the color, we have in settings a UI border color. So that's the one I'm going to use here. And then besides that, we have the current rectangle. So right now we are just drawing a rectangle on top of the other rectangle, which wouldn't be very helpful. But now if we are giving this another argument, this would be the line width. In my case, it's three. And once you give something a line width in Pygame, the fill disappears and we only have the line. Let me actually demonstrate. Now it looks like this. Oh, and I did make a mistake. Right now, we are just drawing a bar around our actual health, which is not what I want. Instead, I want to draw around my BG rect. So we are covering the entire bar with an outline. So now let's try this again. And there we go. This is looking quite a bit better. It's a touch hard to see, but if you look at the left of it, it is definitely there. So, all right, with that, we have our health bars. Wasn't actually that bad. So now I can minimize my show bar and never worry about it again. So with that part covered, we can start working on the experience. And that part should be really easy. Basically, what I want to do, I'm gonna call another method, and this one's gonna be called show exp. So let's create that method show underscore exp and this one besides self also needs let's call it the exp and now what i want to do first of all i want to create a text surface and the text is going to be the experience and essentially this means i want self dot font dot render and in here we need the information we need anti-aliasing and we need a color and let's go through them one by one. Let's start with the easiest one, anti-aliasing. In my case, it's false 
because I have pixel art and this one shouldn't be anti-aliased. Then besides that, for the color, I can go to my settings and in settings, I have a text color. So that's the one I'm going to use. And then finally, we have our information and this is supposed to become the exp. And right now, exp is going to be in our player and it is this number here, an integer. Now the problem is that Python for this one needs a string. So this one wouldn't work by itself, but we can fix that fairly easily by using the string method. And there's one more thing I would like to do. And that is that I want to convert this number into an integer. Now, why do I want to do that? Because right now, our experience already is an integer. Essentially, this is to make sure that our numbers don't get too long. So if by some weird math, we end up with a floating point number with 10.0001, then this would look very strange in the experience. And converting this experience to an integer avoids that problem entirely. So next up, we have to figure out how to place this surface. And I did that with a rectangle. And really, all we need here is the text surface and get rect. And since I want to place this thing in the bottom right, let me actually draw it really quick. So if this is my entire game window, I want the experience to be down here-ish. And to place it down here, I think the best point would be the bottom right. So let's place that one. Actually, I think this could be a pretty good exercise. So try to place the text rectangle on the bottom right of the window, wherever you think it looks good, and then draw the text on the display surface. First of all, I need bottom right. That's the point I would like to place. And for this one, I need X and Y. So I have to figure out what the dimension of these two variables are going to be. And let's do them in separate variables so it's a bit easier to see what I'm doing. Now, what we have to be aware of here, if this again is our entire window and we are placing our experience down here with this origin point, the thing I have to figure out is the maximum width of my window, so this distance here, and this would give me the right side of the window. And now what I have to figure out from here is how far away I want to get from there. And this would then give me my origin point on the x-axis. And the same for the y. We essentially first have to get the entire height of the window, and then from that point subtract how high we want the experience to float from the bottom of the window. So what that means in practice is we first have to get the dimensions of our window. And this we can get with self.displaySurface and get size. And this is going to return us a tuple with x and y. And for x, we only care about the first one, that is the x dimension. Now we can copy all of this and target the first one. So with these two points, our window would be right at the bottom right of the screen. But I want there to be a tiny offset. And in my case, for x, I went with 20. And for y, I had the same number. So now our text rectangle is in the bottom right of the window. Now all we have to do is call self.displaySurface and blit and pass in the text surface and the text rectangle. And we are almost done. The one thing we haven't done yet is in showXP, we have to pass in the experience. And this we get from player. And that is still the player we are getting from the argument of the display method. But player right now isn't good because we want the experience of the player. So I want player.exp, I believe I called it. So in here, yeah, player.exp. And now this should be working. So let's try to run all of this. And there we go. In the bottom right of the window, so all the way down here, you can see the experience. So not a bad start. Although also not a great one because you can barely read it. But this we can fix quite easily because we can use the text rectangle to draw a background and a frame around this box. So let's do that. And first of all, the background 
has to be behind our text. And all I really need to do in here is to call pygame.draw.rect. And in here, I need my display surface, so self.displaySurface. Then I need a color, which in my case, I called UIBG color, the same as the health bar, and finally a rectangle. So our text rectangle. And now, this is already looking quite a bit better. Although not ideal, because I would like the box to be slightly larger than the text. But this we can also fix. So this rectangle, I want to be slightly larger. And this we can also do with the inflate method. That's the same method we have seen earlier to create the hitboxes. And earlier we passed in negative numbers to make the rectangle smaller. But if we passed in larger numbers, let's say 20 and 20, now our rectangle is going to become larger. And that is exactly what I wanted. So with that, we have our background. But I also want to draw a frame around this box. And for that, I'm just going to copy the draw method. And now I can add another argument, and that way we get a frame, which in my case has a width of three. And then we also need another color, and I call this one UI border color. And now let's have a look. And there we go. The effect is fairly subtle, but I do think it does make it look a little bit better. But all right, now we can show our experience. So now let me minimize the experience method. And now there's only one more element we have to cover. And that is the selection box for the weapon and the magic. And this I want to work kind of like the health and the energy bar. That I have one method that just creates a box. And then I can give this box different arguments to display different player statistics. Although this one has to become a little bit more complex since we're displaying an image, but it's not that bad. I guess let's work on it straight in the code. Now, first of all, I want to create another method that I have called selection underscore box. Need self as always, and then we need a position. And I call this left and top. And that is all we are going to need for now. Although there's going to be a change later on. And this selection box is essentially going to give us the background box for our weapon. So this is the box. And then later on, we are going to paste an image of the weapon in here. So this selection box gives us the box and the position where to place this surface. You're going to see a second what I mean. Now, first of all, we need a rectangle. And I call this one the BG rectangle. And for this one, we want to create a rectangle, so pygame.rect. And for this one, we have to figure out the left, the top, the width, and the height. And left and top, we already have. That part is literally the arguments we are getting from the function itself. So those two, we don't have to worry about. Now, width and height are also very simple because in my settings, I have an item called item box size. And this one is supposed to determine the size of this box. And since we are creating a square, it's the same dimension for both X and Y. So now we have our background rectangle. And what we can do already is draw it. So pygame.draw.rect, we need self.display surface, then UI BG color, and then BG rect. We can already call it just to see what's going on. So selection box. And let's say for the left, I will go with 10. And for the height, let's say 1150. So now let's try this, and we can't see anything. Ah, for the simple reason that this number is way too high. It should be more like 600. Let's try now. There we go. Now in the bottom right, you can see the rectangle. I guess let's put it a tiny bit further down. Let's say 630. And yeah, this feels much better. So now we have a rectangle. Cool. Now what we can also do is copy this entire thing, give it a border radius, and now call this UI border color. And with that, we also have the frame around this box, which is already making it look better. Nice. And this is basically all we are going to need for the overlay for either the weapon or the magic. So essentially, what I'm going to do is call this twice. The first one is 
for the weapon and the second one is for the magic. And for the magic box, I went with 85 and I put it a slight bit further down. I think 35 is what I used. So let's call it and there we go. Now we have our two boxes and they are slightly overlapping, which I think looks pretty good. Actually, let's give it a bit more of an overlap. Let's turn this to an 80. And there we go. I think this looks really nice. Cool. So with that, we have our selection boxes. Now what we have to figure out is how to pass the weapon or the magic image in here. And I realize we don't have the magic yet. We're going to work on that in the next section. But for now, let's figure out the weapon. And I'm going to put this in its separate method. And let's call it the weapon overlay. And since this method has to know what weapon the player is using, I also want to get what I call the weapon index. And this weapon index is going to be this weapon index in our player file or player class. And I'm going to use that to figure out which surface we want to draw. Now, first of all, I want to call this selection box method from inside the weapon overlay. And for that, I can just copy all of this and paste it in here. That already cleans things up. And instead of calling this method, I can call weapon overlay. And I guess while we call the method, I can also place in the argument. So player dot weapon index. So right now there shouldn't be any change and there isn't. So now we are already drawing our background, but this is only one thing I want from this because what I really want from this background is the position where my surface is supposed to be placed. So ideally what I would like to do is to take this background rectangle and somehow get it inside of my weapon overlay and then place my surface of the weapon inside of that rectangle. And that I can just get by returning the BG rect at the end of this method. So now in this other method, I can get, let's just keep calling it BG rect and I can get rid of the comment, I suppose. So now we have our BG rectangle available in our weapon overlay and I can minimize selection box. We don't need it anymore. And now essentially what I want to do, I want to get myself dot display surface and blit and I want to get a weapon surface and a weapon rect. The weapon surface I'm going to get from settings and in my weapon data, it's this graphic here. And my weapon rectangle is going to be just a rectangle and the center of this rectangle is going to be in the center of this BG rectangle. And that's why our weapon is inside of our background. I hope that makes sense. So we have to figure out two things. First of all, we need the weapon surface. And for that, we have to look at our settings. And in here, we want essentially get this information. Although right now, this is slightly difficult to get because this is a dictionary and we only have an index. So instead, we have to convert this dictionary here into a more usable list. And that I want to do in the init method. So let me add a comment here and let's say convert weapon dictionary. And really all I want to do, I want to have self dot weapon weapon graphics as a list. And I also want to spell this correctly. And in this list, I want to have all of the surfaces of my weapons. So essentially what I want to do is for weapon in my settings, I want to get the weapon data. So in weapon data, and I don't really care about the keys. I only care about the values. So what I essentially get now is another dictionary. And inside of this dictionary, I only really care about graphic. So let's save this one in path. And we get this one in weapon and graphic. I think graphic or graphics, just graphic. And now what I can do is get my weapon and just pygame.image.load. 
and I need my path. And as always, I need my convert alpha. And once I have that, I just want to add this weapon to my weapon graphics. So append and my weapon. So now I have all of my weapons in an accessible list. And what I can do with that, in this weapon surface down here, in my weapon overlay, I can just get self dot weapon graphics and pick the one with the weapon index. And that is literally all I needed. Now I have the graphic and now I can get my rectangle. And this is just going to be my weapon surface dot get underscore rect. And I want to place the center at the center of my BG rect. So dot center. And now we should be having a weapon. Let's try. And there we go. We can indeed see a weapon. And now if I press Q, we also get different weapons depending on, well, what we have selected. So this is working very, very well. Attacking also still works with the same result. Nice. Now there's one more change I would like to make. And that is when we change the weapon, I want the frame of this box to be highlighted in yellow so we get some indication of what we are doing. And that's just adding some visual niceties to it. It really isn't anything major. And all this really means in code is that this border color should have a different color while our player is switching the weapon. And we know when the player is switching the weapon because in my player, I have can switch weapon. And essentially, if this one is false, I want to have the border color of this one differently. And well, for that, we have to pass a couple of arguments through. So let's start with the selection box. That's the furthest one down. And in here, I want to add another argument and let's call this has switched. And now I can add an if statement that if has switched is true, then I want to do something. But if that is not the case, so else, then I want to keep on doing what we already have done by drawing this border color. However, if it is the case that we have switched, I can copy this and just draw this frame in a different color. And the different color we have, it's UI border color active. Although this one is just gold. I'm very lazy with colors. Okay, now we have border color active. Cool. So now we have to figure out how to get this has switched inside of our weapon overlay. So in here, our selection box also need has switched which we can't get right now because we only have the weapon index. So I need to give this one another parameter. And I guess we can keep on calling this as switched. And now finally, when we call this method, we're getting our weapon index and now we have to figure out an argument. And we know it's gonna come from the player, but now in my player, we have can switch weapon. But if I just pass it in here, actually, let's try this. But first of all, we have to comment this selection box out, otherwise we get an error. So now if I run this, we get the golden border by default. And if I switch my weapon, it disappears for a second. So we have to do the exact opposite. Because by default, this attribute here checks if we can switch the weapon. But what we want to check in here, if the player has switched the weapon is the exact opposite. And well, all we have to do is add a not before that, and now we should be good to go. So now we're checking the inverse of that variable. And now if I press this, we are getting the right selection. So this is working pretty good, nice. And I guess to get the magic in there as well, we actually have to give our player some magic abilities. And I guess let's work on that. And once we have the magic, we're going to finish the UI. And the magic is going to work kind of like the sword, at least in terms of data and the player. So we have a dictionary with lots of data. We give our player a timer and the ability to switch between different kinds of magic. And then once we are casting magic, we are doing something. Although that something is going to be slightly more complex than just spawning a sprite because our magic is going to be a bit more complex. So for now, we are going to skip this part and we are still going to just print that our player is doing something. 
The reason here is that to actually make the magic work, we need particle effects that we don't have yet and that are really, really important. Hence, we can't really do this, but we'll come back to this later. But for now, let's do at least the basic magic so we can finish the UI. And there really isn't anything new, so let's jump straight into the code. And here we are back in my main file, and I want to go to settings. I need another dictionary for my data. And this one is for my magic. And if I paste this, we essentially have two spells. We have flame and we have heal. And this dictionary works very similarly compared to the weapon data. And for the UI, the important one we care about is this file here, or this string to an image. And I guess for the player, we also have a strength and a cost, but really nothing particularly complicated. So now we have to figure out in my player how to use this. And I guess we need a couple more attributes. And let's put it right below weapon. It makes the most sense there. And first of all, I need a magic index that by default is going to be zero. And that is the same idea we had for self.weaponindex. So those two are going to be the same. As a matter of fact, we are going to copy quite a bit from here since our weapon and our magic, at least in terms of data, are very similar. So the next thing I want to do, actually I can copy this entire thing and paste it in here. So now I want to get myself.magic, so the magic I currently have selected. And for that, I want to get my magic data.keys and self.magic index. So this information essentially gives me either of these two strings, which is the key for this dictionary. Then besides that, we also want can switch magic to select it for the UI. And by default, this should also be true. And then we need self dot magic switch time. And this by default is going to be none. Essentially what we have done in these four lines here is the same we have done earlier for our weapon. So nothing new. Although there's one more thing that we do need. And for our weapon, we have self.create attack. And we are going to need the same thing for our magic. And I guess just to keep the symmetry, let's put it right at the top. So self dot, let's call it create magic. And this one is going to be create magic. And this create magic, we have to get from our parameters. So in here, create magic. Now in my level, let me minimize all of the methods. Besides create attack, I also want to define create magic. And this create magic is going to need a few more parameters. First of all, I want the style of magic I'm using. Then I want the strength of that style. And finally, I want to have the cost of that style. And in this method later on, we are going to have a system to select different kind of magic spells. But, well, that's quite a bit off for now. We're just going to print the style. We are going to print the strength. And we are going to print the cost. So at the very least, we can tell what's going on. And besides that, what we need is when we create the map and we create the player. Actually, let me add a bit of a few more lines here so we can actually tell what's going on with the player. Okay. This is much easier to read. So now, finally, I want to add create magic. And as always, make sure you're not calling this method. You're just passing it into the player. And all right, now in our player, we have the create magic method and we have all of the attributes we need. I hope I didn't forget any. So for the next step, let me actually minimize all of the methods for the player so it's a bit easier to see. Now, the next thing I want to do is in my input, right now we have one way to cast magic. And what we have done so far, we just printed magic. But now I want to self dot create magic. And for that create magic, I need my three arguments. I need my style, I need my strength, and I need my cost. And let's put those three in their separate lines so it's a bit easier to see. So we need a style, we need a strength, and we need a cost. And this is information we will get from this dictionary here. And we know which of these to target 
by using our in the init method by using this magic index. And I feel like this could be a pretty good exercise. So try to use the magic index that when we are pressing the magic button, we are calling this create magic in the proper way. All right, let's start with the easiest one, the style. And we first want to look at the magic underscore data. And what style is supposed to be is a string that either says flame or heal. So we need the keys of this dictionary. So magic data dot keys. And this I want to turn into a list with list so we can use indexing on it. And once we have that, all we really need is self dot magic index. And then we are good to go. That is actually all we needed. So next up, we want to do something fairly similar. So let me copy all of this. And now we want to figure out the strength. So let's look at a dictionary again. Now we actually want to look at one of the values for these dictionaries. And from this dictionary, we want to get the one that is called strength, that has the key strength rather. And that is actually kind of simple as well. So now instead of keys, we are looking at values. So this list here would be a list with all of our values. And if we pick one, we end up with one dictionary. Let's say this line here, if it was zero, would be giving us this dictionary. And once we have that, all we need is to pick one element from this dictionary. And I want the key strength is what I called it, I think. Yes, strength. And now for the cost, all we have to do is copy this thing. And now instead of strength, we are looking at cost. And I guess just to check if this is even working, let's try this in our game. So let's run my game and let's press control and we get flame five and 20. So this is actually working. Nice. Although there's one change I would like to make that right now my strength is just from the settings, this strength here. But essentially what I want to do is to give my player also a magic ability. Actually, my player already has that, this magic here. That's basically the inbuilt magic power of the player. And we're going to add this to the magic damage. So for the strength, I want to get the strength of the spell plus myself dot stats. And I call this one magic, I think. Yeah, magic. So this self dot stats magic here. So that way we can level up our spells and we make them stronger. So let's try this again. And now we get five plus four is nine. So this is working really well. So with that, we can call our magic. And next up, we have to be able to switch between different kinds of magic. And that's going to look very similar compared to this weapon switching mechanic. So I suppose what we can do is just copy the entire thing and then let's work from there. First of all, on the first line, instead of Q, I want to look at E. And then can switch weapon should be can switch magic. Now on the next line, can switch weapon is false, should be can switch magic. And for the time, it should not be weapon switch time, it should be magic switch time. Then next up, we don't want our weapon index in any of these. So this should be magic. And then the list we are looking at shouldn't be weapon. It should be magic. But everything else is still the same. This weapon should also be magic. And then finally, self.magic should be our list with not weapon data or the weapon index. It should instead be our magic index. And now this should technically be working. So let's try this in the game. So now I press control, we get flame nine and 20. Now if I press E, now we get heal 24 and 10. And if I press E again, we should go back to flame. And we are not, it sticks to heal. So let's have a look. 
here we have our entire if statement. And I think I just figured out what the problem is. That for our weapon, we have a timer that reactivates the weapon. Whereas for the magic, we don't have a timer. So once can switch magic goes to false, it never turns on again. We can actually test this. So at the end of this if statement, I want to print magic. And now if I call this, we get flame. If I press E, we get magic. But if I press E again, I don't see anything. So we only ever update or we only ever call this one here once. And the reason we can only call it once is because further down in our cooldowns, there's no cooldown for the magic. But we can create one quite easily by just copying the weapon switch mechanic. So if can switch magic, I want to get my current time, then my magic switch time is what I called it. And if that is greater than my switch duration cooldown, that's the one that can stay constant. Or well, the one that doesn't change between the weapon and the magic. And if that is the case, my can switch magic should be true. So now we have the cooldown. Now let's try this again. So I get my flame 9 and 20. I press E. We get heal. I press E again. Now we're back to flame. And I can keep on pressing this. It always works. Nice. And with that, we have our basic magic. Obviously, it doesn't do anything right now, but that will come later. I guess what we can do now is work on the UI to display the magic. And this is going to work in essentially the same way that we have done for the weapon overlay. So let's actually implement it straight away. Although if you want to do this as an exercise, I would recommend you to try this out. In my case, let's call this one magic overlay. And here we need self, we need the magic index, and we again need has switched. And if that is the case, actually let me copy all of this again, since it's going to look fairly similar. So magic overlay. My B direct is now going to have these two numbers. So these two numbers. And I actually also want to call self dot magic overlay with my player dot magic index and then not player can switch magic i believe i called it so those two methods are basically identical except we're using different data and the bg direct still works but now we need a magic surface and a magic rectangle. And for the magic surface, we need our magic graphics and our magic index. Oh, and I just realized we don't have our magic graphics yet. Um, let me cover this one in just a second. First of all, for magic rectangle, I want to get my magic surface and the rest can stay the same. And now I want to replace weapon with magic. Okay, we are nearly done. The one thing I did forget is that in the init method, we also have to get the convert magic dictionary. So kind of the same thing we have done for the weapons, that we create a list with all of the surfaces. And I want to do pretty much the same. So self.magicgraphics. By default, it's an empty list. And now for magic in magic underscore data dot values. I guess for this one, we can go straight to the magic surface. And I want to get pygame dot image dot load. And the path is going to be magic and graphic. And as always for this one, we also need convert alpha. And then self dot magic graphics dot append magic. I guess if you were to do all of this by yourself, I would recommend to combine these two imports into one function so you can reuse them. It's a bit more elegant. And I guess you could also combine these two 
functions here in a bit more detail. But I guess there are so few lines in my case, I don't really mind that much. But all right, now we have our import graphics and this magic overlay also works. And I think we're done. Let's try. So I can see my magic and I can see my weapon. If I change my weapon, it still works. If I change my magic, it also works. Cool. So now I can change between my different magic and weapons. And we can still use them in the game as well. So this is working really well. So with that, we have the UI all covered. Next up, I guess we can actually start adding some enemies to make the game a bit more interactive. And the enemies have to be able to do quite a bit because they are nearly as complex as the player. So there are a couple of things that we have to implement here. And there's one more thing I would also like to cover, that since our player and our monsters are fairly similar, they can share a couple of methods with each other. In my case, the methods they do share is the move and the collision method. They essentially move in the same way. The only difference is that our player gets the direction from the input, whereas the enemies get the direction from what the player is doing. So if the player is very close to them, they're moving towards the player, and if the player is further away, they don't move at all. But once we do have a direction, they are basically going to work in the same way. So what we have to do for now? First of all, we have to import a bunch of data for the enemies to actually display the very basics of them. Then we have to split some methods from our player and create a new class called Entity. And then both our player and our enemies are going to inherit from that class. And once we have all of that, we can actually start implementing some enemy functionality. So I guess let's jump straight into the code and let's have a look at this. So here I'm back in my code. And first of all, I need some data. And all of that is in the settings. And in here, I want to add yet another section that I called enemy. And in there, I want to import another dictionary that looks like this. So in here, we have our enemies. For example, we have, let's say, the raccoon. We have a health, experience, damage, their attack type, and their attack sound. And then at the end, we get quite a few more, like speed, resistance, attack radius, and notice radius. And all of these things are going to determine how they are going to operate. But that is literally it. Besides that, the classes are going to be identical. And I guess really quick to go through what each of these pairs do. Um, health should be fairly obvious. It's how healthy they are. Experience is how much experience they give. And damage is, well, how much damage they do to the player. Attack type is purely for the particle effects. So when the enemy is attacking the player, this is going to be what will be displayed on the window. Then besides that, at the end, speed should be fairly obvious. Resistance basically means if the player is hitting the enemies. So let's say this is our player and this is our enemy. And if the player hits the enemy, then our enemy is supposed to go a little bit backwards. And the distance by how much the enemy is being pushed back, that's the resistance. Then we have attack radius and notice radius. And essentially what they mean. Let's say that this here is our enemy. And the enemy has two radiuses. The first one is the attack radius. And let's say this one is going to look something like this. It is literally a radius around the enemy. And if the player is inside of this radius, let's say right now our player is here. If that is the case, then the enemy is supposed to attack the player. And that is the attack radius. And you see, it's 80 and 120, or very small numbers. They basically mean if the enemy and the player are very close to each other, then the enemy should attack. Now, besides that, we have our notice radius. And the notice radius is substantially larger. It essentially is something like this. Let me draw it out. And if our player is inside of this radius, then the enemy should only move towards it, but it should not attack. So that way, once our enemy is close enough to the player, it starts moving towards the player. And then once the enemy is close enough to the player, so the player is inside of the attack radius, then the enemy is going to attack. 
And if the player is outside of that, so here, then the enemy isn't going to do anything. So I hope that makes sense. And all right, with that, we have the data for our enemy. They do get fairly substantial. Now, next up in my player, let me minimize all the different methods. So it's a bit easier to see. Now, right now, the move and the collision method, we want to reuse for the enemies as well. So what we could do is make the enemies inherit from the player, but that feels kind of weird. So instead, I'm going to take these two methods out and put them in a separate class. And let me, for that, create a new file. And let's call this one entity.py. And in here, we have to import pygame. And then I want to create a class that I called entity. It has to inherit from pygame.sprite.sprite. And once we have that, I want to give this thing a dunder init method. It needs self and groups. And then in the super.init method, we're going to pass in the groups. Now, once we have that, we can, from the player, get this move and this collision method. So let me just copy them, paste them in here. And now our entity has these two methods. So what we can do now in the player, I can literally just delete both of these methods. And now the player isn't supposed to inherit from Sprite anymore. Instead, we want to inherit from entity. And for that to work, we have to from entity import entity. And now technically nothing should change. And this is still looking very good. Cool. We can still do all the stuff. Yep, that looks very good. This is then what we can use for the enemies as well. It's going to make our life a bit easier. And on top of that, we can actually add a few more things in here. So we could, for example, add the self.frame index with a start of zero self.animation speed could also be in here, so 0 0.15, and self.direction is going to be pygame.math.vector2. These basic attributes are going to be shared across our player and our enemies anyway. So having them in here seems to make a bit more sense. So now in my player, I can get rid of frame index and animation speed and from direction. And just to make sure things are still working, let's try. And seems to be all good and working. So with that, we have a basic setup for our enemies. And with that, we can start creating the actual enemy class. But first of all, let me clean this up a bit. So we don't need our UI anymore, and we also don't need the weapons. And if I close them, we have a bit more space. And now let me create a new file. And I'm going to save this one as enemy.py. And in here, as always, we have to import py game. Then from settings, import everything. And don't forget from entity, import entity. And now we can create our class enemy. And this one is supposed to inherit from entity. And that way we already have all of this available, so we don't have to rewrite it. But we are still going to need an init method. Need self first of all. Then I do want a couple of different things. First of all, I want something like a monster name. And this monster name is going to be used in a bit to pick either squid, raccoon, spirit, or bamboo. So we get different monsters. Then besides that, I also need a position, so I know where to place it at the beginning of the game. And don't forget, we also need the groups. Now, besides that, let's start with a general setup. And in here, the first thing we always need is the super done the ended method. And in here, we have to pass in our groups. And there's one more thing that I would like to add. That is self.sprite underscore type. And in this case, it's just going to be enemy. And this sprite type, let me open my tile again. It was in here. 
So this is our tile class for all the inanimate objects. This one also has a sprite type. Although this one is a tiny bit more flexible because we have different types of tiles. But for our enemy, we are always going to have our enemy. And the reason here is that these are supposed to react differently. That if our player attacks an enemy, for example, then we want to reduce the health or kill the enemy if the health goes below zero. However, if our player attacks a tile that is a grass, for example, then we want to destroy the grass immediately. The grass doesn't even have any kind of health. And then if we have something like a tree or a statue, they are not supposed to react to the player whatsoever. And for that reason, we need different kinds of sprites. And I guess you could organize this with different groups as well, but I feel like using this system is a little bit more straightforward. But there are different solutions to this. But all right, now we have our sprite type. Now, next up, we have to work on the graphics setup. And I guess for now, let's just place the enemies on the map and then improve them continuously. So what I want to do for now is create a self.image and a self.rect. And that way we can just place them on the map and then improve on them. And for now, for the image, I just want pygame.surface. Let's say 64 and 64. We're going to change that anyway. And self.image, image.get, rect, and the top left should be the position. And with that, we have our enemies. Now, if you remember all the way back in our level, we made this thing here. And we are still going to use it to place the enemies. And for that, we first have to import the CSV file, which fortunately is very easy. So in here, I want to create my entities. And this is going to be both my enemies and my player. And we again want import CSV layout. And in there, we have one more string that we didn't import so far. And let me just copy it in here. It looks like this. It's in the same folder as all of the other CSV files. We just didn't import it earlier because we didn't need it, but we always had it. And all right, so now this for loop is going to get another CSV layout. So what we can do is add another if statement in here. So if the style is equal to entities. And there are a few different kinds of enemies we have to be aware of. So this if statement will get more complex. But for now, we only really have two different kinds of tiles. We either have the player, that one's actually right here, and then we have our basic enemy class that for now is just a black image. And how this is going to work is if the column is a certain number. For example, the player in this list is number 394. And if that is the case, I want to create my player in that if statement. And let me just indent things properly so it's a bit easier to see. Uh, this player also works, yes. Okay, now I think you might be confused, where do we get this 394 from? And the best way to see this is if I just open tiled, you're gonna see it in a second. Alrighty, here we are in tiled, and this is our entire map, and we got this map from this tile set here. And let me open the tile set by itself. And here we have the tile map. And if I just click on the random tile, let's say this one here, let me add an arrow to make this a bit more visible. So this tile here has an ID of 252. And if we export this tile set, that is the number we get. And now if we click, for example, on the player, it says 394 exactly the number I used to import the player. And if you clicked on different kinds of enemies, we get 390, 91, 92, and 93. So basically where this number comes from is on this tile set, tiled orders each tile from zero all the way to the end. So we have zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. So if you ever have to double check the numbers, that's where they are coming from. So now, we are importing our player. And later on, we are going to have more if statements with the different numbers for the enemies as well. 
But now we can also update the position of our player. It should not be this random position I gave it. It should instead be X and Y. And those are the numbers we created ages ago all the way up here. So we're just reusing those. And I guess for now, let's just see if this is working in the first place. And there we go. Now our player is starting in a slightly different position. But besides that, nothing has changed. But at the very least, we know it is working. So now back in my level, I can for now just add an else statement. And what I want to create in here is an enemy. Although for that to work, I have to import the enemy class. So from enemy, import enemy. And now we can use it in here. And I guess let me copy the parameters and paste them in here. So it's a bit easier to work with. Now for the monster name, let's say for now we can just say monster, it doesn't really matter. For the position, we keep on using X and Y. And for the groups, let me copy it from the player. So we definitely want the enemies to be in the visible sprites. But besides that, since the player isn't supposed to be able to collide with the enemies, that's all we need for now. So now we technically should be having all we need to create some basic sprites. And there we go. This is actually working. Well, I guess kind of. At the very least, we can see where the enemies are supposed to be. So that's at the very least a start. So I guess now we can just flesh out our enemy class and add more and more to this to make it actually work. And I guess the first thing we can start with is the graphics setup. So we can actually see what's going on. And to get our graphics, I want to import something. And this I would like to keep in its own method. So let's call this import graphics. And since we have different kinds of data, so in my settings, I, for example, want to import all the data for this squid. For that, I will need the monster name. And this I'm going to add in the import graphics. So in here, we are going to add monster name. And I guess let's create that one. So import graphics self, and let's just call it name. And this import graphic is going to be kind of similar compared to what we have done for the player. So if I go back in here, we have import player assets. We had a character path, and then we had different kinds of animation states in a dictionary. And I want to do something similar for the enemies. So the first thing I want to do, let's call it self.animations. And this is going to be a dictionary with only three different value pairs. We have idle, then we have move, and finally we have attack. And these three states correspond to what the enemy is supposed to do. So if the player is really far away, it's supposed to idle. If the player is kind of close, it's supposed to move and then move towards the player and play the move animation. And then if it's close enough, it's supposed to attack. And if you look at the folders, there is a folder for each enemy that corresponds to this name. So for example, the squid has one folder for idle, one for move, and one for attack. And this is going to work exactly like we have done for the player. So what we can do, we can create a main path. And this is going to be an F string. And in here, I want to go up a folder. I want to go to graphics. Then I want to go to monsters, I called it. And now we want to go to the specific subfolder for our enemy. And this is going to be the name. And now don't forget, we want to go into different subfolders. So we need one more forward slash. So this path is going to lead us to each individual enemy. And let's call it main path. And now all I have to do is for animation in self.animations.keys. And in here, self.animation. And animation. Sorry, this should be animations. So essentially, we want to get this dictionary and go for every single key of this dictionary. So right now, we want to get the idle. And for this idle, 
I want to import a couple of graphics. And for this, I need again my import folder function. So from support, import, let's just say star. So now I want my import folder, the one we created earlier. And then here, I just want to create my main path plus the animation. So just to explain what's happening here, this main path is what we have created up here. And then the animation is what we get from the for loop. And this for loop could, for example, be idle, move, or attack. And we are just combining them. And that way we get a whole path to a specific folder. And then we're using the import folder function to import every single image inside of that folder and turn it into a surface. And that way we can use them in our dictionary. So with that, we have our import graphics. Now, next up in my init method, I want to set self.status. And for now, this is going to be idle. But later on, we are going to work with this to make a change depending on how far away the player is. So this could be any value inside of this dictionary. Could be idle, move, or attack. And depending on the status, the enemy is then going to do different actions. So now we have a dictionary and we have a status. Pretty much the same thing we had for the player. And with that, we can actually start setting the image. And I think this could be a good exercise to see if you're still paying attention. The video is getting quite long. So try to use the imported graphics, so self.animations, and the status to pick out one image for each monster. I want, first of all, to get my self.animations. So I want to get this dictionary here. And from the dictionary, I want to pick one of the animations, depending on what my status is. And right now, my status is idle. So I want self.status, I guess could be anything. But right now, it is idle. So this would give me a list. But image wants a surface. So from this, I have to get self.frame index. And you might be asking yourself, where do we get this frame index from? Do we have to create it in this class? And the answer actually is no, because in our entity, we have the frame index. And this frame index already works in the player. So in this player, we have no frame index, but the animations still work just fine, somewhere down here. So frame index comes from the entity, and we don't have to declare it. So we don't have to worry about it. But there is one thing we do have to worry about, and that is the different kind of monsters. So in my level, we always call it a monster, but that wouldn't be accurate because in my settings, I have squid, raccoon, spirit, and bamboo. And for now, let's just use this squid. Those I think look the best. And now this would actually work with the import. And now let's try this. And there we go. We can see some enemies. They don't do anything right now and they're all the same, but at the very least, it is working. Also, we can't detect them, but that comes later. So for now, we have some enemies. Now, obviously, we have different kinds of enemies, and that's something we have to work on now. And essentially, what I want to do, I want to create a monster name variable. And now, I want to create some if statements to check what kind of name we are going to get. And this could, for example, look like if the column is going to be 390, then my monster name is supposed to be bamboo. Then elif, if my column name is equal to 391, then my monster name is supposed to be spirit. That's not how you spell that. Spirit. Now, next up, if that is not the case and my column is 392, I am really bad at typing today. If that is the case, my monster name should be raccoon. And if neither of these is the case, so else 
then my monster name should be squid. And let me indent them all properly. Python tends to be a bit annoying if you use if statements on the same line. Oh well, sublime is a bit weird. But with these couple of lines, we now select the right kind of monster for the specific monster name. And now let's try this again. And we are getting an error that we have list index out of range. And the error here, let me close it all, is simply that when Python looks at this file here, for the raccoon, I misspelled it. It should be spelled with a double C. And because of that misspelling, when we imported the folder, Python couldn't find it and tried to loop over it. And well, that didn't work. But now let's try this. And now we can see different enemies. So in here, all of this is working really nicely. So this is then giving us a ton of different kinds of enemies that we would like to have. And I guess there's one small downside here. Let me actually open it again. So our enemies have very different sizes. These bamboo ones are 64 by 64, same for the squid, and same for these little flames. But the big raccoons are quite a bit larger. And you could give the larger ones an offset, but in my case, I'm not going to worry because they're basically in the right spot. But that's something you could work on, but it doesn't really matter that much. All right, now we can place our different kinds of enemies and we can actually see them in the game. I guess now we can start working on their movement. And let me add a separate section to it and let's call it movement. And then here we already have the rectangle. And besides that, I also want to give them self.hitbox. And this is going to be self.rect.inflate. And let's go with 0 and negative 10. And this hitbox we are definitely going to need because in our entity, we are moving the hitbox, not the rectangle. So our enemies are going to need a hitbox. And besides that, we are also going to need self.obstacle sprites. And that's just going to be obstacle sprites. And again, this is going to work just like we have done for the player. So in our entity, we are looking through self.obstacle sprites. So our enemy has to have this attribute as well. And well, this one we are going to get from the parameters. So this is obstacle sprites and then on our level or the argument just like the player we need obstacle sprites and that's why our enemies also get collision mechanics with the rest of the level it would look very silly if they didn't have that so now they have the ability to move but they well don't move at all right now so that's something we do have to work on and to make them work, we first of all need an update method. And this one needs self and nothing else. It's the usual sprite update method. And then here, I want to add self.move. And now this move method will need some kind of speed. And I want to pass in self.speed in here. And to get that kind of speed in the init method, I want to give the enemy some stats. And actually, while we're here, we can add a couple of different stats. And let me just copy them. It is quite a few. So this is going to look like this. So we get the monster name, and that's just going to be the monster name. Then we get some monster info, and that is then going to give us the health, the experience, the speed, the attack damage, resistance, attack radius, notice radius, and attack type. So all of this is basically this dictionary here, just now converted into attributes. And that way we can use them significantly easier. And in here, we have our speed. So now they could be moving. And although if I run the game, they are not going to move for the simple reason that they don't have any kind of direction. Oh, well, they do have a direction, but each of their direction is zero and zero. So I guess you could say they're all moving, except they're moving in the same place. So, well, kind of pointless. And that means we have to give them another method to check where the player is. And this is done in another method that I called getStatus. 
and this one needs self, and we have to know where our player is. And all we really want to do in here is we want to get the distance to the player. So in here, let's just add a question mark for now, because this one gets a bit more complex. But let's just imagine for now that we have the distance. All I really want to do is if the distance is smaller or equal than our self.attack radius, then I want to set self.status to attack. Then L if, if my distance is smaller or equal to self.notice radius, then self.status to move. And if neither of these is the case, then self.status should just be idle. So really all we're doing in here is here we have our enemy. So this is our enemy. Then we have one radius around it and we have a larger radius around it. And if our player is inside of the yellow circle, then we want to attack. And if the enemy is inside of the blue circle, then the enemy is supposed to move towards the player. And if the player is outside of that, then the enemy is just supposed to idle and not do anything. And that's really all we need. We have to make some more refinements in here later on, but for now, this is good to go. So now we have to figure out what's the distance to the player. And in here, I want to create an extra method because we essentially need two bits of information. And let me actually draw them. Actually, let me just redo the entire circle I've just done. And let's say our player is here right now. And I want the enemy to move towards the player. Now for that to happen, I need two bits of information. First of all, I need the distance. So how far the player is from the enemy. But to move the enemy towards the player, I will also need the direction. So I need to know what angle this arrow is going to be so that I can move the enemy in this direction. But once I have this direction, I can just move it with my speed and then use the move method and then my enemy would be moving. Basically, what all of this means, I want to create a method, let's call it define, that is going to get player distance and direction. And this one needs self and the player again. And what this method at the end of the day is really all supposed to do is to return a distance and a direction, direction. So now we have to get both of these things. And this might be a good exercise to check your vector math. So try to figure out the distance and the direction between the player and the enemy. Although don't worry if you can't do it yourself. All right, let's do some vector math. First of all, I want to get some vectors. Let's call it my enemy vector and my player vector. And essentially all that means is I want to use pygame.math.vector2 and pass in self.rect.center. So that way we are converting the center of our enemy into a vector. And that makes it much easier to work with. And I want to do the same thing for my player. So pygame.math.vector2 and then player.rect.center. So now I have two vectors and that's going to make my math significantly easier. And that's already bringing us to the first variable we want to get, the distance. And really all we want to get is the distance between these two vectors. And the first thing we have to do for that is get our player vector and subtract the enemy vector from that. So this is going to give us another vector that shows us the relation between these two vectors. But importantly, this is not a distance right now. It's just another vector. And let me illustrate this. This can be a bit confusing. So right now, this is our entire game window. And let's say our player is here and our enemy is here. And each of those have their own separate vector. And remember, a vector is essentially an arrow. So the vector looks like this for the player and like this for the enemy. 
So we're going in the x and the y direction to get to our player or our enemy. And when we subtract these two vectors from each other, we are getting this vector here. And let's say just for some numbers, this could potentially be something like for the x, it's going to be positive. So x could be, let's say, 100. And for y, uh, possibly a bit less, let's say 80. So this would be the vector that shows us the distance between our player and our enemy. Oh, well, not the distance, just the arrow to get from the player to the enemy. But importantly, this is not a distance. We couldn't really use this by default to understand how far away the enemy is. But this we can change quite easily. All we need is dot magnitude. And this is converting a vector into a distance. And this we can actually use. So with that, we already have our distance. And I guess with that, we can also work on the direction. And this one isn't all that much more difficult. It's actually very similar. So we again want to get my player vector and subtract my enemy vector from that. So again, now we have our vector. Uh, let me actually again bring it up again. So now we have this vector. But the problem we have now is let's say we have this vector and we want to multiply it with the speed, let's just call it s, to move our enemy towards the player. The issue we have now is that this vector is going to be way too large. So if you just multiply it with s being 5, then this arrow here wouldn't go towards the player. It would go all the way to something like this. So our enemy would just move way past our player, since the original vector is way too large. So essentially what that means is we want to reduce the length of this vector to 1. So we keep the direction, but we reduce the length of this thing to make it exactly with a length of 1. And that way we can multiply it with the speed and have a proper movement. And what that basically means is we have to normalize it. And that way we will get a proper direction that we can actually use. Fortunately, that is a very easy thing to do. Because all we have to do is pass in normalize afterwards and we are basically good to go. Although we do have to be careful. And this is something we have seen with the entity earlier. So in the move here, we had to first check that the magnitude of our vector isn't zero and only then could we normalize because you cannot normalize a vector that has a length of zero. So essentially we have to check if the length of this vector is greater than zero and only then can we normalize it. Now, fortunately, we already know how long this vector is going to be. It's just our distance. So we can use the distance in an if statement and just check if this is greater than zero. And only if that is the case, we want to get this vector. And this distance could actually be zero if our player and our enemy are in exactly the same spot. Remember, there's no collision between the enemies and the player. And I guess what we can also do is if that actually happens. So if my player and our enemy are on the exact same position, we know in that case, the direction could just be pygame.math.vector2 with zero and zero. So if our enemy is right on top of the player, we can just give it a vector of zero and zero and not move it at all. And well, with that, we have our proper function that gives us a distance and a direction. So now let me copy it. We can paste it in here, make sure to call it and pass in the player. And right now we only really care about the first one. So we only care about this distance here. For now, we don't care about the direction. That will come very soon though. But now we have another problem that I want to get myself dot get status. But now I have to get my player in this update method. Unfortunately, this update method is going to run for every single, where do I have it? Every single visible sprite. And passing in an extra argument to all of these seems kind of inefficient, since only the enemy is going to need the player in the update method. So instead, here's what I'm going to do. Let me minimize all the methods in my level. 
And in my YSort camera group, I'm going to give this another method. And I've called this one enemy update. And only in here we get self and we get the player. And essentially what I want to do in here, I first of all want to get all of my enemy sprites. And this we're going to get in just a second. And then for enemy in enemy sprites, I want to call sprite dot enemy update. And then in here, I can pass in the player. And then in my run method, besides the regular update, I want to call self dot visible sprites dot enemy update. And this one is going to get self dot player player. So that way we can separate the enemy with the update method. And I guess that means I want to copy or cut out all of this and give this enemy the enemy update method. That is going to work very similar compared to the update method, except now it's for the enemy only. And this one gets self and player. So now we have access to the player. So the last thing we have to figure out is how to actually get all of the enemy sprites. And essentially what I want to do is I want to get my sprite for sprite in self dot sprites. So this would give us literally all of our sprites. And I only want to select the ones with the enemies from that. So this is going to be an if statement. And here it becomes important that each of our tiles or each of our classes has a sprite type. So our enemy has a sprite type and our tile has a sprite type. And our player should have one as well. Not sure if I gave him one, but doesn't really matter. The player doesn't need one. So what I want to check if sprite dot sprite underscore type is equal to enemy because in my enemy, my sprite type is enemy. Now this can be a tiny bit dodgy because if a sprite doesn't have a sprite type attribute, we're going to get an error. So what I want to check first is another if statement that if has attribute. Now has attribute basically just checks first a class and then we can check for a specific kind of attribute, which in my case is sprite underscore type. So we are first checking if the sprite has a sprite type attribute in the first place. And once we have that, we are checking if that sprite type is going to be enemy. So that way it doesn't matter if the player has a sprite type or not, or if we just forgot it for some other tile. Or maybe if you want to add more tiles later on, this would basically save you. All right, so now we should be having a distance to the player. I guess, let me run the code. Nothing should happen yet. We get invalid syntax. Let's check it out. Ah, the problem here is this should not be an if statement. So we only need one if statement and then we can combine the different if statements. So now let's try this again. And now we have name sprite is not defined. Oh, and the reason here is I called this enemy. I didn't call it sprite. So next attempt. And we get now name in our enemy. Name get player distance direction is not defined. I think I know where this is coming from exactly here. This should be self. So now next attempt. And now things are working again. Although still nothing is happening. But at the very least, we are not getting an error. So what's happening now is we are getting the status, but we are not using that to move the enemy. But let's work on that now, then we can actually see what's going on. So I want to create another method and let's call this actions. And then here we need self and we again are going to need our player. And in here, I want to check my status. So if self.status is equal to attack, then I want to do a certain thing. For now, let's just print attack. Then I want an L if statement if my self dot status is equal to move, I believe I called it. 
let's double check yeah move so if this move is the case let's say we're going to work on this in a second let's call it pass for now and if neither of these is the case i well don't really want to do anything but let's just say self direction is going to be pygame.math.vector2 this line here is important if our player let me draw it actually so if this is our enemy and this is the circle that detects if the enemy is supposed to move towards the player if the player is inside of the circle then our enemy is going to move towards the player but i also want to make sure that if the player moves out of that circle then the enemy is supposed to stop moving so this is what this line essentially ensures that once the player is leaving the circle the direction of my enemy gets back to zero so it stops moving but all right the actually interesting one is this one here i want to make my enemy move towards the player once the player is getting closer and this is again going to be in self.direction and in here we need self dot get player distance direction it needs the player and now we care about the second element being returned so index one which is the direction so this is what we are getting now and now in my any update i can call self dot actions pass in the player and now let's try this so now we can actually see something moving so now the enemies are coming towards us if we are close enough only you can actually see if the enemy is overlapping we get attack in the bottom left so now we can actually do something so this section was probably one of the more difficult parts of this tutorial because there are lots of steps that need to be taken together so if you struggle to come along i would really recommend to double check each of these methods and see what they are doing there wasn't really any easier way of doing all of this but all right i guess now what we can work on is to animate the enemies and in here we basically want to do the same kind of animate we have done for the player let me just have a look actually let's minimize all of the methods here and i kind of want to do the same thing i've done for the player to animate the different kinds of states although for the enemy it's going to be a tiny bit different so we couldn't put this animate in the entity and also apply it to the enemy although it is arguably somewhat similar but let's go through it step by step so first of all I want to get my self dot frame index and add plus equal self dot animation speed so these two parameters we are getting from the entity they are all the way at the top and now I want to check if self dot frame index is greater or equal than the length of self dot animations and then my self dot status and if that is the case i want to set self dot frame index back to zero so this is pretty much the same thing we have done in these two lines except i guess the animation we have set for the player in a separate variable makes it a bit easier to read let's do it here as well so now length of our current animation so so far those two are pretty much identical and for now they will continue to be identical because now we can set self dot image is going to be my animation and i want to get my integer of self dot frame index and importantly here what we have done for the player as well we have to update the self dot rect so let me copy it actually and now we are setting our rectangle in the center of the hitbox because remember we are moving the hitbox we are not moving the rectangle so if we didn't add this we wouldn't display the enemy in the right position but now we can in the update method actually call self dot animate and let's try this now and we actually get animation and they don't really have a good attack animation i think this one has an attack animation yep there we go 
So now this thing has an attack animation. And I guess the proper attack animation comes with the raccoon. And there we go. This is working not badly. Although now we have a problem. And let me actually stand here. I want to make sure that my enemies have a proper attack animation. So for the raccoon, for example, it's supposed to play the entire thing and not be stuck in the attack loop, which I think looks a bit silly. So that is something we have to work on in our enemy. And I think it's a good idea to minimize all the methods in my enemy. It's getting a bit longer. And in my init method, I want to add another section. And let's call this one player interaction. And for now on here, I want to have one method that's called self.canAttack. And by default, this should be true. And then in my get status, I only want the enemy to be able to attack if the player is close enough and if self.canAttack is true. And now in my actions, once the player has actually attacked, I now want to restart the timer to make the enemy not attack anymore. But now we have a problem. So this entire graph is the entire length of our attack animation for the enemy. And for the sake of simplicity, let's say it has just a couple of frames. So we have 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And each of these is a frame for the different cycles of the attack. Now, if we set self.canAttack to false in here, then we would only get to the first step and then our attack would stop. So we would not actually see the attack. So what we want to do is we want to set self can attack only to faults after the animation has finished. And this is then going to happen in my animate, where did I put it? Down here, animate function. So what I want to do in here is if self.status is equal to attack. So right now we're checking if our current frame index is longer than the animation and if we are attacking. And only if those two are correct, then we can set self.canAttack back to false. And that way the player only stops being able to attack after the attack animation. So now we have a proper method here. So technically now the enemies should only be able to attack once. Let's try this with the raccoon. So there you could see our raccoon could attack once, but not again. So this is working reasonably well. So now what I want to do, I want to create a timer that the enemies can attack again after a certain period of time. And this I think could be a pretty good exercise. So check the previous cooldowns we have created and try to make a similar one for the attack animation of the enemies. All right, first of all, we need two more attributes. We need self dot, let's call it attack time. By default, it's going to be none. And we are going to need some kind of, let's call it attack cooldown. And in my case, I've set this one to 400. It's identical for all of the different enemies. Although this you could also put into this dictionary if you really wanted to. But mine is already getting quite long, so I didn't worry too much about it. Now, let me minimize all of those methods and let's put it down here. I want to create a timer for the attack cooldown. And in here, I first want to check if not self dot can attack, because we only want to check this timer if this one is wrong. And in here, we have to get our current time with pygame.time.get underscore ticks. That was atrocious spelling all around. This one should work now. And now if my current time minus myself dot attack time is greater or equal than myself dot attack cooldown. And if that is the case, self dot can attack should be set back to true. Now, the one thing I haven't done is to get my attack time. And this is going to happen 
in my, not in my animate, it's going to happen in my actions. So in here, besides print attack, I want to get self dot attack time. And this should be pygame, pygame dot time dot get underscore ticks. And now let's try this. And we get invalid syntax in the enemy. Ah, because for attack cooldown, I forgot the self. Now let's try it again. And there we go. So now we get attack. Okay, that's a bit hard to see. So the animation still doesn't seem to work perfectly. Let's see what went wrong. Ah, and I believe in my get status. In this line here, after we have just attacked. I want to check if self dot status is different from attack. And if that is the case, I want to set self dot frame index back to zero. So we essentially always want to be able to reset um, the animation once we switch to different animations. Maybe that helped. Nope, also didn't make a difference. So there's something else I missed. Sorry, the code is getting very long. It's a bit hard to plan this. Oh, and I think I've just realized the mistake that this attack cooldown we don't actually call. So self.attack cooldown. And while doing this, I realized we have one attribute called attack cooldown and the method is called the same. So let's just call it cooldown. Our enemy only has one anyway. So now let's try this again. So let's go to the raccoon. And this is looking much better. Cool, there we go. So now we have proper attack animations and once we add particles, this is going to look even better. But now we have the basic enemy logic. And I guess this was a really long section so let's finish this one for now. And for the next one, we are going to start with the interaction between the player and the enemies. So let's talk about that. And this has to go two ways. On the one side, our player has to be able to attack the enemies with the weapon or with magic. And on the other side, the enemies have to be able to attack the player as well. Now the logic for the enemies attacking the player is actually quite simple. We already made most of it. All we really have to check is if the enemy is close enough and then triggers an attack. And if that is the case, we can just call a function to reduce the player's health. Now the other way around is a bit more complicated because we have to check if the player weapon actually collides with an enemy. And here's how we are going to do that. We are going to create two more sprite groups. One is called attack sprites. The other is called attackable sprites. And whenever we create a weapon, we are going to put it into the attack sprites and magic is also going to go in there. And all of the enemies or anything that can be attacked will go into attackable sprites. And then in our level, we are going to check the collision between any sprite and attack sprites with the attackable sprites. And if there is any kind of collision, then we're going to check the tile type and trigger a certain thing. For example, if we have grass, we're going to destroy the grass. If we have an enemy, we are going to lower the health of the enemy. And that's pretty much the entire logic. There are a couple of visual things we are going to add, but let's implement the basic logic first. Here we are back in our main file and I want to go to level. And in here, we already have quite a few different methods and I want to go to my init method and add a bit more here. And I guess we can put this under attack sprites. It doesn't really matter where you put it. So here we have attack sprites, and this is just pygame.sprite.group. Then I can copy it and let's create another group that's called attackable sprites. So the basic logic is we are going to spawn our weapons and our logic inside of this group. All our enemies will be in this group. And then we can check the collisions between these two groups and check if we hit anything. But for that to work, we actually have to assign things to the different groups. So let's start with the enemies in create map. So in this section here, actually in this section here, 
we are creating all of our enemies. And right now, the enemies are just invisible sprites. But they should also be in self.attackable sprites. And I guess for this one, let me put the enemy on multiple lines so it's a bit easier to see what's going on. Because enemies will get a few more lines of code and I'd like to keep it a bit more readable. Now, next up, when we are creating an attack. So in this method here, we have our weapon. And right now, this one is also only in visible sprites and it should also be in self.attack sprites. So now we have, well, different kinds of sprites. And there's one thing I forgot because the grass is also supposed to be attackable. And that could be a good exercise. So try to figure out which group the grass should belong to. Should be really easy. So in my grass right now, I have self.visible sprites and self.obstacle sprites. And I want to add a third group that is self dot attackable sprites. Attackable sprites. There we go. And since grass is also getting quite large, let's put this on multiple lines so it's a bit easier to read. So now we have a couple more groups. Although if I run the game, nothing is going to change. But now in my level, let me minimize the create map function again. It's getting a bit large. I want to create another method and let's put it right at the end. And let's call this one player attack logic. And we need self and nothing else. And in here, we basically want to cycle through all of the attack sprites and then check if any of those are colliding with any of the attackable sprites. And be aware for now, we only ever have a single attack sprite, whatever our weapon is. But later on, once we have magic, there could be multiple sprites inside of that group. So just be aware of that. So first of all, let's use an if statement to check if anything is in attack sprites in the first place. Because if not, we don't have to bother anyway. Now, once there is something inside, we can check for attack sprite in self dot attack sprites. And now I want to use pygame.sprite.sprite collide. And in here, we need a sprite, we need a group, and then we need the do kill argument. And let's go through what this one means. And sprite is the easiest one. It's just going to be a sprite. Let's say it is this sprite here. Then we are going to check this sprite if it collides with any sprite inside of a group. So let's say we have our group here. And inside of this group, we have a bunch of sprites. Doesn't really matter how many you have, it's completely relevant. And this method basically goes through if this sprite is colliding with any of these sprites. And then the do kill argument determines if the yellow sprite is colliding with the purple sprite, are we going to destroy that sprite? And that's literally all that sprite collide does. So in my case, I don't want to kill any of the sprites. For the sprite, I want to check my attack sprite. And for the group I want to look at, it's going to be self.attackable sprites. And this then returns a list of all the sprites that have been colliding. So we can store it in, let's call it collision sprites. So what we can do now, once we have that, we can check if collision sprites exists. So if we have any kind of collision. And then once we have that, we can cycle through that list. And let's call it for target sprite in collision sprites. And now we finally have the sprite that have been colliding with our weapon. So what we can do now is check different kinds of things. But I guess for now, we can just check if this is working. So let's say target sprite dot kill. So we essentially destroy any kind of sprite we are attacking. And we have to make sure we're actually calling it. Let's call it right after the enemy update. So self dot player attack logic. And now let's run it. We don't get an error. It's a good start. And now I can attack the grass. It disappears. I can attack the enemies. They disappear. And this seems to be working quite well. Obviously not ideal so far, but at the very least, something is working. 
The problem now is we don't just want to destroy the target sprite, we want to do something else. And to figure out what we have to do, we have to figure out the sprite underscore type. So for example, for my grass, the sprite type would be grass. That's the one we set here. So this is basically then an if statement. So if the target sprite is equal to grass, then, well, if that is the case, we just want to destroy the grass anyway. So in here, we actually do want to get target sprite dot kill. And let's try this now. So I can attack the grass. This one still disappears. And if I attack the enemies, they also disappear. So something has gone wrong here. Let's check. Oh, and I realized that this argument here should be false because I do not want to destroy the sprite. So you have just seen that because this one was true, we are destroying any kind of sprite. So we basically never got across this line. So now it is false. Let's try it again now. So we can still destroy the grass, but now the enemies we can't destroy anymore. Now it's working. And right now, this destroying here looks kind of boring. But later on, once we add some particles, it does end up looking significantly better. But step by step. Now, besides that, if we're not attacking grass, I guess I can just add an else statement. Because we only really have one other thing we can attack, and that's the enemies. Although each of our enemies also has a sprite type, so you could be more specific if you really wanted to. But now we can again target our sprite type. And now I want to give them a method. And let's call it get damage. And for this one, I need a couple of arguments. So first of all, I want to know what the player is doing. And besides that, I also have to know with what attack we are hitting the enemy. So are we using a weapon or are we using magic? So I basically want to know the attack sprite dot sprite type. So this is the attack sprite we got from all the way up here that we are going to pass in there. And let me just make sure that our weapon actually has a sprite type. So we can reopen our weapon. And right now, this one doesn't have a sprite type. So we have to give it one. And let's do it right at the top. So self.sprite underscore type is going to be weapon. So now we can use it. And let me close it again so we don't have too much random stuff. And all right. Now in our enemy, we have to create this method. And I guess let me copy it so we can work on the parameters. So back in my enemy, let me minimize things. In here, I want to create, get damage, and we will need the player. And besides that, we are also going to need, let's just call it the attack type. And essentially what I want to do in here is if the attack type is equal to weapon, then I want to set self dot elf negative equal. And now I have to figure out by how much I should lower the health. And for that, I have to know what is the player's damage. And this I'm gonna get with another function. And from the player, I want to create a new method. Let's call it get full weapon damage. So this is basically a getter function. And let's copy this one. And now we can go to my player. In here, let's minimize things as well. And now we can add another method in here. Need self and nothing else. And in here, really all we want to do is we want to get our player base damage. We can get this from this dictionary here. So our base attack is going to be this one. And then besides that, we also want to get our current weapon. So the one we have basically up here. And we basically want to get these two together. And that is our full damage. So we're just adding those two numbers together. So in this function, let's first get the two different kinds of damage we have. So we have our base damage and we have our weapon damage. And all I essentially want to return is my base damage plus my weapon damage. So all I have to figure out is what these two numbers are going to be. 
And actually, let's do this as an exercise. So try to figure out from the player what is the full damage. So what is the base damage plus the weapon damage? For the base damage, we essentially want self.stats. And in there, we have what is called attack. We are essentially looking at this dictionary entry up here. And then besides that, I want to have my weapon damage. And for that, I first have to get my weapon data. So in settings, I am essentially accessing this data here. And I want to get one of those keys. Let's say right now my weapon is a sword. And then I want to get this key. And this is information I can get from self.weapon. What I can do here is weapon data and then self.weapon. And once we have that, I can just pick another entry because now we have this dictionary for the sword. And inside of this dictionary, we have damage. And well, all I have to do is add this to damage. Oh, and while we are here, I realized I forgot something because in our settings, we also have a weapon cooldown and I didn't include that one in our player cooldown. So in my player, in cooldowns, here we have the attack cooldowns. And this is my base cooldown. And towards this, I also want to add the weapon cooldown. So in here, we can basically do the same thing. So we still use our weapon data. Let's copy the entire thing. But except now, instead of damage, I want to add cooldown. And that is going to be this cooldown here. All right, but now we have our get full damage. So with that, we can return to our enemy. And now we have something. I guess later on, what we're also going to do is else. Let's add a pass in here, but this is going to be magic damage. It's going to work slightly differently. And right now, I guess this would work, but we would never be able to see it because, well, our enemies don't have anything to, well, react to. So I want to add another method again. And this is just going to be check def. Need self and nothing else. And all we're going to check in here is if self.health is smaller or equal to zero. And if that is the case, I just want to run self.kill. Although right now, this logic isn't going to work. But I guess let's just try the entire thing and see if things are working. So we can still destroy the grass. And enemy get damage doesn't work. So let's have a look. Should be here in my player attack logic. So we have self the player and the attack sprite. So this one seems to be working. So in our enemy, I'm pretty sure I know what I forgot. And what I forgot is self. So now let's try this again. Let's attack an enemy. And we can see that nothing has happened. And this happened because in my enemy, I'm not calling check def. So in my update method, we can run self.checkDev. You could also call it in the enemy update. It doesn't really matter. So now let's try this again. And there we go. Now we have something that may be a tiny bit weird, that all of our enemies die in one hit. So even the bigger ones, they just die immediately. And this happens even though they should be having quite a bit of health. So in my settings for the monster data, the raccoon, for example, has 300 health, but all of our damage is like 15 or maybe 30. And the problem here is that get damage runs on every cycle of our game. So we think we're hitting the enemy once, but Pygame just sees a collision. And it runs this get damage every time it has this collision, which in our case is 60 times a second. And that way we are essentially multiplying our damage by 60, which kills anything instantly. So it's not really fair. And essentially what we have to do is to create a timer that enemies can only be hit after a short amount of time. So essentially all that means is we have to create another timer. And let's put it all the way down here. So here we have, let's call it the invincibility timer. 
And let's add something like, let's call it vulnerable. By default, this is going to be true. Then we have self.hit time. By default, this is none. And let me spell it properly. And then self.invincibility duration. Let's say it's going to be 300. But again, this number you could also put into the settings to have different kind of enemy behavior. In my case, well, it wasn't really needed. So now we have the basis for another timer. But first of all, let's implement that our enemy can only be hit once in a while. And this is going to happen in my get damage. So in here, I want to check is if self.vulnerable. And only if that is the case, I want to run all of this. And by the end of it, once we have run everything else, I want to run self.vulnerable is going to be false. And I guess now let's try this. So now the enemies shouldn't disappear anymore. And they don't. Cool. So seems to be working. But obviously, we do want to be able to attack the enemies. So what we also have to get is self.hit time is going to be pygame.time.get underscore ticks. And with that, we have all we need to get another timer. And I guess this cooldown, let's call it cooldowns. And now in here, we can check if self.vulnerable, if that is the case, then we want to run this timer. And I guess I can run the current time outside of this function so we have it available everywhere. And then here, we just want to check if my current time minus self.hit time is greater or equal than my self.invincibility duration. And if that is the case, self vulnerable is going to be true. And I forgot this should be not self.vulnerable. And now let's try this. So I probably have to hit the enemy a couple of times, but it does disappear eventually. Let's look at this one. So I hit it once, I hit it twice. There we go, this looks pretty good. Okay, those ones are going to take longer, so I just assume it's going to work. But all right, so with that, we have the ability to damage our enemies. The problem right now is the enemies aren't really being pushed back. So our attack is, well, kind of pointless because the enemies can attack us right away anyway. So I want to get them some kind of hit reaction that they're being pushed backwards. And that is going to be another method. Let's call it hit reaction. And basically what I want to do in here, I just want to check if not self dot vulnerable. So if my enemy has just been hit, then I want to set my self dot direction and multiply it with my self dot resistance. And this number should be negative. So think of it like this. Right now, this is our enemy and this is our player. And our player has just attacked the enemy. Essentially, what I want to achieve is that my enemy is being pushed back in the same direction. And the distance by how much the enemy is being pushed back should come from the self dot resistance. And this self dot resistance we are getting from somewhere in the enemy. So I believe it is there resistance. But that's kind of all we are going to need. And this I just want to call in my update, let's call it right before move. So hit reaction. That way it's going to happen early on. But now I also have to make sure I actually get the right direction. So in my get damage, all the way at the top, I want to set my self dot direction. And in here, self dot get player distance direction. 
I want to pass in the player that I already have and then just get the value with number one. So this is the direction. And really all we're doing here is we are working with the direction of the enemy and just moving it in a different direction. So I guess let's try if this is working. So there we go, they're being pushed back. And this is making all of this feel much better. And let's use different weapons. This also works, cool. So now we have, well, a better get damage method. Although there's one more thing I would like to implement. And that is that my enemies are flickering once they are being hit. Actually, this should apply both to my enemy and my player. So essentially, I want some kind of indicator that they are being hit. And usually in games, this works by flickering. And to achieve that, I have to work with the visibility of both my player and my enemy. And that is something we can kind of put inside of the entity, although since our player and our enemy are animating slightly differently, we do have to put this in kind of different ways. But let me actually implement it. So in the enemy, for my animate, I want to add a bit more at the bottom to make them flicker once they are being hit. And essentially what that means is if self.vulnerable, and again, this should be not because we're checking once the enemy is being hit, then we want to essentially flicker. And if that is not the case, so else, then I just want to get my self.image and set the alpha to 255. So, when you set the alpha, you set the transparency of the layer and 255 is the full value. So all of this basically means if the enemy is not vulnerable anymore, this one, then we are setting the full alpha. But if that is not the case, I want to get a specific kind of alpha and this we are going to get from somewhere else. And this can either be a zero or 255. So invisibility or full visibility. And then self.image.set underscore alpha with the alpha. So now we just have to figure out a function that toggles between 0 and 255. And the same thing we are going to need for the player. So I'm going to create this in my entity. And let me minimize all the other stuff in here. We are not going to need it. So in here, let's call it a wave value, value. We need self and nothing else. And let me explain what we are going to do. And we are going to use a sine wave in here. And let me explain how it's going to work. So let's say this is going to be a graph. We have here our time and on the y-axis we have the well y-axis. And a sine wave kind of looks something like this except in better drawn. And we can check each point of this value in time. And pretty much what I want to do is if this curve is positive, so if we are here, we are going to return 255. And if we are below that curve, so we are down here, then we are going to return zero. That way we are switching between those two numbers. Actually, pretty simple. But first of all, for that to work, we need from math import sin. And now all I want to get is my value and I need to get my sign value. And in here, I have to pass in some kind of X, which in my case is going to be the time. And the time I get with pygame.time.get underscore ticks. And now if this value is greater or let's say equal to zero, then I want to return 255. And if that is not the case, I want to return zero. And let's add proper indentation and this should be return. And that's all we need for this method. I can go back to my enemy now and self.wave value. And no arguments are needed. And now this should actually be working. Let's try. So now, this is working beautifully, cool. Makes the game look significantly more responsive. Nice. 
Now, if you wanted to do the same thing with a white color instead of invisibility, you would probably want to work with a mask. But in my case, that's a bit of an overkill, but I have made a whole tutorial on how to use a mask. You could totally use that one as well. But all right, now I want to give my player the ability to flicker as well. So in my player, I want to minimize all the different methods again and look at my animate. And in here, I want to add flicker. Now, unfortunately, to actually implement this, we, well, we need to know if the player has been hit or not, which we don't know just yet. So let's first implement the enemies hitting the player, and then we can work on the flicker. And fortunately, this isn't all that difficult. The only real limitation is that we have to figure out how to get from our enemy back to the level. So we know when the enemy is attacking the player. That's going to happen in where are my actions. So we know in here we can print an attack if the enemy is attacking the player. That one is working perfectly fine. But the issue is from this place we can't really access the player. Actually we can. We have the player right here. So technically we could run something on the player from here. But I don't want to do that for the simple reason that later on, whenever the enemy is attacking, I also want to create some particle effects. And for that to work, I have to create this function in the level. So essentially what I'm going to create is create a couple of methods inside of my level. And one of them, for example, is going to be damage layer. This one will need self as always, then we need an amount and then we need an attack type. Amount should be fairly obvious. It's the amount of damage the enemy can deal. Attack type is going to be in settings. It's what we get from attack type. It's basically what kind of particle we are going to spawn once the enemy is attacking. But for now, we are not going to use it. So now in here, we want to write a function that can damage the player. But first of all, we need to deal with the same problems we have with our enemies. That we first want to check if self.player.vulnerable. So essentially, we want to create a timer after the player is hit, so we can't attack the player multiple times in one attack. But essentially, once we have that, we're going to implement that in just a second. We want to get self.player.health. And from that, reduce the amount. Then we want to set self.player.vulnerable to false. And in our player, we want to have self.player. Let's call it hurt time. And this is going to be pygame.time.get underscore ticks. And at the end, later on, we want to spawn particles, but we don't have that one just yet. Now this damage player, I want to create from the enemies. So in my create map, when I am creating the enemies, so all the stuff down here, I want to pass this one in there as well. So self dot damage player. And as always, don't call this function. And now in my enemy, we also have to put this into a parameter. Uh, spelling it correctly, there we go. So now in my, let's call it player interaction. I guess it fits best in there. So self dot damage player is going to be damage underscore player is what I called it. Oh, I wrote parameter. Well, never mind. Uh, damage player. That makes more sense. So now our enemy has the ability to damage the player. And now in my actions, instead of printing attack, I want to run self dot damage player. And in here, we have to figure out an amount and an attack type. And well, if you look at the init method, we have a ton of statistics in here. So the first one is self dot attack damage. We can just pick this one and paste it in the amount. And we can do the same thing with the attack type. It is all the way at the bottom, this one here. So attack type and actions, this one here. So 
So now our enemy is able to attack the player. And I guess let me minimize all of the methods. It really is getting a larger project. All right, so this should be working, at least hopefully. Now in my player, we just have to set up all the attributes for the timer. And let's add another section to this. And let's call it a damage timer. And in here, we have self.vulnerable, which is true by default. Then we have self. I believe I called it hit time. Or was it hurt time? It's hard to tell. I called it hurt time. There we go. So self. hurt time. And this by default is going to be none. And finally, we need something like self. invulnerability duration. And let's say this one could be 500. Seems like a decent value, but you can tinker with this. And all right, now in my not animate, but in cooldowns, I can add another timer. So in here, if not self dot vulnerable, then I want to run the timer. So if current time minus self dot hurt time is greater or equal than so self dot invulnerability duration. And once that timer is running, we want self dot vulnerable and set it back to true. So now, okay, well, now we can't really see it, but we should actually be able to see it in our health bar. So let's try it. And there you can actually see it in our health bar, it's going down. So obviously if it goes below zero, we should be dying, but in my case, that doesn't really matter so much. At the very least, we know it's working. So now in the player, not the level, the player, we can now start working on the flickering. And let's do this as an exercise. So try to figure out to make the player flicker once we get hit. Should be very similar compared to the enemy. Right, so if self.vulnerable is not the case, then I again want to get my alpha value and we want self.wave value, the thing we got from the entity, so this one here. And we want to get our self.image.set alpha and paste in the alpha in here. And if that is not the case, then self dot image dot set underscore alpha and set this to 255 so full visibility and that should be all we needed let's try this now and we indeed get hit and we can still attack the enemies and that is working really well now i guess the one downside is it's very easy for enemies to overlap but um well, not going to worry too much about that, but you can add a few more collision mechanics and improve on this. All right, so with that, we have pretty much all of our collision mechanics, at least in the most basic sense. So with that, let's start working on the particles. That's going to be another major section. Now, a particle effect sounds difficult in theory, but in practice, it really isn't that hard. We already kind of created the basics for it anyway. So essentially for my particle effects, it is just going to be another sprite that animates through a couple of different images. The only difference now is that this particle effect is going to disappear once we're running out of animation frames. So we're not looping the animation anymore, we're just playing it once. And then we are giving it a position and that's kind of all we need. Although there's one downside here that we have a lot of different images for all of the different animations. So I think in total, we have about 15 different animations and each animation individually has about five different frames. So we are looking at a lot of images overall. And what I want to do is to import all of these images when the game starts and then keep them in memory and only play them when they're needed in the game. And the massive downside to avoid here is that we are importing images every time we are creating a new particle effect, because that would be very slow. Importing images does take some time. Although I guess this is something that we can work on when we actually work on it. 
So let's go into the code and let's have a look at this. Here yeah, I'm back in my file and I can close a couple of things because we don't need them for now. So my entity and my tile, and I guess for now my enemy as well, I'm not going to need them. And I do want to create a new file and let's call this one particles.py. And in here, as always, I want to import pygame. And I already know that from support, I want to import my import folder. And now let's just create a dummy particle effect. And that's going to be a particle effect class. And this one is going to inherit from pygame.sprite.sprite. And in here, I want an init method as always. We need self, spelled properly. Then we need a position. And we want some animation frames. So this is what we are going to loop over. Where we are getting this from, you will see in a bit. And then finally, what groups we want to pass this into. And then we need super and dunder init as always with not self, but with the groups. And now in here, we need all the basics for an animation. So self.frame index is going to be zero. Then self.animation speed is going to be 0 0.15. Self.frames is going to be the animation frames. But now we can already set the first image. So self.image is going to be self.image.get underscore rect. And then here self.frame index. So essentially, this is going to be the basic setup for any kind of animation. And now that we have that, we can create an animate function, give it self and nothing else. And now self.frame index plus equals self.animation speed. And now here we come to the difference. So if self.frame is greater or equal than the length of my self dot frames, so we are going beyond the length of our animation, then we want to self.kill. But else self.image is going to be self.frames and we want an integer of self.frame index. So really all we are going to do in here is we are increasing frame index and if we are still inside of the list, we are just picking one image from this list. However, if we go beyond that list, then we are going to destroy that sprite. So this way, we are only running this animation once, and once the animation has finished, we are destroying the sprite. And now we also have to be able to call this particle effect with the update method, and then here, self.animate. Now we have a basic particle effect. The problem is we need to figure out where to get these animation frames. And now you might be tempted to just create another method like import particle images or something like that. But that would be a really bad idea for the simple reason that we have a lot of particles. And if Pygame always imports something when we destroy an enemy or some grass, the game is going to run very slowly. So I'm going to do something else. I'm going to create another class. And this I have called animation player. Doesn't need any inheritance. And in here, we are going to create an init method with self and also nothing else. And this one is going to get one long dictionary where we are importing every single thing. So this is going to look like this. A slightly longer dictionary that, well, um, imports all of the different material. So we have our flame, our aura, and our heal. So these are both played when the player heals. Then these are the different attack types. Then we have our monster deaths. And we have different leaves when we are destroying grass. Although in here, I have created one more method that is called reflect images. And this we also have to create in here. Uh, Let's make sure I am on the right line. Should be this one. Let me actually minimize this dictionary. It's getting very hard to read things. 
So all I want to do in here is reflect images. And we need self and frames. And let me demonstrate what this one is doing. Right now, for the leaves. So this is when we're destroying grass. We have six different animations. And pretty much what I'm doing here is I'm importing these animations twice. Once in the proper direction and then once reflected. So that way we are going to get a bit more variability in there. That's really all it is. And really all I'm going to do in here is for frame in frames, I'm going to create a flipped frame and this is going to be pygame.transform.flip and we want to flip the frame for true and false. Flip can reverse something either in the x or in the y axis. In my case, I only want to flip the x axis and ignore the y axis, which is why this one is true and false. And now I have a flipped image and I want to save this one in a new list. So let's call it new frames and that one's going to be an empty list. And now new frames dot append and I want to get the flip frame. And at the end of all of this, I want to return my new frames. And that is basically all we are going to need for now. And now back in my level we can start working with this particle effect. So in here, all the way at the top. Actually, let me minimize all of this stuff again. It is getting a bit confusing. So at the bottom here, I want another section and let's call this one particles. And I'm going to create my animation player with my animation. So the animation player we have created in here. And this animation player is basically going to be able to run a particle effect. I'm going to see in a second how that's going to work. But first of all, we have to import it. So from particles, import animation player. And to illustrate how that is going to work, let's create our grass particles. So in my player attack logic, I know when I have destroyed some grass. So in here, I want to add a bit more logic to spawn some particles. And basically what I want to do is run self.animationPlayer and do something like create grass particles. But for that to work, I am going to need two bits of information at the very least. I need a position and I need a group. So I can put these sprites into the visible sprite group but I'm also going to need a position. So let's first get the position. And the position we can get fairly easily. All I need is my target sprite dot rect dot center. So we are playing these particles right where the grass used to be. Now next up for the group, we just want self dot visible sprites. And let's put it in the list. So we do it in the same way we have done earlier. Pretty much all we have to do now is actually create this method here in my particle animation player. This is going to happen down here. Create grass particle, we need self, we need a position, and we need the groups. And in here, first of all, I want to get some animation frames. And the animation frames we are getting from self.frames. Because in here, we have our leaf, and I essentially want to pick a random animation from this list. And to pick a random animation, we need from random import choice. And now in here, I can just call choice and pick for myself dot frames. And in there, I have leaf. So leaf is essentially a tuple with a bunch of lists inside, and we are picking one of these lists. And now that we have that, we can actually create a particle effect. So particle effect, and then we need these parameters. Let me just copy them in here. So position, we already have. Animation frames, we get from animation frames. And then groups, we get from groups. So we didn't actually have to make any kind of change. And well, that should be it. Let's try. 
So we get an error with inconsistent use of space. Let's see where he's complaining. Ah, in there. And in return new frames. And from level, a couple of errors. So from particles in there. Not sure what happened with this one. That was very strange. Okay, there we go. And now you can actually see that this one it took quite a bit of time to load. And we get a key error. So let's check my particles. And, oh, I didn't mean left. I mean leave. Okay, now let's try this again. Now we get self. Where was that error? So in particles, we are getting self.image. Okay, it is getting a bit late. Let's try this again now. And now particle effect has another problem. Let's check it out. And self.image, this should be self.frames. Um, it may be getting a bit very late. Uh, let's check this out. Let's try again. Okay, and now for the particle, we are going to need a rectangle. And this we get with self.rect. It's going to be self dot rect dot get rect and then here i just want to place the center is going to where the position will be okay we are working through all the errors so now particle effect has the same error that shouldn't happen anymore self dot image okay i am going to take a break after this section okay now particle effect we are back here and this should be self dot frame index. So another attempt. There we go. Finally, now we have some particle effects that are going to spawn randomly. And this is looking much better. Now, there are a couple of things we have to work on. First of all, right now we are only spawning a single leaf, which is not great. So I want to create multiple. And essentially what I want to do for a leaf in range. And then here I'm going to use rand int, which I have not imported yet, I believe. From random we have choice, but we don't have rand int. I want to get a random number between, let's say, three and six. And then for each of those numbers, we are going to create another animation. And that way we get a bit more particles. Let's try this now. This already feels a bit better. So this is quite a nice effect. Cool. Although now I feel like in my level, this position doesn't feel like it's really appropriate. So I want to give this one a tiny bit of an offset. So I'm just going to add an offset. And this is going to be pygame.math.vector2 and here 0 and 75. So we're just lifting up the particle effect by a tiny bit. And this I'm just going to subtract from my position. And that just feels like it's looking better. And there we go. Might even be a bit too high, although this one feels pretty good. And okay, with that, we have some basic particle effects. And we are making some solid progress. Okay, let me close it. And now we can work on the other particles for the enemies. And fortunately, we already have in my level, let me minimize all of this again. We already have one method that's called damage player. And in here, we want to spawn some particles. So what I want to do in here is self.animationPlayer. And let's call this a bit more generic, generate particles. Although for this one, we need a few more arguments. So I want to know what the attack type is going to be. So which of these different attack types are we going for? So slash, claw, thunder, and leaf attack. Besides that, I need a position. And I will need the groups where they should be. And we can basically figure out all of these things right now. So attack type is pretty straightforward. This is the one we already get from the argument. Position is going to be self.player 
player.rect.center. And for the groups, I'm just going to go with the visible sprites. So now all we have to figure out is how to create this function here, or well, this method. So in my particle effect, I want to create my particles. We have a tag type, we want a position, and we want the groups. And let's do this one as an exercise. So now try to write this function that our animation player plays one particle once the enemy is attacking the player. All right, first of all, we need animation frames again. And we want to pick from self.frames. And in there, we have different kinds of attack as a key. So we can just pass in the attack type. Actually, I think since we are later going to use this create particles for something other than attacks, let's call this not attack type, but animation type. That makes a bit more sense. And now we have our animation frames. Now I can just call particle effect. We again need a position. We need the animation frames and we are going to need our groups. Back in my level, now I have all I need, I think. And let's try this. Actually, let's check, let's reopen my enemy and let's see if we are passing in the right information. So when we call in my, where is my actions? So in my actions, when we call damage player, we pass in attack damage and attack type. So attack type is what we need. I guess let's try it and let's see what we get. So again, we have problems with the indentation. I do not know what his problem is. Okay, let's try it now. And now if the enemies hit us, we get an error. So three position arguments, but four were given. So let's have a look. I think I already know the problem. I forgot self. Okay, now let's try this again. And now we get proper animations. And let's try different enemies. So we get this one and we get sparks. We get all of this. I may have spawned too many enemies. Uh, okay, but this is looking pretty good. Let's get to this squid as well. And this one, okay. Yep, you can definitely see it, but yeah, I pretty much spawned too many enemies, but who cares right now? Okay. So with that, we have our basic particle system. And what you can see in there as well, we have used basically the attack animations and the leaf animations. Now there's two more that we need to figure out. We have the monster death animation and we have the magic one. The monster deaths we can already take care of. The magic ones come in the next section. So let's talk about the monster deaths. And essentially, all we have to do is play this animation once the monster is being destroyed. All this really means is back in my level, let me minimize this one. I want to create, let's call it trigger dev particles. And we need self and a position and a particle type. And all I'm really going to do in here is get myself dot animation player and call create particle. Did I call it particles? Create particles. Yes, particles. And I get the particle type from the argument. Same for the position. And this should always be in self dot visible sprites. And now all I have to do is when I create all of the enemies again. So all the stuff down here, I'm going to pass this function in there as well. So self dot trigger dev particles. And now in my enemy class, I guess let me minimize all the methods here as well. We first want to create another parameter. So let's call it trigger dev particles. This one has to be stored. Let's put it into play interactions. Self dot 
trigger dev particles is going to be trigger dev particles. So now we can call this method from inside of the enemy. Actually, let's do this as an exercise. So try to figure out when to call this method with the different arguments. All right, so I want to trigger this when the enemy is dying. So this line here. And really, all I want to call is self taught trigger dev particles. And in here, I need, let me actually copy it from the particles. So we're just calling the animation type, a position, and a group. And in here, let me open it in the level. We want to trigger dev particles. We need a position and a particle type. So in the enemy, position and particle type. Now, position is going to be self.rect.center. And the particle type is just going to be self.monster name, I think I called it, all the way at the top, uh, monster name. There we go. So this is the name. If you look at the particles, monster name is the name of the particle or the name of the key. And with that, we should be good to go. Let's try. So now if I tag any of these, we are getting a prop animation. So let's try it again. Looks pretty good. And let's try with a different enemy. You. And this is also working. So I assume they all work identically. And with that, we have most of our particles covered. The one thing we still need is the magic. So in the next section, we are going to figure out the magic. That one is going to be a bit more complicated, but we are getting very close and I'm going to take a break before I go to the next section because those were way too many errors. Sorry about that. So let's talk about the magic. And for the magic, we right now have two different spells, one for fire and one for healing. And those two do very different things. The flame is going to work kind of like the sword that it damages enemies whenever there's contact. And this is literally going to work like the sword in the sense that we are going to put the flame inside of the attack of the sprites and then check for collisions. So all we really have to do is place the flames and animate them, for which we have most of the things we actually need. Now for healing, it is getting a little bit easier because this one doesn't need any collision with the enemies. We just have to spawn some particles and heal the player, so increase the health. But I want to create this in a slightly more flexible way. So I'm going to put all of this into a separate class. And let's implement this straight in the code. I think that's going to make the most sense. So here we are back in our project and I want to create a new file that I'm going to call magic.py. And in here, I want to do the usual. So import pygame and from settings, import all of it. And now I want to create a class that I called magic player. There's no need for inheriting anything. And I want to create an init method with self and besides self, we also want to get an animation player. As a matter of fact, this is the animation player we have created here. So when we create this magic player, it can play animations from our animation player. So in here, all I want is my animation player, and that's going to be my animation player. And now, basically, all I want to do, I want to have one method for heal, needs self as always. We're going to add more parameters later on, but for now, let's add pass. And I want to create a flame that for now works in the same way that it doesn't do anything. So right now we have two spells. You could be adding more here if you really wanted to. So how can we actually use this thing now? Well, in my level, let me actually move it all the way to the left because it's the most important one. And let's minimize some methods. So essentially what I do in here, in my init method, besides the animation player, I also want to create a self.magic underscore player. And this one is going to be my magic player. And as the one argument, we need the self.animation player. And for this to work, we have to import from magic, import magic player. So now we have our magic player. And as a matter of fact, 
we already have a create magic method. And in here, we have the style, the strength, and the cost. And this we can use to cast the magic. So essentially, what I want to do is if the style is equal to heal is one, I want to cast some healing. And if the style is equal to flame, I want to do something else, which for now is going to be pass. But let's start with healing. That's the easier one, I think. So we already have our self dot magic player. And all I want to do here is call heal. So I want to call this heal method. And I just realized this is a horrible way to spell magic. So let me save this one and let's spell this one properly. So magic.py. All right, now in my heal, I want to actually cast the heal, but let's first check if this is working in the first place. So I want to print heal. And this should actually be working for now. So let's try it. Let me go to my heal and we can see heal. We still get the other stuff, but that doesn't matter right now. So I printed this one as well, but I guess we can get rid of it. We don't need it anymore. At the very least, we know this heal spell is going to work. And in here now, we have to figure out a couple of parameters. So I first of all want to know my player, then I want to know my strength, then I need the cost, and then I need the sprite groups. And now when we call this thing, we can pass all of this in here. Let me actually copy all of the parameters. That's going to make things a bit easier. My player is just going to be self.player. In this one, we need for the position. Now the strength and the cost I already have is just the strength and the cost up here. So we can just pass both of those in here and we are good to go. Now, finally, for the groups, this is going to be a list again. And in here, I just want to have myself dot visible sprites. And since there's no collisions with these sprites, we don't need anything else. But for the flame, we will also need our attack sprites. But all right, now we have all the arguments we need. Now we can actually work with this. And the first thing we will need is if we can actually call this spell. So if my player dot energy is greater or at the very least equal to the cost. And if that's not the case, nothing should happen. And once that is the case, I want to get my player dot health and add plus equal the strength of the spell. And besides that, I also want to get my player dot energy minus equal the cost. So we're increasing the health of our player and decreasing the energy. That's kind of how all of this works. And I guess now we can actually try this. So now let's select the magic spell. It is working, but now we, if we press this again, well, we keep on increasing our health bar, but once we're running out of enough energy, we stop being able to cast it. Although the animation still plays, but uh, I kind of like the effect. But all right, now what we have to figure out is that if our energy gets too large, we don't want to overshoot on the health bar, which also is fairly easy to do. All we want to do is if our player health is greater than or equal to my player dot stats and then here health. Now this health is our maximum health. So in the player, I have it right here. Our stats is what we initiate the player with. So a hundred here right now is the maximum player health. And then in our code, we are keeping our actual current health in this variable or this attribute. So this is going to be our max health. If our current health is greater than our max health, I just want to set my player health equal to my player dot stats and the health in here. So now I can select my healing spell again. Now we have maximum and I made a typo. This should be player. Now let's try this again. And now we have our energy still decreasing, but we cannot increase our health anymore. And I guess here we have to make a decision. Do we want the player to be able to increase the health or cast the healing spell if we already are at maximum health? And I think most games handle it by allowing the player to cast the healing spell, even though we have full health. So I'm not going to worry about it. But with that, we have the basic healing mechanic. Now, finally, 
we have to spawn some particles. And in my particles, I have Aura and Heal. And I want to spawn both of those once we are casting a spell. Hence, we should be calling this animation player here twice. And I think this could be a good exercise for you. Use from our particles, the create particles method, and spawn the aura particles and the heal particles every time we are calling the heal magic effect. All right, so in my heal method, I want to get myself dot animation player and create underscore particles. So now we are calling this method here. And this method has three arguments. And in my magic, I want to paste the parameters. So animation type, the first one is going to be aura. Then for the position, this should be in the center of my player. So I have my player. I want to get the rect and the center. And groups, we are just going to get from the groups we pass in into the parameters. So that's something we're going to figure out in a bit. But now, in my level, I am already casting self-invisible sprites in here, so I have the right group. And this should give us one particle animation. Let's try it, actually. So now we get the aura spell. This looks pretty good. And once we run out of energy, it doesn't work anymore. And now I also want the heal particle. And for that, I can just duplicate this line and write heal for the particle type. So now let's run this again. And now we get the other particle as well. What you could theoretically do, give this heal extra effect an offset. That can look kind of nice. So in magic, when you add the center, you can add plus pi game dot math dot vector two and zero for x and something like negative 60 for the height. And now if you try this again, this thing is now slightly on top. Um, whatever you think looks better. In my case, I am not going to care too much about it. So let me just remove it. So, all right, with that, we have our healing spell. Although there's one more thing I would like to add, because right now we don't really have any way to increase our energy once it's run out, which doesn't feel very good. So in my player, let me minimize all of the methods here. I want to create another method that I called energy recovery. And we need self and nothing else. And basically what I want to do in here is if self.energy is smaller or equal to myself dot stats and energy. And then I want to get self dot energy. And for now, let's say plus equal one, although that number is going to be way too high. And now if our energy for whatever reason gets greater than our maximum energy, so else I want to set self dot energy equal to self dot stats and energy. And now we can call this method. So self dot energy recovery. And we should have recovering energy. So now you can already tell our energy is increasing really fast. I can't even cast the spell fast enough to deplete my energy. But at the very least, it's working. But we do have to make some adjustments. In my player, first of all, they shouldn't be smaller or equal. They should just be smaller. So now let's try this again. And now our energy bar stops at the maximum. But if we cast a spell, it still recovers way too fast. So instead, I don't want to add 1. I want to add 0 0.01. And now if I cast this again, now I can see a small increase. And even if I cast the magic, it still keeps on increasing. So this works quite nicely. Now, what you can also do is use in my stats, I have it right here. In here, we have magic. And this one, I think is best to use it for two purposes. 
one is our magic damage and then the other is our magic recovery. So I want to multiply this with self.stats and magic. So that way, if we're leveling up our magic, we do more damage and we recover energy faster. So now let's try this again. And we have, um, I guess it's kind of fast, but you can play with this around and see what works well. But I quite like this. So now we have magic recovery and we have our heal spell. So next up, we can work on the flames. And those do get a bit more complex, although not that much. Let me explain the basic logic before we start. Right now, we have our player here. And essentially, what I want to do is I want to cast five different flame spells that go in the direction of the player. So for example, if our player is facing to the right, I want to create one flame, two flames, three flames, four and five flames. And then each of those flames get a bit of an offset to create some randomness here to make it look better. And well, that's the general idea. And let me leave the graphic open for now. We're going to need it in just a second again. But first of all, in my flame, I want to check if my player dot energy is greater or equal to the cost of the spell. Oh, and I forgot we need the parameters again. So in here, I want to get my player. I want to get my cost and I want to get my groups. Now, importantly here, we have no strength. I'll show you later how to get that strength. But now we can work on the cost. And once we have cast a spell, I want to get my player energy minus equal the cost. So now we have the basic setup. And now what we have to figure out is how to get this direction. Because this direction determines if the flames are spawned to the right, to the bottom, to the left, or up. So this direction is really important to figure out. Fortunately, we can get it reasonably easy from the player itself. And we have kind of done something similar before. So what I want to get is if my player dot status and my player status, I can get from, let me minimize all of this again. It's kind of hard to read. So when I imported all of the player assets, we created animations. And in here, we have all of our possible player states. And I just want to get just the direction. So up, down, left, or right. And if we have something like down underscore idle, I want to get rid of the underscore idle. Actually, let's do this as an exercise because we have done this like four hours ago. So figure out how to split this string to only get the direction and ignore anything like idle or attack. All right, so what we need is the split method. And in here, the one argument we need is an underscore. So that is going to return a list with the strings that we have split. So for example, if we had down idle, we would get a list of down and idle. And in my case, I don't care about anything that comes after the first element. So I just want to get the index of zero. And if that happens to be, let's say, right, then I want to create a direction that is going to be a vector. So pygame.math.vector2 and a vector facing to the right is 1 and 0. And that way we can use the vector in some math. And now I can just copy all of this three times to have it three times and turn this into an L if statement. And then at the end we have an else statement. Now, first of all, here we have left and left should be negative one and zero. Then let's say we can go with up and up has zero on the X and minus one on the Y. And then finally for else, let me copy this direction. So else is going to be just one, which is downwards. So with that, we have our different directions. And I feel like putting all of those on the same line looks a bit cleaner, although it's entirely up to you to do this. But in my case, when I have a one line if statement, it tends to feel better to have all of this on one line. Now we have our direction. And now basically what I want to do. 
Since I want to spawn five flames, I want to create a for loop. So let's call it for i in range. And then here you might be tempted to go with something like five, but I want to use this i for the offset. So the first element should be a one, and that way we can multiply this one with the tile size to get an offset of 64 pixels to the player center. So this shouldn't start at zero, it should start at one. And since we still want five elements, it should stop at five and go up to, but not include six. So now we have a proper for loop. And now for the math, I have to split this thing into horizontal and vertical direction. So if direction.x exists, so it's different from zero, this is going to be horizontal and else it's going to be vertical. And let's just add a pass here for now so we don't get an error. Now we can work on, let's start with the horizontal one. First of all, I have to get an offset and this one is in the x direction. And basically what I want to do, let me draw this out. Let me get a bit of space. Here we have my player again, and let's say my player is facing to the right. So my direction is going to be a vector that is one and zero. The one we have created up here. And essentially what I want to do, I want to multiply this with i. So the number we got here. So if the vector is positive, this one is going to get us further to the right. And if the vector is negative, for example, if it was going to the left, this would give us an increasingly larger negative number. But now we would still just go by pixels of one. So we go one to the right, two to the right, three to the right, and so on. So I want to multiply all of this again with my tile size. And that way, the first flame is going to be right to the next of the player. And we have an offset here of 64 pixels, which is going to be the tile size. And then for the next flame, since i now is two, we go another 64 pixels further to the right. And now the center of our rectangle is going to be here. The arrow should be a bit, let's put the arrow a bit here. So essentially, all I want to do, I want to get my direction.x and multiply it with i. And now I want to multiply all of this with my tile size, I think I called it. Yep, tile size, this one. And now for each of the flames, I want to get an x and a y. And once we have all of that, I want to call myself dot animation player and create particles. And then in here, I want to call my flame. So in my particles, the flame here. And besides that, I will need a position and my groups. So I need my flame, I need X and Y, and then I need the groups I am getting from the parameters. So all we have to do is figure out the X and we have to figure out the Y. And this might be a good exercise for you. So try to figure out where each individual flame needs to be spawned. So where the center X and Y is supposed to be. All right, so first of all, I want to get my player.rect.centerx and player.rect.centerY because my flames are always supposed to start from my player. Now for the X position, I want to get my offset X and that's basically all I need. And for my Y position, since we're only moving in the horizontal direction, we can just leave it as it is. And that is basically all we need. So now in my level, when I call flame, I can call self dot magic player dot flame. And the arguments I passed in here was player cost and groups. So player is going to be self dot player again, cost we already have and groups. Let's say for now, this is only going to be self dot visible sprites. The attack sprites we do later, let's first figure out the flames by themselves. So now if I run this, we are getting an error because the dict has no attribute split. So this is going to happen in my magic and self.stats, it shouldn't be stats. 
it should be status. So now if I run this, down isn't going to work, but if I look to the right, we are getting some flames, and if I look to the left, we are also getting some flames. So this seems to be working just fine. And let's try one more time. We do need enough energy. There we go. So I'm happy with that. Although there's one small change I would like to do. Right now, I feel like those flames look too predictable, like they're too much in one straight line. So I want to give them a bit of a random offset for both X and Y. And for that, I need a random number generator. So from random, import, rand, int. And now for both of these positions, I want to add rand int. And essentially what I have done, I went from negative tile size divided by three all the way up to tile size divided by three, except in a positive direction. And this I have also done for the Y position. So essentially tile size is 64. If you divide this by three, you get a number around 21. And that way, if we have a larger tile size, you get a larger offset. So let's try this now. And this looks a bit more random. I kind of like that one. So with that, we have the horizontal flames. Now, all we have to do is do the same thing for the vertical ones. So let me copy all of this. We can pass it in here. And now instead of offset X, we have offset Y. Instead of direction.x, we want to get direction.y. And the rest for this line can stay the same. Now, for x and y, we need the offset x removed from the x position and added to the y position. And this should now be offset y. And besides that, we don't need anything else. So let's try it now. So this side is working, this side is working. Let's wait for some energy. This side is working as well. Nice. So now we have our flame spell. It doesn't do anything just yet, but we can work on it. I guess let's work on it right now. First thing that we have to work on is we have to place each of our flames also inside our self dot attack sprites. So let's try this, but we will get an error once we attack an enemy. So for the grass, it should work and it does. There's actually a really cool effect. So this is pretty good. But now if we attack an enemy, let's say this one, we get an error. That particle object has no attribute sprite type. And this error happens in player attack logic. So player attack logic in here. And in here we have target sprite get damage. And in our enemy, let me minimize all of the methods. In here we have, where's get damage? Get damage is here. So in here, we need an attack type. And for our weapons, we have a sprite type called weapon. And this sprite type we are passing in here. So our attack sprite dot sprite type is the attack type in the enemy. The problem is our particles don't have one. So in this particle effect, we don't have a sprite type. We can give it one though. So self dot sprite underscore type is going to be magic. And magic is a bit broad, but right now we only have a single attack spell. But if you had multiple types of spells, you could just get another parameter in here and there classify what kind of sprite type you have. Or you could even get a whole new particle effect that inherits from this particle effect and this one has a sprite type for a different kind of spells. So you can certainly make this very flexible with just a bit more effort. But in my case, I don't really mind. And now let's try this actually to see what's happening now. So now if I tag an enemy, we are actually getting something. But you see now it doesn't actually damage the enemies in any meaningful way. And the reason for that is in my enemy, I have weapon and we're reducing the health. But when we have anything else, nothing is really happening. So in here, we want to do something else. And in here, we have to figure out how much damage we are going to get. But first of all, we have to get our health regardless of what we are doing. But besides that, I want to get from my player, which we still have available from the parameters. So we're going to pass this in here. 
And now from this player, I want to get full magic damage, like we have done just above. So now in my player, I right below get full weapon damage. Actually, let me open this method just for reference. So in here, define get underscore full magic damage needs self and nothing else. And in here, again, we need a base damage and we need, a, let's call this one a spell damage. And then we are going to return the base damage plus the spell damage. And well, for our base damage, we have self.stats and this one is magic. And then for our spell damage, we have magic data. And then here, I want to get self.magic. And then from that, I want to get what I call the strength. So now this should be working. Let's try. So now if I attack an enemy, they should theoretically disappear. Let's try it again. Um, okay, this needed. Okay, let's try this properly without reducing for the flame damage the energy cost. So that way we can call it indefinitely. So now let's try this again. Let's use this one. And let's do it again. I'm not sure how much damage I gave. Ah, there we go. So it does indeed work. And everything else still works just fine. Cool. So with that, we also have our proper flame spell. So now in my player, let me minimize all of the methods again. And I think with that, we have our magic figured out. So that's another major part of this game. And now it's actually coming together really nicely. And we can call different spells, different attacks. And all of this is working very, very nicely. Cool. We are actually getting very close to being done. The one thing we still have to figure out is the upgrade mechanic. And that's going to be the next major section. Actually, the last major section. All right, now, how can we implement an upgrade mechanic? And there are a couple of things that we need. First of all, something I haven't done yet. Our player should get some experience once we are destroying an enemy. That one's really easy to implement. And once we have that, the basic upgrade mechanic works like this. In our self.stats, we want to be able to upgrade any of the key value pairs. So for example, we want to increase health by 20%. And every time we are doing that, we are reducing the amount of our experience by a certain amount. So I guess it's not really experience, it's more like souls from Dark Souls, but you get the mechanic. And I guess the only really complicated bit in all of this is the GUI for the upgrade mechanic. Because for that, we need quite a few different bits. But I guess let's do it step by step and let's first add an XP mechanic and then give our player a bit more data. So here we are back in the code and I want to close down a couple of things. So we don't need magic anymore. We do need the enemies. We don't need particles and settings can stay open, I guess. So in my player, in the init method, I have down here right now my stats. And I am going to need a few more stats. The first one is going to be max stats. So this is the maximum amount of health or energy or attack damage that my player can have. And I realized speed of 12 was a bit high, so let's go with 10. I also want to have an upgrade cost. So this is going to be how expensive each upgrade is going to be. And now just to get started, let's increase our experience to something like 500. So we can work with this a bit more easily. And now the first thing we are going to need is that our player should get some experience every time we are destroying an enemy. And for that in our level, let me minimize all the methods in here again. I want to create another method and that's just going to be add XP. And this one needs self and amount. And really all we're doing in here is we are getting our self dot 
player.exp and plus equal the amount. And now this method I want to place into the enemies. So when we are creating all of our enemies, the final method I get is self.addXP. And now in my enemies, when they die, so check def. In here, I also want to call self.addExp. And then we can add the amount. But first of all, in the parameters, we have to add add exp and then let's say player interaction self dot add exp and now we can actually call it so add exp now we have to figure out how much experience the enemy should give and that information we have up here so for each monster we have a custom experience so we can just copy this one and place it in here. So self.exp. And now this should actually already be working. Let's try. And we are getting an error. So enemy object has no add experience. Which no enemy. And it's in the level. And let's call it self.exp. Self.exp. And then in my enemy. Parameter is called add exp and oh, I just forgot add exp. Okay, now let's try this again. There we go. And now if I tag an enemy, there we go. And we get some experience. So as again, there we get another 120 experience. And let's try this one again. And we get even more experience. And I can also heal. And well, technically we should have just died. But in my case, I didn't really implement the death mechanic because, well, the game is already getting complex as it is. But if you had an actual game, this could lead you to an overworld or something. But all right, now in our enemy, we have the add experience, so we can close enemies and minimize the create map method. And add XP as well. So, all right. Now with that, our player has the experience and we have the data. Now all we have to figure out is how to increase the stats of our player. And for that, I want to create a separate menu. And that I actually want to do in my main file because in here I have my event loop. And what I want to check in here is if event.type is equal to pygame.type k down so we're pressing any button and if event dot key is equal to pygame dot k underscore m so in my case the m button is the upgrade menu button and if we are pressing that i want to run myself dot level and then there i have a method called toggle or i want to create a method so now in my level i can create a toggle method Actually, let's call it toggle menu that feels a bit more appropriate. So toggle menu. And if I'm doing that, self.toggle underscore menu, we need self and nothing else. And basically, all I want to do, I want to create self.game underscore post is going to be not self.game underscore post and in my init method let's say all the way in the basic setup self dot game post by default is going to be false and now what i can do in my run method of this level essentially what i want to do in here is if game post is true i want to display the upgrade menu and if that is not the case i want to run the game and now we have to figure out what to draw in here what to draw in here and what to draw all the time so let's go through it one by one our visible sprites we always want to draw even if the game is paused however we only want to update them if the game is not paused 
And same with the visible sprites and the enemy update. Then the attack logic should also be in here. But my UI display, I always want to display, even if the game is paused, because there we can see the experience. So now we can get rid of all of those. And now we have to figure out what to do when the game is paused. And for now, I just have pass in here. And to actually get a full menu, I want to create yet another Python file. And this one I called upgrade.py. That is actually going to be our final new file. So we are getting very close to finishing this project. And in here, as always, we have to import py game and from settings import everything. Now I have my class upgrade. There is no need for inheritance. And in here, I want a dunder init method with self. And I want to place the player in here as the parameter. And in this method for now, I want to have a general setup. And first of all, we need the display underscore surface. That's just going to be pygame.display.get underscore surface. And then self.player is going to be my player. We will need quite a bit more, but that comes later. The really important thing I want to have for now is a method called display. This one doesn't need any arguments. And for now, I just want to make sure we can see what we are doing. So for now, I just want to get myself dot display surface dot fill. And let's say we're going to fill it with black. So whenever we have this menu open, we're going to fill the screen with black. And once it's gone, we are not going to fill it. So essentially what that means in my level, I want to from upgrade import upgrade, I believe I called it. Yep, upgrade. And now in the init method, all the way down here, I guess this is also user interface. So self dot upgrade is going to be upgrade. And this one is going to need self dot player. So let's minimize this one now. And now in my run method, I want to run self dot upgrade dot display. So now we can toggle at least in theory between a menu. So in my game, we get game paused not defined in my level dot run because this should be self dot game paused. There we go, the game runs. Now if I press M, it goes to black. And if we press it again, we go back to the same stage. Actually, let me get chased by some enemies. Now I press M, and now we return back to the same stage where we were earlier. So this is actually a pause mechanic. And this keeps on working just fine. Cool. And the reason why this is working is because when our game is paused, we are not updating the main part of our game anymore. And because of that, the game picks up once we are stopping this. So this is a nice pause mechanic. So all we have to figure out now is how to create a proper menu. And that is going to become a slightly longer section. So I guess let's work through it one by one. Now, first of all, we need some input. And for that, again, we need keys and pygame.key.get underscore pressed and then if keys and pygame dot k underscore right then let's say for now we just want to pass and l if keys pygame dot k left we want to move left but for now this is going to be pass as well and finally i want to check if keys and Pygame, that's not how you spell that, pygame.k space. We also want to pass, but this is going to be our select button. And let's spell keys correctly. All right, so now we have to figure out how to actually implement these mechanics for left and right. And let me explain how this is going to work. I am basically going to create a selection index. And this selection index can be a number between zero and five. And that is the amount of stats my player has. 
So one stat could be health, the other stat could be energy, and then I have speed, attack, and magic. And then for each of those five, I'm going to create a box. And each of those boxes is going to be one class. So three, four, five. And essentially what I'm then going to do is I'm going to have a selection number that let's say right now it could be one. And if it is one, we're going to select the box with the index number one. If it is three, we're going to select this box here. So that way, when we press left or right, we are either increasing or decreasing this number. And that's then all we need to do. Okay, but for that to work, we need a couple of things. First of all, we need our self dot attribute number. And all I really want in here is the length of my player dot stats. So the length of in my player, I want to get this dictionary and in there I have these different values. And I guess while we're at it, I can also get the names. So self dot attribute names. And this one is just going to be a list with my player dot stats. And from that, I just want to get the keys. And finally, I am also going to need a font, just like we needed one for the UI. So self.font, and in here we have pygame.font.font. And now we can use the same font from our UI. So UI font and UI font size. So UI font and UI font size. And that would then be all the basic information we are going to need. But besides that, we are also going to need, let's call it a selection system. Him. And that is the number I just talked about that we're going to increase from 0 to 5. And this I called self.selection index. And by default, it's going to be 0. And since we're going to move it, we are also going to need a timer. So self.selection underscore time. By default, it's going to be none. And then self.can underscore move. And by default, this one is going to be true. And now in my keys, the most basic thing I want to do is self dot selection index, not selection time, selection index plus equal one if we are going to the right or minus equal one if we are going to the left. But now for the proper timer, we also want to set self dot can move to false and self.selection time is going to be pygame.time.get underscore ticks. And these two lines we need for both of the movement. So in there, and there we go. And now when we call left and right, besides the button, we also want to check and self can move. So this is basically our basic movement that we have implemented a couple of times by now. And now finally, we need a selection underscore cooldown. And this one, again, it's just going to be a basic timer. So if not self dot can move, then I want to get my current underscore time. It's going to be pygame.time.get underscore ticks. And then finally, if my current time minus my self dot selection time is greater or equal than a certain number. Um, let's say for this one, 300 milliseconds. Once we have that, can move is back to true. And now we can get rid of this surface fill and just replace it with self dot input and self dot selection cool down. Actually, let's do this slightly differently. This self dot can move probably makes more sense when we put it as a general one all the way at the top and then check all of the other keys. Sorry about that. This makes more sense because there's one more thing that we do have to check. So if we are all the way to the right, we don't want to be able to go any further. So I'm going to check 
and self dot selection index is smaller than my self dot attribute number. And this one needs to have negative one because of the way we are counting in the length method. And then the same thing for left. So self dot selection index, except this one needs to be greater or equal than one at the very least. And now finally, we can also start with our space button. So in here, I also want to run the timer. And what I want to do for now is just to print my self dot selection index. So at least we have something. And let's try if all of this is working. I press M, the game pauses. Now if I press space, you can see zero in the bottom left. If I press right, we get to four. And if I press down, we get back to zero. So something with the input doesn't work just yet. And the reason is that this selection index should be selection time. Now let's try this again. If I press M, if I press space, we just get one. If I press to the right, we get one result up to four. But if I go back, we get the numbers that I actually wanted. Cool. So this is working now. Okay, this really is a long tutorial. Now, I can minimize my selection cooldown. I don't need it anymore. And for now, let's minimize the input method as well, so we can see a bit better what's going on. Now, basically, what I want to do, let me draw this out. Here, we have our entire game window. And what I want to do, I want to spawn a couple of boxes over this thing. Five in total. And each of these boxes should have some kind of bar on the inside that shows us how much we have. And on top, we want to have the name of that stat. And at the bottom here, we want to have the cost. And I'm going to create a class for each of these boxes. So each of these red boxes is going to be one instance of a class. But to be able to do that, I first have to figure out a couple of dimensions about the screen. So I have to know how wide each of these boxes have to be and how tall they have to be. And for that, I need to do some math. So let's work on that first. And we can do this straight in the init method. Let's do it right here. So I called the class item and we want to get item dimensions. And we need the height. We need self.width as well. And height is the easier one. I basically want to get myself dot display surface and in here get size. And this is going to give us X and Y and we only care about Y. And I am just going to multiply this by 0 0.8. So we have most of the screen, but we are losing about 20%. So we have a offset essentially. Now for the width, I can actually copy most of this except this one should be zero, so we get X. And I'm going to divide this by six, which is my attribute number plus one. So that way I have my five elements and the sixth one or the width of the sixth one is going to be the padding between them. And now I can create another method. And I call this one create items. And for this one, we don't need any arguments. And essentially, let me create a class right now. I want to create a class that I called items or item. And each of those is going to be one box that we can upgrade. And for this one, I need an init method. And then here, I want a left, I want a top, I want a width, I want a height, I want an index so we know what is selected and I want a font. So all of this is what we have to figure out in this create items. I guess for now, let me add pass in here so Python doesn't throw an error. Okay, now, first of all, I want to store all of these items in a list. So let's call it self.item underscore list. For now, it's just an empty list. And now I just want to go for i, let's say for item, 
in range self dot attribute number. And now I have to figure out the horizontal position. I need to figure out the vertical position. And then I have to use that to create the object. So let's do the last step first. Item is going to be my item. And then here I want to have a left, a top, then the width I already have. That's the one I have up here. So self.width and self.height. Then the index we're also going to get in just a second. And then the font we already have. That's just self.font. So essentially, we have to figure out the left, the top, and the index. And once we have all of that, I can get my self.itemList.append and my item. Now we have to figure out the horizontal and the vertical position. And the vertical position is kind of easier. So let's start with this one. In here, we need the top. And right now we know, let me draw this actually. So if this is the entire height of our game, let's call this H. So this is the entire window in specific numbers. This would be 1280. And we know that 80% of this, so let's say roughly this one, is going to be our current self.height. So this number here. So we have 10% here and we have 10% up here. Now, because I want my boxes to start on this line, essentially all I really need is 10% of the screen height starting from the top of the screen. That's the only number I need for the top. And this one is really easy to get. So I need self dot display surface dot get underscore size. I need the Y number again. And now I have to multiply this by 0 0.1. I guess you could make this system a bit more flexible by putting these two numbers inside of one variable, but I'm not going to worry too much about it. But all right, with that, we have our top. Now, our left, unfortunately, is going to become a bit more difficult. I guess, first of all, I want to have my full width. And this one, I can actually copy it, is this number here, except we want to have zero. So right now, we know the entire width of our window. Then I want to know by what increment I want to move to the right. And let me actually draw this. So right now, this here is the entire height of our game. So let's call it H. Oh, and this one is actually 1280. The height of our window is 20. The height of our window is 720. Uh, well, I guess you get the idea. But anyway, this one right now is 1280 pixels wide. And this is what I got with full width. And now what I essentially want to get is I want to have a bit of an offset from the left. And then I want to have my first element. So let's start here with the left of the first element. The first element should then go, let's say, roughly to here. And then I want to have a bit further to the right, another element. And this should then be the left of the second element. Or I guess to be a bit more specific, this should be the index zero and this should be the index one. That is a bit easier to comprehend. And this number is then going to be the increment. It's basically the distance from the left to get the left side of each item. And this number, I basically get with my full width divided by my self attribute number. So right now we are splitting the entire window into five different parts. And with all of the information, I can get my left. So now all I have to do is I want to get my current item number. So this could be either zero, one, two, and so on. And multiply this by my increment. And then to what's that? I want to get my increment and from that subtract my self dot width of each of the items and floor divide this by two. And that way we are offsetting each of the elements a little bit further to the left. And well with that we have our left side. Now finally I need the current index and the best way to get the index is just to use the enumerate method and then we get item and index. So with that, 
we have the basic setup to create each of these items. And let's actually draw them so we see what's going on. I know it's getting a bit theoretical. So basically, what I want to do in the init, I first of all want to create a self.rect. And this is just going to be a pygame.rect. And then here, we can just pass in left, top, width, and height. And besides that, I also want to get my self.index, and that is going to be the index, and I want to get my self.font, and that's just going to be the font. And now, each of these items is going to have their own display method. And for this one, besides self, we need the surface to draw on, so our display surface. Then we need the selection underscore num, so what our currently selected item is, so we can highlight it. And then we need the values we actually want to display. So be aware, the item is essentially a box that could display any kind of information, whatever we pass in. So we actually have to pass in our stats. So I want to have a name, a value, a max, value, and a cost. And these are the informations I want to draw. Now that we have all of that, for now, let's just draw some basic thing. All I want to do is pygame.draw.rect and we get the surface from the parameters. Then for the colors, for now, I just want the background color from my settings. Oh, actually, in my settings, we need to import a bit more information because in here, the upgrade menu has its own colors. So finally, a tiny bit more. This is the last bit we need. But for the background, I just want to have the UI BG color. So let's copy this one and paste it in here. And finally, self.rect, the one we created uh, up here. here. So for now, we're just drawing a basic rectangle to see if something is going on in the first place. And now, finally, for my display, I can just draw all of them. So I can for item in self.itemList, I can do something. But first of all, I forgot to actually call self.createItems. And let's do it below this one. So self.createItems. And let's call this section just item creation. Okay, we are nearly done. Uh, sorry, this section gets a bit more complex. It's kind of hard to visualize. But now in my for loop, I just want to get item.display. And here we need the different arguments. So we need all of these arguments. Let me copy them. So surface is going to be my self.display surface. Selection number, for now, we're not going to care about it. It's going to be zero. Name, let's say for now we can just write test. For value, it's going to be one. Max value, let's say two, and cost three. These numbers for now don't matter. I just want to see if this is working in the first place. But now we should see something. So let's try to run main.py and press M. And there we go. We can see our five different boxes. So at the very least, this is working. And I'm fully aware that the logic here is getting a bit more complex. So I would recommend you to go over this if you're struggling with this. So especially the create items can be a bit finicky. But well, let's continue with what we have. Now, the first thing I want to do is to actually display the names of what we are dealing with. So for now, I want to show the name of the attributes. And I guess what we added, we can show the cost. And for that to work, we have to, um, let's call it get attributes. And we will need the name. We will need the value. We will need the max value. And finally, we will need the cost. And since we also have to figure out what the index of each number is, I also want to put item list in an enumerate method. So this should be index and item. And now let's work through them one by one. First of all, the name we already have in our attribute names. 
So in here, all I really have to do is get myself dot attribute names and then select the index. For the values, I need to get myself dot player. And for this one, I want to write another method in the player that I called get value by index. And this one's going to get the index. We're going to write that in just a second. Now for the max values, I want to get them right at the top here because those don't change. So in here, self dot, let's call it max values. And to get this one, it's supposed to be a list. And I want to get my player dot max underscore stats, I think I called it. It is max stats here. And from this one, I want to get the values. So now for my max value, I can just look at myself dot max values and pick the one by the right index. And finally for the cost, this one also, I want to get myself dot player and then get cost by index. And we want to pass in the index. All right, and now in the player, let's create those two methods. And let me actually copy them. So it saves me a bit of writing. And let's write them right below the other two getter methods. So we have get value by index, self and index. And then let me copy all of this and get cost by index. And in here, I essentially want to return just a value for each specific value in our stats. So essentially, I want to get my current value from this list here, or this dictionary rather. And all we have to return is, first of all, we need a list with our self dot stats dot values. And from that, I want to select the index. And that's really all we need. It's not a particularly complex one. And now I can copy this. And now instead of stats, I want to look at my upgrade cost. So this way we also get our current index right in here with just one line of code. And now all we have to do is to pass all of this information in the display method. So first of all, the surface we still have. And now for the selection number, I want to pass in my self dot selection index. Then next up, we have my name. And this can just be name. Then we have the value, that's going to be value. Then we have max value. And then we have the cost. So let's check if this is still working. We're not getting an error message. That's at the very least a good sign. So now we are passing in all the information we need in here. So let me for now hide the upgrade menu. We're not going to need it for a while. So essentially, all I have to do now is create a couple of methods to display the different things. First of all, I want to write display underscore names. And then here, we need self. We again need the surface to draw on. Then we need the name and we need the cost. And I also want to check if this is the currently selected box. And in here, we are going to create the title text and we are going to create the cost text. And then at the end, once we have created them, we are going to draw everything. So let's create the title first. And then here, I just want to create a title surface. This one is going to be self dot font dot render. And what we want to render is the name we already have. And since we're drawing pixel art, I don't want to anti alias it. And now we are going to need a color. And the color I am getting from my settings. And in here, we have a text color. So let's pass this in here. And then besides the surface, we need a title rect. And what I want to do is to get my title surface, get rect. And now the mid top 
should be where my self dot rect dot mid top is. And from that, I want to give it an offset. So pygame dot math dot vector two. We want zero offset in X and in my case, 20 pixels in the Y direction. And with that, we can get our surface and blit and create a title surface and the title rectangle. So now in my display method, I can run self.display names. And then here, pass in the surface we already have. Then we want the name, we want the cost. And let's say selected for now is going to be false. We're going to change that later on. Okay, and let's try this. If I press M, we are getting an error because get wrecked here should not be capitalized. And now let's try this again. There, we can now see health, energy, attack, magic, and speed. This is working really well. And now besides that, I also want to display the cost. And this could be a good exercise for you. So just like the title, try to display the cost, except now the cost should be at the bottom of each of the bars. Right, first of all, I want to create a cost surface. It's going to be self.font.render again. And in here, I want to draw my cost. But my cost right now is a number. So I'm going to turn this into an F string. And there is a chance that my cost might become a floating point number. So I'm also going to convert it into an integer. But besides that, we can just copy the other arguments from my title surface. And now once we have that, we need our cost rect. And our cost surf dot get underscore rect. And this time I want to place my mid bottom. And it's going to be myself dot rect dot mid bottom. Except with an offset. So pygame dot math dot vector two and zero and twenty. Although now be aware we are subtracting that vector, we're not increasing like in the other one. And now all we have to do is surface dot blit. We need my cost surface and cost rect. And that should be all we needed. Let's try it now. And there again, we can see our cost. Now there's one more thing that we do have to do. And that is to work with this selected. And essentially what I want to do is in my upgrade, I have a selection index. And if the selection index and the index of each item is identical, then I want to highlight this. And actually let me illustrate this. This might be slightly confusing. So this right now is our entire window. And in here, we have a couple of bars. Uh, let's do all of them. So here we have five. And each of those has an index. That's the index we created just here. And there are zero, one, two, three, and four. And besides that, I also have a selection index. And this one could be anything between zero to four. And this is also the number we can influence with our keyword input. And essentially what I want to do, if for example, our selection index is a one, then I want to highlight this box here. And if it's, let's say a four, I want to highlight this box here. So whenever the index of our item is the same as our selection index, then I know I want to highlight this box and I can change some colors. That's the entire idea here. And I have both available in my class actually. So this selection number, is our selection index. So the one we are passing in here. And essentially all I have to do is if my self.index is identical with the selection number, I think I called it, yeah, selection number. If that is the case, we should be drawing something in a highlighted way. And we're going to use this later, but for now let's add pass in here. 
And what we can also do is copy all of this and pass this in here for the true or false argument. So this comparison can become either true or false. So now that this selected here gives us either a true or false statement, we can use that to influence the color. And we have two different colors in our settings. So we have the text color and text color selected. So now with my text color selected, I basically want to do, I have text color selected if selected is true. And if that is not the case, so else, I just want to have my text color. And now I can pass in color for both of the text colors and we should be good to go. Let's try this. So now I press M and now my health and my health cost are darker. If I press to the right, we now have other fields selected. And this is working quite well. Now, obviously right now, this is very hard to see. But later on, we are also going to change the background color for each of these items, so it's going to be easier to see. But for now, this is working quite well. I guess we can actually do it right now. So if this if statement here is true, we want to draw a selected color. And if it's not true, we just want to draw the regular background rectangle. And I guess while we're at it, I can duplicate this one because we also want to have a border color. So I want four for the width. And now for the border color, I have UI border color. And back in my upgrade, I can change this one. And let's try if this is working. And yeah, this looks pretty good. Oh, now I can even tell we're not drawing any background for the currently selected item. Not ideal, but it does look kind of funny. But we can change this quite easily by just copying those two and putting them in here. And now in my settings, we have upgrade BG selected that we can place in here. And UI border color actually stays the same. So now let's try this. And I press M. And there we go. This is looking really nice. So with that, we can properly see which one is selected. So what we have to do next is create another method. And this is going to self.display. Let's call it the bar. And this is going to be the upgrade bar. And then here, let's actually create the method because this one also needs a couple of parameters. So display underscore bar self as always. We need a surface. Then we need our value. We will need a max value. And we need to know if this one is selected or not, because that will change the color. And now let's talk about what we have to do. This one here is going to be one of the items. And inside of each item, I want to have a bar. And inside of each bar, we have the name and the cost. That one doesn't matter right now. But now what I want to do is to place a line in here. And on this line, we have a rectangle that shows us how much the player currently has in this skill. And this one can go all the way to the max level. And actually, let me leave this one up here right now. Might be kind of helpful. And let me spell properly. This should be display bar. Now, first of all, we need some, let's call it drawing set up. And in here, we want to know what the top and the bottom, and I guess also the color of this bar is going to be. So right now, we just want to know what is the top and what is the bottom of this bar going to be. It's going to be self.rect.mid top. And then I want to give this one an offset. So plus pygame.math.vector vector2 and 0 and 60. So we're going down a tiny bit. And then for the bottom, we can do something fairly similar. Except now we look at the mid bottom and we are subtracting in the y axis. And for the color, we have in our settings bar color and bar color selected. So I want to have bar color selected if selected. And if that is not the case, I just want to have the normal bar color. 
And I guess we can actually already draw this line. So draw elements. And essentially what I want to do is pygame.draw.line. And this one, first of all, is going to need a surface. And the surface we have from our parameters. Besides that, we need a color. This one we also have. And then we need a top and a bottom. Also elements that we have. So all of the stuff we just created. So now I can actually call my bar. So let me copy all the parameters again. My surface is going to be my surface again. My value we already have, my max value we also have, and selected is going to be the same thing we got from earlier. So now this should be working. Let's try. And there we can see we have a line, although it is very, very thin. And the reason why it is so thin is because I didn't set a border width. But that we can add with another argument and let's give it a width of five. And now let's try this again. There we go, this feels better. And this is looking pretty good. So now what I essentially want to do is to place a rectangle somewhere on here to illustrate how much of this value my player currently has. So we have to get, let's call it a bar set up. And first of all, I need to know the full height of this thing. And that is just going to be bottom and be aware my bottom right now has an X and a Y position. And I only care about the Y one. And from that, I want to subtract my top. And I also want just the Y position. And be aware here, the origin of a window is in the top left. So the bottom one is the higher number, which is why we are subtracting top from bottom. But all right, now I want to have the relative number. This right now, is the value that I currently have divided by the max value. So let me add a bit of space. Let's say right now in my init method, there are my stats. So if my health is 100 and my max health is 300, I want this bar to be at one third of the maximum amount. And this is exactly what we are doing here. So this is going to give us something like 0 0.3. And this then, I just want to multiply with the full height to turn this into a pixel measurement. And now I can create, let's call it a value rectangle. And this is going to be pygame.rect. And this one does need to be capitalized. And in here we need left, we need top, we need a width, and we need a height. And for the width and height, I just went with 30 and 10. Fairly random numbers. I just went with what looked good. Now, for the left, I just went with either top or bottom, doesn't matter, they have the same position anyway, and I went with zero. So this is going to give me the x of the top. And from that, I'm going to subtract 15, which is half of my width. And then the top is going to be the bottom of my bar, so one, and from that, I'm going to subtract the relative number. So just to illustrate what's happening here, if this is our entire bar, then bottom one, this bit here, is this point all the way at the bottom. And then the relative number is going to be however much of a gap there is from the bottom. So this way, our bar would be here-ish. And all right, with that, we have something to draw. So pygame.draw.rect. I again want the surface, the color, and this time I want to draw a value rectangle. And now let's try this. And this is looking pretty good. With that, we only need to figure out how to actually increase any of these values. And for that, I have another method. And this I called trigger. And trigger needs self and player. And we first of all have to figure out how to actually call this thing. And this is going to happen. Let me minimize all of these methods. This is going to happen essentially in here. So right now we're just printing our selection index. It doesn't really do anything right now. Instead, I want to call this trigger 
inside of my item. And we can minimize quite a few different things, so it's a bit easier to see. That is feeling slightly better, I guess. Yeah, there we go. Okay, essentially, I want to get the trigger from my item list in here. So I first of all want to get myself dot item list. And from that thing, I want to get myself dot selection index. And this one then, I want to call the trigger method on and pass in self dot player. And now in this trigger method, we can get the first of all, let's call it the upgrade attribute. And this we get with player dot stats dot keys turn all of this into a list and once we have that we can use self dot index to get one specific value and index will always be the same for each item and i guess for now let's just print our upgrade attribute so we know this is working so back in here i can press space on health we get health energy attack magic and speed so this way we know which element we are selecting. Now, besides that, we have to first figure out if the player has enough experience to upgrade this certain kind of value. So I want to check if my player.exp is greater or equal than my player.upgrade underscore cost it was called. So in my player, we have upgrade cost. So upgrade cost, and I am only caring about my upgrade attribute. And now once I have that, and that is actually true, I want to get my player.exp minus equal player.upgrade cost again, and get my upgrade attribute. So now we are lowering the XP, and then for my player.stats, now we can finally upgrade something. Yep, we have my upgrade attribute. And in my case, I'm just gonna multiply each value by 1.2. And what I'm also going to do, every time we are upgrading a certain part, I want to increase my upgrade cost by 1.4. So we get increasingly more value and it becomes even more expensive every time we upgrade. And now, actually, let's try this. So now, if I press space on health, we get 140, and our experience did go down. So now we get to 64, and we can't press this anymore because we don't have enough experience. And let's actually try to destroy some enemies. Uh, okay, this should be enough. Now our health still stays at 274, and I can press space again, and now we get even more health. Cool, this is working really well. And I can still heal up. And all of this is working really nicely. So with that, we have some basic upgrade mechanic. Now there's one more thing we do have to do. And that is if our current value exceeds the maximum value. I don't want that to be possible. So if player.stats, and we want to check my upgrade attribute, is greater than my player dot max stats and again my upgrade attribute and if that is the case i just want to set those two equal to each other and i guess what we could also do is in here we only allow the player to upgrade if my player stats is lower than my max stats. I guess just another safeguard. Can't hurt to have those. And all right, with that, we have a trigger. And I guess we can test this. So in my player, I'm going to give the experience of 5,000. Now in the game, I can upgrade. I guess my attack is the highest one right now. I can increase this to, well, the maximum, and we can't go any further. So it seems to work just fine. And all right, with that, we have our upgrade menu. There's one more thing I do have to do, because in my player, so far, we had self.speed. But we don't really upgrade this after we upgrade. So after the init method, this self.speed is not being used anymore. 
So I can get myself.statSpeed and now all the way in my update method. I don't want to use self.speed, I want to use self.stats.speed. And now in my game, this is how we move by default. And if I increase my speed all the way to the top, we are moving significantly faster. So we know the upgrades actually do something in the game. Cool, except I'm still terrible at my own game, but never mind. And that was the last major section in the game. There's only one more thing we have to do. Well, two things. We have to add the sound, and there are some tiny details I do want to change. But let's talk about them in their own section. The first one is to fix a couple of smaller issues that are annoying me. They are mostly visual. And once we have that, we are going to work on the audio. And essentially what I want to do in my game in terms of visuals. That in the original, I had an offset for each individual object. So the trees and the grass, for example, had different kinds of offset because they have different sizes. And this I forgot earlier, so I did want to include it. And besides that, right now, if we walk too far to the right of our map, we can see the black background, which looks a bit weird. Actually, let me illustrate all of this straight in the code, and then we can work on it. So here we are in the game, and if I run this, and move all the way to the right. Let's go all the way here. I think you can see it. There, you can see the background is just black, which looks kind of weird. And for this, or well, the reason is we have a black background color. But in my settings, we have a watercolor. And this, I just want to copy in here. And we have our settings available. So this watercolor is the same color as the water. That's why it's called watercolor. And well, now if I run this, we can go back here and now we can see only water. So this looks a bit better, although admittedly the water does look a bit boring. But well, we are at least getting a decent color. So now besides that, in my settings, I also want to add another entry. Let's put it all the way up here. And that is called hitbox offset. And in here, we have one for the player, one for the object, one for grass, and one for invisible tiles. So let's actually go through them. And in my player, let me minimize everything again. In the init method here, we have our hitbox. And there we already have the 26, so we could leave it as it is. But just to have everything in the settings, let me call the hitbox offset. And in there, I want to get the key player. And what I also want to do is just for the player, I want to reduce the hitbox for the X dimension as well. Although not by much, let's say by six. And let's try this. And with this, it becomes a bit easier for our player to move through smaller gaps. So especially here, uh, well, it's kind of hard to see. But with our player being a bit less wide, it does make it easier to move around. Not a major change, but it does make the game feel significantly better. Okay, with that, then we have to work through the other tiles. So we have the player, now we need the object and the grass. And all of this happens in my tile. This one here. And in here, we are getting our hitbox all the way at the bottom. And this one can change depending on if we have grass or an object. So I want to put this in a separate variable. Let's call it Y offset. And in here, we're just going to use hitbox offset. And then we have a sprite type. So sprite type, we are getting from our level and we are getting it from create map. And in here, we have grass and we have object. So we're passing them in here or in here. So this is how we then get the Y offset. And now we can just get the Y offset and paste it in our inflate method to get the hitbox. And that way we have quite a larger offset for the trees. So the objects get minus 40 and the grass only negative 10. So this is now gonna make it drastically easier to move around because we can move much further behind the trees. And this means that when we work for the forest, things are much better in terms of movement. So this feels 
considerably better for the movement. And that is kind of all I wanted for the basic movement. Oh, and I actually forgot in my settings, there's also invisible and invisible we get from our boundary tiles. And they also work in here with the sprite type. So this tile class actually pulls a ton of weight. But all right, so with that, we have a couple of fixes that I really wanted to add that make our game feel surprisingly better. But now that we have that, all we have to do is add sound and then we are done. And okay, I guess we can go through it step by step, add the different sound effects, and all the way at the end, we add the soundtrack for the game. So let's go through it step by step first. And I guess we can start with the player. That one probably has the most common sounds. So here we have the player, and in my init method, I want to import a sound. And all I want for the player is self.weaponAttack sound. And this one we get with pygame.mixer.sound. And in here, we need a path. We have to go up out of the folder, then into audio, and then we have sort.wav. And one thing I also want to do is for my attack sound, I want to set the volume to 40% of what it is. That way it's not getting too annoying. And now in my input method, whenever I have my attack input, I also want to call self dot weapon attack sound and play it. And that should be all we need for this one sound. Let's try it now. And seems to be working just fine. Now, next up, we can add some sound to the magic because in there, in my init method, I want to have, let's call it self dot sounds. And this is going to be a dictionary. And here we want to have a sound for heal and another sound for the flame. And in here, I want to run pygame.mixer.sound. And we have to go up a folder, then to audio, and then to heal.wav. Now I can copy all of this and paste it in here, except now we want flame. And I guess if you want to make this a bit more elegant, you could paste these sounds or the path to these sounds into this magic data. I have actually done this for the sounds for the attacks, but in our case, the magic sounds are so few, it doesn't really matter. All right, now, when we are playing the health effect, we can somewhere in there run self.sounds call heal and then lay it. And then we can do the same thing. Oh, and we have to reactivate the energy cost for the flame effect. And while we had added, we can add the flame sound. And now let's try this. So we are getting an error that audio flame.wrv was not found. Let's have a look. So I couldn't find this one because the file was called fire.wav. Now let's try this again. And that looks better. Attack still works. And now flame works. And magic also works just fine. Cool. So with that, we can close the magic file and not worry about it anymore. Then next up, I have my enemy sounds. And that is going to be in the enemies. Let's open that file, enemies, enemy, enemy. And in here, just in the init method, I want to have a sounds section. And we essentially have two sounds, self.dev sound. This one is going to be pygame.mixer.sound. And I want to have my folder up, then my audio, and then here we have dev.wav. Now I can copy all of this and I have a hit sound. And this one is called hit.wav. 
And now for both of these, self.dev sound, I want to set the volume a tiny bit lower to 0 0.2. And the same for the hit sound. And now we just have to figure out where to call them. And the dev sound is the easier one. Actually, let me minimize all of the methods. This code is really getting extensive. So in my check dev, if this is true, I want to call self.dev, that's not how you spell that, dev sound.play. That's the first one. And the other one, we want to play when we get to get damage down here. So in get damage, we want to play this once. Self dot hit sound dot play. And that should be all we need. So let's try this. That feels pretty good. And now for the enemy again, there's one more sound we have to import. And let's put it right here as well. Actually, let's put it right here. So in my settings, we have one more sound, this attack sound for each of the different attack types. So self dot, let's call it the attack sound. And this one is going to be pygame.mixer.sound again. And in here, I want to have, first of all, the entire dictionary. So my monster data. And in here, I first of all need to get my monster info, I think I called it. So in here, we get the entire dictionary. So the dictionary we get is this one, for example, for the squid. And in there, we want to pick the attack sound string. And this one, we can just get by indexing. And I also want to reduce self dot attack sound dot set volume. And this one I set to 0 0.3. And now we just have to figure out when to play it. And this happens in my actions. So in here, if the status is attack, my enemy is attacking. So what I can do is self dot attack sound dot play. And now this should be working. So let's try this one. And I can edit here the bamboo enemies. I can hear all of the enemies. And there certainly is some sound. Cool, seems to be working. So the final thing in this entire project is going to be in my main file where we start playing the sound. So right here in the init method of my game, I want to have sound. And I'm going to import main sound. And I am importing pygame.mixer.sound. And in here, we have a string. We go one folder up, we go to audio, and there's a file in there called main.ogg. And this main sound I want to play. And in here, importantly, we want to determine the loops. They should be minus one. So we are playing this continuously. And now let's try this. All right. Now, I think the one thing I do want to do is main sound dot set underscore volume and set this to something like 0 0.5. It's probably a touch loud right now. And. Okay, this one feels better. I guess in terms of fine tuning, the enemy sound effects feel a bit quiet. So let's set those to 0 0.6. And let's see how that feels. And yeah, this is feeling much better. And all right, with that, we are actually done. I think that covers the entire game. So thank you so much for sticking around if you actually managed to get all the way to the end of this project. 
I hope you got something out of it. And, well, I'll see you around.